Good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you to this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. It is October 28th, 2022 at 9.05 a.m. My name is Jennifer Urban. I am the chairperson of the board for the agency. This meeting will run today and if necessary, continue tomorrow, October 29, 2022 after recess. Before we get started with the substance of the meeting, as usual, I have some logistical announcements. First, I'd like to ask everyone to please check that your microphone is muted when you're not speaking. Second, this meeting is being recorded. Today's meeting will be run according to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act as required by law. After each agenda item, there will be an opportunity for questions and discussion by board members. I will also ask for public comment on each agenda item. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes per agenda item. If you wish to speak on an item and you're using the Zoom webinar, please use the raise your hand function, which is in the reaction feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you wish to speak on an item and you're joining by phone, please press star nine on your phone to show the moderator um, that you're raising your hand. Our moderator will call your name when it is your turn and request that you unmute yourself for comment at that time. Those using the webinar can use the unmute feature. Those dialing by phone can press star six to unmute. When your comment is completed, the moderator will mute you. It is helpful if you identify yourself, but this is entirely voluntary and you can input a pseudonym when you log into the meeting. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board voting on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that item, please let us know by using the raise your hand functions and the moderator will recognize you. We have a full agenda for this meeting, even though there aren't that many items because it's focused on the agency's current rulemaking package. I'd like to remind all speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to three minutes or less so everyone has an opportunity to speak who wishes to do so. Relatedly, I'd like to remind everyone of the rules of the road under Bagley Keene, both board members and members of the public may only discuss items that are on the agenda for today when those items are up for discussion. We will take breaks as needed. Um, and just so everyone knows, it's likely to include a break around 1.30 or 1.45 for lunch, um, depending on where we are in the agenda. We're planning to take a, a later lunch today. I note that the meeting is noticed for today and tomorrow. We will use tomorrow if we need it, and I'll say a little bit more about that when we get to the relevant agenda item. We all aim to finish by around 5 p.m. each day. However, we're gonna need to be flexible. For example, if we're getting close to finishing our agenda later this afternoon, we might continue somewhat longer to finish today rather than end at five and have to reconvene tomorrow for a short conversation. I'll do periodic time checks with staff and provide a timing update during the afternoon. My many thanks to the board members for their service and to all the people working to make the meeting possible. As ever, there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes. So I wanna especially thank the team supporting us today, Mr. Philip Laird, the agency's general counsel, who's acting as meeting counsel today, Mr. Ash Sultani, um, who's here in his capacity as our executive director. Um, I'd also like to thank Ms. Von Chidambira, our deputy director of administration and all the CPPA staff who've been working at, on this behind the scenes. And as ever, I'd like to express my gratitude to the team at the office of the attorney general for its continuing to support support and other agencies who um, continue to help us. I would also like to thank and welcome our new moderator, Mr. Kevin Sabo, um, and ask him now to please conduct the roll call. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Board Member De La Torre. Present. Board Member Lay. Present. Board Member McTaggart. Here. Board Member Thompson. Present. And Chairperson Urban. Present. Madam Chair, you have established a quorum with all members present. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Um, we have established a quorum, um, and I'd like to let the board know we'll take a roll call vote on any action items. 
With that, we will move to agenda item number two, which is an update from the chairperson. Um, I have a few um, quick updates. Since we're focusing on rulemaking in this meeting, I wanted to be sure um, that the board was aware of um, a few things. First is update on upcoming, expected upcoming board meetings through December. Um, we have tentative uh, meetings planned in October and November. I'll return to this in a second. Um, as we um, discussed in our last board meeting, um, we do plan tentatively to have a board meeting in December. And in December, we plan to cover some administrative items um, since we're focusing on rulemaking now. That meeting may also include um, uh, rulemaking items if necessary. Um, but there are some things that are um, on our list that I wanted to be sure to highlight um, so everyone is aware um, that we're tentatively hoping to talk about those in December. One is continuing uh, with an update and um, depending on where we are on the strategic planning process. Uh, one is to discuss um, budget process and board oversight. Uh, as came up in the last meeting, um, uh, I have been um, researching and getting um, uh, advice and expect to have a recommended plan for board oversight process in the December meeting that we can discuss. Um, and that will include just um, uh, so I um, make sure that she's aware that um, well, that will include the per diem item um, requested by Ms. De La Torre. We will um, probably in, Jan in December, um, if not in January, do the executive director's annual review um, and potentially um, have a discussion um, about some of the um, uh, uh, developments that came out of this year's legislative session in the California legislature. Now I'd like to return back to rulemaking me meetings um, and provide a little bit of information um, about the process for this, um, just so the public is aware um, of why we have several board meetings um, and, and sort of how that, how that process happens um, in, in practice. So in our September 23rd, 2022 board meeting, which was our last board meeting, the rulemaking process subcommittee, which is Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson, proposed a plan that involved two-day board meetings to discuss the proposed modifications to the proposed rules. They also proposed that we might under, need to take under, undertake multiple two-day meetings. So um, staff and I need to then balance board availability, staff availability, public accessibility, and sufficient con discussion that is um, still as efficient as possible for the board staffs and public's time. So why do we have multiple meeting notices? We've had three recent meeting notices, October 21st and 22nd, um, this meeting, October 28th and 29th, and November 4th, October 21st and 22nd was canceled. So there are some interlocking um, uh, requirements and uh, considerations um, uh, that um, uh, uh, relate to why we have multiple notices and, and, um, and, and won't always hold the meetings. So there's a 10-day requirement under the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act that any meeting we have must be noticed 10 days in advance. And that's combined with a little bit of inherent uncertainty as to how much time is going to be required for board discussion and public comment um, on these substantive topics. I currently don't think we're going to need multiple two-day board meetings, but I could be proven wrong, of course. Accordingly, we had three meetings scheduled, um, and now we have two meetings still scheduled in case we need the time. Um, if we don't need the time, we won't meet tomorrow, and if we don't need the time, we won't meet on November 4th. Um, so we canceled the placeholder meeting last week because it didn't seem likely we would need two two-day meetings and a one-day meeting, and the better balance was to make sure the board and the public had sufficient time um, to prepare uh, and and, and also I had the flu and also, um, and this is very happy news, we have a new board member um, whom I'll introduce in a second. And it's important that we um, felt that he had a comfortable time to prepare. So there are practical reasons um, uh, why um, this happens. And I just wanna be sure that everybody who is participating and watching and participating today understands um, that we make the time so that we are sure we have enough time for a robust discussion, the discussion that we need, but we don't always need to use um, all that meeting time. So with that, 
Um, I would like to um, uh, move to the update that we have a new board member. Um, those of you attending on Zoom um, probably see a new face, um, Alistair McTaggart. Uh, his appointing authority is the Attorney General, and he was appointed, I believe, on October 11th. Um, anyway, recently this month, and Mr. McTaggart can can and can correct me if um, if he'd like. I'd like to thank the previous Attorney General appointee, Ms. Angela Sierra. She was a tremendous asset to the board uh, with deep knowledge of consumer law, enforcement practices, and government service, um, and contributed just um, tremendously to making this agency an agency. She uh, was part of the Startup and Administration Subcommittee with me. Um, and provided extremely thoughtful comments and advice on policy decisions. She did a lot of work on hiring when we didn't have um, our own HR department. Um, and I think she should be um, especially proud um, and we should be especially grateful for all the work she did to support the hiring of our executive director, our acting general counsel, Brian Souble, and our general counsel among other positions. And I know I, and I think all of us really um, valued her wisdom, her measured approach and her warm and gracious presence. We'll miss her terribly, or I will miss her terribly for sure. Um, so more formal recognition for Miss Sierra and a thank you will follow at a later date. Um, but for now, um, we have other happy news, which is to introduce new, our new board member, um, Mr. Alistair McTaggart. Alistair McTaggart um, is the chair of the board and the founder of Californians for Consumer Privacy, which is a nationally recognized consumer privacy advocacy group. And he's responsible for authoring and sponsoring the California Privacy Rights Act, which was passed by Californians in 2020 through ballot initiative Proposition 24. And you've, we've discussed in meetings uh, many times since, um, uh, since it is our implementing statute. He has over 30 years of experience in management, real estate development, and nonprofit leadership, and he has a BA and an MBA, both from Harvard University. Uh, so, Mr. McTaggart, I'd really like to thank you for serving and officially welcome you. Uh, finally, I have some great news. I'm thrilled to announce that yesterday, the Global Privacy Assembly admitted the California Privacy Protection Agency as a full member during its 44th annual Global Privacy Assembly, which is being held this week. The Global Privacy Assembly is a global forum of more than 130 data protection and privacy authorities. It was previously known as the International Conference of Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners and was established in 1979 to help advance privacy by fostering cooperation and information sharing among privacy authorities across the globe. The CPPA is only the second voting member from the United States. The other is the Federal Trade Commission. There are some agencies um, uh, that are observing members. So I am delighted and excited the CPPA has joined this important body and I consider it an important milestone. Being a member of the assembly aligns with and will support the agency function provided for in 1798.199.40I, I think it is, which directs the agency to cooperate with other agencies with jurisdiction over privacy laws and with data processing authorities in California, other states, territories, and countries to ensure the consistent application of privacy protections. I'd really like to thank um, uh, Mr. Brian Souble for his help with the preparation of the application to the, general, to the Global Assembly and Ms. De La Troy for offering her expert eye um, and of course, the membership of the Global Privacy uh, Assembly. So um, on that happy news, two pieces of happy news, new board member and membership in the Global Assembly. Um, those are my updates. Are there any comments or questions from board members? Mr. Lay. Yeah, I, I also wanted to um... Thank Alistair, uh, Mr. McTaggart for uh, serving and also, you know, extend my thanks to uh, Ms. Sierra for, for her great work um, on, on the agency as well. So just wanted to second all of that. Those congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Lay. 
Anyone else, please just raise your hand. Yes, Ms. De La Torre. Well, since Mr. Lee um, mentioned that he was really thankful to um, Mrs. Sierra and also um, that he welcomed that he, that he goes your words on uh, welcoming uh, Mr. McTaggart. I want to do the same thing. Uh, Mrs. Sierra, I thought, was a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous help to the board, the deep, deep expertise on just how agencies function when we were starting this process. And quite honestly, you know, all of the rest of us didn't have that. So it, it was an enormous contribution and, and really all of the contributors that she had during internal conversations and, and in um, board meetings. Um, and of course, um, uh, I have known Mr. McTaggart for a long time. His organization is the reason why basically we are here. We wouldn't have CCPA without California's for consumer privacy. So I think it's a great addition to the board and I wanna um, welcome him into the board. Thank you very much, Ms. De La Torre. Further comments or questions from board members? All right, Mr. Thompson. I'll make it unanimous. Um, really big thank you to, to Ms. Sierra for everything she did. I'm, I'm thinking back to the times when we were basically just the board and, and mm -hmm. some temporary folks and the amount of work that was done uh, just to get this agency up and running and her expertise and experience in, in Sacramento and the ways of Sacramento were invaluable in, in getting us uh, a running start uh, out of the gate. And uh, welcome to Mr. McTaggart, our, our newest colleague. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I guess we can call it, call it a unanimous welcome. <laughs> a unanimous welcome, Mr. McTaggart. Yes, please go ahead. Well, I just wanna say, um, first of all, I, I, I know I have big shoes to fill uh, with Ms. Sierra's uh, excellent and fabulous service. Um, the good news is her her talents are not lost to the state, and she's moved on to a different uh, uh, method of serving. Um, okay. I'm sure uh, they will be as grateful for her expertise there as as, as you were here. And um, I just want to say it's an honor to to be on the board. I'm I'm grateful, and uh, I'm looking forward to serving with you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McTaggart. Is there any public comment? Please raise your hand on the Zoom or use star nine on your phone. I'm not seeing any hands raised. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. Uh, one last time, welcome Mr. McTaggart, and let's move to agenda item number three, which is the main uh, item of discussion for this meeting. Agenda item number three is titled Discussion and Possible Action Regarding Proposed Regulations, Sections 7000 to 7304, to implement, interpret, and make specific the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, as amended by the California Privacy Rights Act of 2020 including possible adoption or modification of the text. To locate this discussion in the board's work and previous meetings, I'll remind everyone of the steps taken in the rulemaking process up to this point, explain where we are in the rulemaking process and the goals of the meeting today, and then give an overview of the structure of the discussion um, today so that um, everyone can, uh, can, can follow where we are um, in case you haven't um, been in every meeting or followed as closely so far. So um, the process um, so far, uh, as was alluded to uh, under our last agenda item, we are a new board and we started out mostly with the board members um, and with the responsibility um, to engage in rulemaking. Ms. De La Torre and I served as the regulations subcommittee last summer and fall and we prepared a preliminary initial invitation for comments to get guidance from the public on um, uh, what might go into the rulemaking package, package and thoughts about that, and develop some rulemaking subcommittees um, to advise the board. The update of CCPA rules subcommittee 
was Ms. Syria and myself, and the new CPRA rules subcommittee for things that um, were introduced by the CPRA and uh, didn't modify CC things that were already in the CCPA or you know, be closely connected to those. That is Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Lay, and the rulemaking process subcommittee um, to advise on the rulemaking process, which is Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson. Um, the um, we did an initial allocation of topics um, to the subcommittees um, so that we could be sure that we were complying with Bagley Keen and keeping our different um, information streams um, separate um, between the subcommittees. And then staff and council have developed the rulemaking package we're working with today with input from the relevant subcommittees from the preliminary comments that came in via the initial invitation for comments um, uh, from informational sessions we held with experts in the spring, stakeholder sessions we held with experts in the spring as well. Staff and council prepared a draft, a packet of draft proposed regulations that was released for public review and board discussion in late May uh, of this year. The board approved the package of proposed rules to go into the formal rulemaking process on June 8th, sorry, uh, June 8th, I think it was, of 2022. And then the formal rulemaking process commenced when the formal notice of rulemaking was published on July 8th, 2022. That opened the initial public comment period during which the public submitted comments. This closed on August 23rd and the agency held a public hearing on August 24th and 25th to um, uh, get more feedback and input from the public. Since that time, staff have been reviewing comments, developing proposed modifications to the text in response to the comments. Um, uh, presumably, um, my fellow board members have also been reviewing comments in preparation for discussing the proposed modifications. Um, I know I have my binders right here. Um, and we got a very um, robust and helpful public response. Uh, I also uh, would like to provide a reminder of how Bagley Keen and the California Administrative Procedures Act interact with our process. I like to thank everyone who's familiar with all of this so far and this interaction for their patience. I know I've explained it in a few public events and in our June 8 meeting, but of course it isn't something that everyone is familiar with um, and it can be complicated um, and um, uh, not exactly what people expect. Um, I'd also like to direct everyone to the FAQ that staff prepared on this, uh, which is on our website on our regulations page. I'll start with the California Administrative Procedures Act. When an agency in California writes regulations to implement a statute, it must follow the APA, which requires a formal process to ensure that the public has input. Um, so the um, comment period that has already happened, the, um, the hearing that we've held, those are part of that required process. The agency then considers all the comments and decides whether to make modifications in response. If there are substantial changes, and I'm substantial, I'll put in quotes because that's the term in the law, then there's another time period for written comments of at least 15 days. That is where we are today, looking at proposed modifications from staff um, to consider whether to approve those for um, uh, going out for public comment in the 15-day period. Then the agency will summarize and respond to all the comments received in what's called a final statement of reasons, and that's submitted with the final rulemaking package to the Office of Administrative Law, which reviews um, the proposed regulations. So that's a very high level overview, um, but hopefully it helps um, back uh, sort of provide a foundation for where we are today. Um, people are often really familiar with federal practice or other agencies in California where the staff proposed release proposed rules, any modifications and so forth. Um, and there's not a public meeting to discuss um, among staff or among um, a commission or a board to discuss that before it's released for public comment. That is where the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act comes in. California has additional process in many situations. This California um, agency is governed by a board and under our implementing statute, the board holds the agency's rulemaking authority. So we must approve commencing the formal rulemaking process, uh, suggested modifications, and of course the final rules. 
We're governed by the Bagley-Keene Open Meeting Act, which requires that all of our discussions are um, considered in public meetings. Those meetings are noticed at least 10 calendar days in advance, and that all materials uh, we consider are distributed to the public. So in practice, that means the public got to see the draft regulations well before they went out for um, formal comment, and the public uh, sees the modifications that um, staff is suggesting, and we'll hear the board um, discuss our thoughts about those modifications. This is quite different from many what many regulatory advocates are familiar with, um, and it takes longer, but it provides additional transparency and opportunity um, for public input. So today, we're discussing agency staff and council's recommendations to the board for modifications to the proposed rules in light of public comments and their further analysis and review. The board will be listening to presentations by staff, explaining the proposed modifications, discussing the staff recommendations, taking public comment, um, and making the following decision about whether, how and whether to direct staff to take all the steps necessary to prepare and notice modifications to the text of the proposed regulatory amendments for an official 15-day comment period. The modifications will reflect the changes proposed by staff if the board agrees, except staff will be directed to further modify the text if that is what the board decides in this meeting. So that's currently where we are in the rulemaking process. Um, please note there's further process after this discussion. Um, the modifications we're discussing today, other than like typo fixes and things like that, will be made formally available for public comment during that 15 day comment period. Public comment will be considered carefully and staff and council will then prepare a proposed final text for the board to consider. The board will not in this meeting and cannot decide whether or not to finally adopt these regulations. That will only happen after another round of public comment. So I'd very much like to thank everybody for their work on, on everything um, today. Now I'll give a quick overview of how the discussion will be organized. In our last meeting, we extensively discussed the plan for board consideration of modifications to the proposed rules. The rulemaking process subcommittee, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson, suggested what they termed the consent calendar, which refers to potential modifications that do not require individual discussion by the board. These items would be in one batch for purposes of board consideration. Items that would benefit from individual discussion by the board, however, would be identified and individually discussed. In our last meeting, we discussed this at length and how it might best be organized, and council have, and staff have developed a plan based on that discussion, and that is what we're following today. I'll ask you now to please turn your attention to the materials for today for agenda item three. These include a copy of the proposed regulations with the proposed modifications um, in uh, red line uh, and markup, and a chart with entries for each modification and a short explanation by staff. These are references for today's discussion and will be referred to throughout the meeting. In, on the chart, which captures the proposed modifications, there are items backgrounded in gray, and these have been identified by staff as items that would best be discussed individually. Items backgrounded in white can, in staff and council's view, be batched for the consent calendar and do not require individual discussion. Deputy Attorney General Kim, who is presenting the proposed modifications, We'll first go over the gray items one by one so the board can discuss them if it wishes. As we discussed in our last board meeting, board members have had the opportunity to request additional items be placed on that list for individual discussion. Accordingly, after we discuss the gray items, council will introduce and the board will discuss any additional items identified for individual discussion by staff or board members um, in the interim. And at that point, I will also provide an opportunity for, for board members to identify any additional items that have come up in the meeting. After the board has disposed of the individual items, the staff will bring to the board's attention the batched items in case things have arisen in the discussion up to that point that might cause a batched item, uh, item in the batch list to be brought forward for further discussion. I know that the rulemaking process subcommittee originally proposed discussing and disposing of the batched items first. Um, and there is a measure of efficiency in that, but because the individual discussions potentially could affect something in the batch, we're going to proceed with the gray items that are identified for individual discussion first. 
I will then provide an opportunity for additional board comments just to be sure we don't leave anything um, out. Um, and then once the board has heard and discussed um, all of staff and council's recommended modifications, we will take public comment. So that's today. Um, and if you'll bear with us for uh, one more minute, um, uh, Mr. Laird is going to give us a little bit about how today fits into the rest of the timeline um, for rulemaking. Thank you very much, Mr. Laird, and I'll turn it over to you for a minute. Uh, thank you, Chair Urban, and it's a uh, it's a pleasure to be back with this group. Um, we've come a long way since the first meeting, so that's uh, this is really tremendous effort so far on behalf of the board and agency. Um, in terms of uh, where we're sitting today, I think it's been sort of alluded to with the chair's overview of the APA process, um, but the decision basically uh, the board has before it will be sort of uh, to consider what modifications it, it wants to uh, propose and, and put out for additional public comment. Um, in doing so, um, you know, there's a number of options in how the board can approach this, but um, if the direction is for staff to execute those modifications and proceed with the notice, um, staff you know, has every intent to try to turn that around as quickly as possible, probably within about a week or two, I think is our estimated timeline if, if the direction is given today. That will then trigger a 15 day modified text period during which time as, as um, the chair has alluded to, um, we would be receiving public comment formally through the APA process. And at the conclusion of that, the, the period would close and staff will once again then evaluate all public comments received regarding the modif modifications to the text. Um, in doing so, then staff will work to prepare a um, proposed final set of regulations um, that will then need to come back before this board. So the next time then after the 15 days, the board will meet and have the opportunity again to consider whether or not to finally adopt those proposed modifications. Um, if the decision is made to, to adopt the modifications at that time, um, uh, then they are, um, if, the, if the modifications are made at that time uh, and are adopted permanently, then staff will work to prepare, um, will, 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 will have approved the final statement of reasons, and at that point will uh, submit to the Office of Administrative Law. The Office of Administrative Law has 30 business days to complete its review of the rulemaking package. So understanding with some holidays approaching, um, this, can, this can even out to be a more like 45 to 50 calendar days for, for, their, or for their review. Um, and at that point, we will have a determination from the Office of Administrative Law whether or not they um, approve or, or um, for some reason deny the regulation package as, as proposed and as submitted. Um, I, I kind of lay out this timeline to suggest essentially that um, when we kind of do the anticipated timelines for staff to complete sort of its work and bring these back to the board at regular meetings for final consideration, um, I think um, if we're able to move forward today, that means we are hopefully submitting a final package to the Office of Administrative Law um, close to the end of the year um uh with with final final uh, approval pending their re review um by the end of january uh if however at today's meeting we make decisions to further um delay any sort of notice of a 15-day public comment period um that will push back that timeline sort of in tandem with our, our delay um so if we do take the extra week and meet again on november 4th for instance to further consider um we'll be looking at least a week delay in sort of the final adoption so happy to take any sort of if there are any questions about that process but um uh, our, our goal is to get this before the office of administrative law so that we can have an approved package under the apa uh, by early 2023 thank you very much mr laird um are there are there any questions Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Laird, and um, uh, we, I'm sure we will all endeavor um, to be efficient and prioritize our discussion um, in order to help staff um, uh, efficiently prepare the package and get it to the Office of Administrative Law. And I appreciate the rulemaking process um, uh, subcommittees, uh, I, thoughts about you know, batching items and so forth so that we could do that um, as efficiently as possible. Thank you um, very much, um, Mr. Laird.
And I will next turn things over to Deputy Eternal, Attorney General Lisa Kim from the team at the Office of the Attorney General that has been assisting the agency in putting together the draft regulations acting as counsel for the agency. This team and our growing internal legal team has been tireless in considering all of the information we've gathered, working with the board subcommittees and the agency staff to carefully draft regulatory text to uh, carefully consider public comments on that text. They're peerless in their expertise, um, especially as they have experience with consumer law, generally privacy law, and specifically the California Consumer Privacy Act and existing regulations, as well as California administrative law. I'd like to especially thank Deputy Attorney General Lisa Kim, Supervising Deputy Attorney General Stacey Schesser, the rest of the team at the Office of the Attorney General acting as counsel for the agency, the agency's Executive Director Sultani, Agency counsel, including general counsel um, Philip Laird, from whom we just heard, acting general counsel Brian Souble, staff counsel Neela Forshaik, Re Nelson Richards, and others. I want to thank them specifically for taking such care to consider comments and proposed modifications and for pre preparing these materials for the board and the public. They support our trans those materials support our discussion, of course, excuse me but also provide an extra measure of transparency and notice for the public as we consider the modifications. So we really appreciate it. Um, I also really appreciate the robust participation we had from the public at every level, including at the formal comment level, which resulted in, I think, very helpful um, and concrete comments um, for staff and the board to consider. With that, Deputy Attorney General Kim, thank you very much again for all your work on this and for um, walking us through it today. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chairperson Urban. Um, as we discussed previously, the board has received materials that were circulated and they include basically two items or two documents. Uh, the first is the modified text of the proposed regulations. And it's the very colorful document that is reflected um, in multicolors, depending on when modifications were made. And I just wanna note that the proposed modifications that staff makes with regard to the proposed regulations are reflected in green, underlined for new items included or new language included, and then orange double strike through with regard to anything that we um, recommend being removed. Uh, the second document that you received was also a chart explaining all the modifications that were made to the proposed regulations. Um, everything that has been uh, made includes an explanation. There's some exceptions, like we didn't include non-substantive changes or typos or numbering and lettering changes. We thought that might be very clear and step forth, but um, for anything that was substantive, anything that reflects um, actual uh, language, we made sure to include that in that chart. Um, within the chart, as Ms. Um, Chairperson Urban mentioned, there are gray rows that are highlighted um, or identified with an asterisk before the section number. Those are the items that we have identified for discussion today. Um, now, I wanted to note that not all items may actually require discussion. Some of the items we highlighted primarily to make sure that the board was aware of them um, as they are significant. Um, but that being said, those are all highlighted in gray. The rows that are not highlighted and reflected in white are consent items. Um, and we won't discuss these unless a board member specifically requests to do so at the end. Um, I also wanted to note there are a few additional modifications that staff uh, recommends since providing these materials to the board. And I will make sure to identify them for the board and we'll note those today, whether it be during the discussion of gray items, if they pertain to those sections, or if it pertains to um, white something in the white, uh, white consent items. So we will be proceeding as follows. Um, as mentioned before, we'll go through the gray items first. We'll tee these up for um, discussion for the board. I'm going to take the gray items in a bit of a different order, not chronologically, just because we anticipate some will require more discussion than others. And so I wanted to uh, start with the items that are first highlighted more for the board's awareness, and then turn to the items that will require, uh, or we anticipate will require more discussion by the board. Um, if you wanted to make a note with regard to the order of things, I'm happy to provide that. Um, at least right now, our anticipated order will be to first cover section 7004, um, 
After that, 7,012, 7,027, 7,050 through 53. And then after that, we will discuss 7,002 and then 7,025. Um, these may be subject to change depending on how breaks work themselves out, but I want to give you a general high level um, order so that you know people are aware. And again, as I mentioned before, any new recommendations that the staff have identified during the past two weeks, we will fit within the relevant sections um, and identify them for the board. And then finally, after we cover those items, we will discuss any um, rows on the consent agenda to the extent that the board member, any board member would like to raise those. All right, so any questions about the process? <laughs> If not, I will just go ahead and move on and start with um, our first item, which is section 7004. Um, this is the requirements for methods for sub submitting CCPA requests and obtaining consumer consent. Um, this is often referred to as our section regarding dark pattern. Um, so we received many comments on this section, uh, both in support of them and then raising some concerns. Uh, from a high level, generally speaking, some of the themes that we saw with regard to those comments were, were that first that we should apply FTC standards of deception and an intent standard. Um, some raised concerns that we were being extra statutory, meaning prescribing requirements that were above and beyond what the statute says. And then there are others who raised specific issues with examples that we provided. Um, raising concerns that they were somehow burdensome to businesses or there was a need for more flexibility in how businesses choose to communicate with consumers. On the support side, I would say that there are, there are several comments in support of the various principles that we introduced in this section, um, especially with regard to uh, requiring symmetry and choice for a consumer when it comes to giving their consent. Um, we we saw a lot of support for avoiding choice architecture that impairs consumers' choice, and other others who raised um, support for making and ensuring that consent um, methods were easily understandable for consumers and provided um, more detail on the prohibition on dark patterns. Uh, the modifications that we made to the regulations. Um, are, are generally speaking, mapping the language of the regulations very closely to the statute, specifically the definitions of consent and dark pattern that are in the CPRA. We also made some changes to the language from input received during the comment period. For example, um, we did make a modification to uh, the description of uh, asymmetry and choice we noted that it wasn't just a length of the path of the choice, but also choices that, um, I'm sorry, methods that were more difficult or time consuming. We want to broaden that um, description a bit so that there is a bit more flexibility in understanding what that means. We changed a couple of the words uh, could, uh, would into could in the example section. Um, this was so that we would not foreclose other ways in which um, other ways in which the paths or the examples in the about symmetry would demonstrate that the paths were so, uh, symmetrical. Another change that we made was that we deleted a couple of the examples that were provided, and this was to simplify implementation at this time. Um, after we we may introduce some of these regulations again, depending on how we see this play out in the marketplace. Finally, we added uh, language to A five B regarding the circular links uh, to address concerns that you know this is somehow a gotcha statute. We note that if a business knows of circular links and problems with their methods, that that doesn't, uh, but doesn't change those issues that may be a dark pattern in those instances. And finally, I wanted to address one new item that uh, staff would like to note, and this is in 7004 subsection C. And let me provide you the page number in case you wanted to look at the document itself. Um, it is on page 13, at the bottom of page 13. This is the section that um, notes 
this is the section that subsection that talks about a business's intent. Um, we recommend in the new green language provided that we delete the sentence, the second sentence that starts with, for example. Uh, we we recommend deleting this sentence because it appears to be unnecessary in light of the first sentence that it is a factor to be considered but not determinative. And we're a bit concerned that it may be overemphasized in interpretation. And, uh, and so we do recommend striking out that second sentence that starts with, for example. All right. Now I'll pause for a second to see if there's any questions or um, discussion that the board wants to have with, with regard to this section. Great, thank you um, very much, um, Ms. Kim, for that clear explanation. Uh, I really appreciate staff's attentiveness to the comments. And on this, we got some very helpful, specific comments. For example, the comment about um, uh, ensuring that the idea of making things symmetrical um, worked through. Um, and I really appreciate staff's um, work to, to implement those. Um, Ms. De La Torre um, has a comment or a question. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kim, thank you so much for the explanation and for all the great work that you have done for us. I have a question on this section, um, and it's in 7004A2. There's two examples right at the end of the section, um, D and E. They are now, um, like you mentioned, orange. And they have been basically eliminated. And I just wanted to understand what was the background on removing those examples. One of them was um, the choice where there is a yes button is more prominent and the no button is not, uh, it will not be symmetrical. And the other one I think is the modified proposed regulation also removes references to a business not using manipulative language and wording that guilt or shames the consumer into making a particular choice. I was inclined to you know, find those helpful and I think they are still in Colorado. So if you can give us a little bit of background as to why they were eliminated at this time. Thank you. Sure. Um, these two examples were uh, deleted at this time, just uh, primarily to simplify implementation of the regulations. Um, we received a number of comments that talked about um, perhaps uh, the burden on businesses with regard to reviewing and looking over all of their uh, pro processes. Um, and so at least at this time, we removed them explicitly as explicit examples so that we could proceed further or quickly through the implementation of the regulations. Um, it is something that we would be aware of. Perhaps if we see it continuing to be a problem in the marketplace, it's certainly something that we may be uh, we may consider, or the board may consider reintroducing at a later time. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to repeat back to make sure I understand. We we have eliminated them right now just to simplify implementation, but we will monitor the way this section is implemented. And if we identify that this is an issue, we might, you know, there's the possibility that we might bring those back, right? Thank you. Certainly. Thank you. That's very really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Mr. McTire. Thanks. Um, just uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Just following up on 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 um, Ms. De La Torre's uh, comment, I I wonder if it would be possible to kind of uh, keep a list. I, I know we can always go back and look at the red line, but keep a list of of items. Um, I think she raises a good point, and it'd be nice to. You know, you forget these things, but it'd be nice, like a you know, six months or a year from now, to kind of revisit and say, "Hey, we we took this out, and is it is it useful? Do we want to revisit it?" So I just think it's a it it's a it's a good regulation. I understand why we're taking it out now, but it, it's uh, uh, I also noticed it. So you know, just a thought. Thank you, Mr. McTagger. Other comments? Certainly. Other comments from the board. All right, um, as is our usual practice, uh, we will be having a transcript service produce a transcript. Uh, and I'm hoping that this will help 
collect items and um, make sure that the board is has it's very clear the board has had a chance to weigh in on each item without us having to read the entire set of proposed modifications at the end of the meeting. So I am going to summarize. And if anyone, um, if I if I have anything wrong, um, then someone raise your hand and otherwise um, we will consider the proposals from staff on a 7004 uh, to be something that the board supports um, and that we'll put into our approval and direction at the end. And that, as I understand it, um, are the modifications that are shown on the um, marked up text that was provided today uh, as part of the materials, as well as the item that Ms. Kim mentioned staff noticing after the marked up text was produced, which is to remove the line um, from near the end of the regulation um, in order to, to simplify the language. And I can be more specific if needed, but I think that is um, in place. And Mr. McTaggart and Ms. De La Torre um, have expressed um, uh, understanding that while some of the examples are coming out, um, they could possibly um, be used in the future uh, once we know more about the marketplace. Mr. Thompson. Thank you. I just wanted to double check my understanding of, of the modification that Ms. Kim uh, mentioned. Of course. Uh, at the middle of page 13 in subsection C. It was just that one sentence, right? It wasn't everything after that. It was beginning at, for example, and ending with the words dark pattern and then it continues after thank you okay yes that that is the case let me i, I would like again just to be 100 percent clear the sentence that ms kim uh suggests that we remove is for example a business's intent to design the user interface to subvert or impair user choice weighs heavily in favor of establishing a dark pattern and the other additions will remain. Great. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Thank if you. If I could just add one more thing, I, I noticed um, this is an example of a typo that we caught in 7004. And since okay. we're discussing 7004, I just wanted to make a note. It's rather simple. It's in at the top of page 11, um, subsection A2. We noticed that uh, we had written in green because it would impair or interfere with the consumer's ability to make a choice but we noticed that it should be that would impair or interfere with the consumer's ability to make a choice. And I just wanted to make that note since it, uh, it's, a, it's a typo and something that's new that we caught in the past two weeks. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ms. Kim. All right. With that, um, Ms. Kim, please continue with the next item on your list. Sure. So next we'll be discussing section 7,012. Um, more specifically, 7,012, subsection E6, G2, and G3. Uh, this is the section uh, regarding you know, identifying the names of third parties controlling the collection of personal information. Uh, we, we received many comments on this section, both in support and, and raising some concerns. The basic high-level themes here were uh, concerns that we were being extra statutory because uh, the the statute really only discusses disclosing categories of third parties. Um, other points that were raised were that this provision or this subsection would either be burdensome or costly, potentially anti-competitive. And also there was a concern that there would be minimal benefit for the consumer because notice would then become too long um, or not many people would pay attention to that. Um, there were those who did support it um, in the vein of, you know, allowing the consumer to know all the thir different third parties that are involved with the collection of personal information. Uh, but upon further review, uh, we did review the section and we considered the cost and benefit of the regulation. And at this time, we recommend deleting this provision and the, the reference to it in the examples provided in this section. Um, to watch again to simplify implementation at this time and to watch how things play out in the marketplace, uh, especially in light of the new data minimization and contract requirements that are introduced by the CPRA. 
um, we, we, we think it may be counterbalanced or the benefit that is provided may be something that is mitigated um, by the other provisions. And so at this time, we do recommend deleting it um, just to see how things progress moving forward and to simplify implementation at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Kim. Uh, questions or comments from the board? Oh, right, wonderful. We have Mr. Lay and then we have Ms. De La Torre. Mr. Lay, please go ahead. Yep. Um, thank you, Ms. Kim. I, I had a question. So I, I understand, I saw the comments saying, you know, telling all the names of third parties uh, could create issues. And, and But what about the number of third parties it's shared to? Do you think that would um, still require too much effort for the benefit? I know categories is useful, um, but perhaps the amount of third parties that it's shared may, <clears throat> may strike a balance between providing consumers information and um, while not requiring businesses to keep updating each name and worrying about uh, these sensitive business relationships being disclosed. Uh, was there any thought about that? Um, we did consider that. We're, we're, it is something that we're looking into. Um, I, I believe that there may be some fluidity with regard to the number. It may be changing. And so um, requiring that specific number is something that we are still analyzing as to whether or not the benefit of that would be useful uh, in light of the cost that it might um, uh, impose on the businesses. But that's certainly something that we may consider, um, especially if we notice that moving forward that there seems to be a need to, ident to identify these things for uh, consumers or to bring greater awareness to consumers. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Ms. De La Torre. Thank you, Mr. Servant. Um, so I have a related question and I, I'm gonna try to make sure that I understand this provision correctly first. The way I read the provision is this situation that we usually, uh, I guess, identify as co-controllers collecting from your website, for example. So you're a business and you're allowing another business to collect. It's not about allowing service providers to collect on your behalf. That's why they need to be identified, right? Because they are using the data for purposes different from the purpose um, that um, the business and the consumer expect. Is that, is that approximately correct? I know that there is no absolute correlation between um, CCP and other jurisdictions, but is that the kind of context that we're talking about, a co-controller context, uh, Mrs. Skin? I believe that those ideas are relatively similar. Um, again, CCPA uses different language than yeah. uh, other jurisdictions, but certainly I think that that's a similar kind of understanding. Okay, okay, so what we're eliminating then is the need for the controller to identify the co-controllers in that controller's notice or in that business notice, but those other entities, they will have their own obligation to in, identify in their privacy notices the fact that they are collecting this data. So there's no, the notice doesn't disappear, it's just that it's not basically duplicated in the notice of the business that's collecting the data. Of the, uh, I'm sorry, I, I might be confusing you. I hope that you- <laughs> No, I, you I understand what you're what saying. I'm trying to say. Yes, this does not nullify the fact that the third party who is also controlling the collection of personal information must provide a notice at collection in accordance with 1798, 100, as well as uh, I believe it's section 7012, the notice at collection provisions in the regulations themselves. It doesn't nullify that. Okay. so. Um, I'm sorry to buy you. I'm just trying to make sure that I understand it correctly. This all makes sense to me. So a, a business doesn't have to let the consumer know that it's allowing other businesses to collect. And because of the um, um, consideration that you, that you mentioned, it might be that in the future we, we change our position on that. But at this point, you're not recommending that we do that. But in reality, there is notice to the consumer in the sense that that third party that other business is subject to the obligations under CCPA to notify independently. Is that? Um, yes, that is correct. With uh, one slight, yes, that is co collect, correct with one slight change. Um, 
again, this doesn't notify, this doesn't nullify the first party who is uh, uh, the first party who is um, interacting with the, the consumer. They are still under obligation to say that they are others, other third parties who are controlling the collection of personal information. They just don't have to identify them by name. Um, I think that's name the them. distinction here by naming them okay. specifically. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was what I was going to to mention. It you the consumer would still hear from the business with which they are interacting that there are other um, third parties collecting information. The business with whom they're interacting simply at this time, staff is recommending wouldn't have to name all of those individual third parties um, in order to see how, again, I think if I'm saying if I have this right, Ms. Kim, how the marketplace develops um, and 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 how it looks like implementation will develop. Uh, and Mr. Lay also queried about um, another approach with, which would provide another layer of information, but not every name, which would be the number of third parties, um, which is my understanding is that would also potentially be somewhat dynamic, um, but it would be another layer of information um, in addition to the, the categories of third parties that the consumer would already have disclosed to the consumer by the uh, business with which they are interacting. Um, I appreciate staff's thoughtfulness um, about this change. I, my view is that um, I would like to um, accept um, staff's recommendations based on their expertise and knowledge uh, in most cases. And this seems like a case in which um, staff's expertise uh, is, is um, counseling um, that this is something that we might re revisit in the future, but it's simpler um, at this time to simplify the proposed regulation a little bit. So um, I support it and I thank, um, I thank Ms. Kim and her team for the thought that goes into it um, and the comments that were helpful in identifying that. Are there any further comments or questions on this? Yeah. I, yes, Mr. Lay. Yeah, I <clears throat> should we only be keeping our comments to the gray section? I have other issues with well questions around 712 or 7012. Um, should we just wait for that to be when we talk about the white stuff? things that were in the white set? Yeah. So the uh plan what it has been to talk about the gray things and then circle back um, and pull things out of the white sections if you'd like to. Okay. Will I'll that wait. make sense or is it so connected that you think? No, no, that? it's not. Okay, I, I all that. right. All right, I'll make a note, you make a note, Mr. Lay, and we'll be sure to circle back to that. All right, thank you, Ms. Kim. Um, and without, if there aren't further comments, um, we will move on to the next one with the understanding that the board supports the change for simplification um, to 7012 that we just went over. Uh, and I would like to note um, Mr. Lay's suggestion about potentially uh, in the future, um, disclosing the number of third parties in question. Uh, Ms. Kim? Great. So moving on to section 7027M2, and uh, I'm going to be addressing both 7027M2 and 7050A4 together because they are essentially a very similar topic. Um, this is the section that uh, in which we inserted uh, well, sorry, let me start back again. This is the section that pertains to an exception for which uh, a purpose that can be used. Um, this is, sorry, let me say that again, 7027M2. This is um, the section that deals with the different kinds of purposes businesses can use sensitive personal information for, in which that would not uh, trigger um, providing the consumer a right to uh, limit. And then also with regard to 7050A4, this is an exception or a, a, a specification given with regard to service providers and contractors, how they can use personal information and combine it that would not somehow uh, be in violation of the, uh, of the law or the regulations itself. More specifically, the exception that was given was with regard to it originally stated that um, the business or the service provider contractor can use uh, personal information to detect security incidents. 
And um, the modification that staff has proposed is to also include language that says prevent, detect, and investigate security incidents. Um, the reason, um, well, you know, with regard to this provision, we did receive a number of comments on these two sections. Um, we wanted to clarify the language because there were some that were concerned that detect would be interpreted too narrowly. Um, there were separately other requests that were made to broaden 7027 exceptions generally, but this is one that we uh, wanted to make a modification to. Um, part of our analysis and thought process was that detecting security incidents would, would require activities that could also be framed as preventing and investigating. Um, but we did also want to note that we didn't accept other comments to expand other sections. Um, for example, we did receive um, some comments that wanted to expand the exception set forth in 7027M3 that talks about resisting malicious, deceptive, fraudulent, or illegal actions directed at the business and to prosecute those responsible for those actions. Um, some of the comments made in that uh, vein was that we should delete directed at the business and therefore broaden it that, you know, businesses can use it even if it's information that is directed at a different business. Um, we didn't think that was necessary um, or because, you know, this could be done through other exceptions available in 1798. Uh, dot 145. Um, so we, but we did think it would be relevant and um, uh, helpful or clarifying to include that prevent, detect, and investigate the security incidents because prevention and investigating security incidents usually um, is included within this understanding of detecting. Um, I'm, I also wanted to note that um, we did add a new item in this section specifically for 7027M. This is something that a modification that uh, we recommend to make. And essentially what we do recommend is that we start 7027 subsection M and note in the very first line um, where we say the purposes for which a business may collect, we wanna say instead the purposes identified in civil code section 1798.121 subdivision A, for which uh, businesses may collect use and disclose sensitive personal information um, are as follows. The reason why we wanted to just include that kind of framing language at the beginning is just to make sure to clarify that the reason we put together this list to begin with was to help the both businesses and consumers and those digesting this information you know, to have in one place all the different exceptions that were given or provided for by the statute um, in one place. Uh, it doesn't necessarily preclude other situations, especially as, you know, exceptions in 1798.145 may apply, but we wanted to at least just frame that so it's very clear that th that is the purpose of this section, to put those, um, I, I, uh, those, those ex specific exceptions identified by the statute um, or within our authority as a rulemaking body to put it into one section so that it's easier for people to understand. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kim. Uh, comments or questions from other board members? Ms. De La Torre? You're on mute, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you, apologies. I'm not sure if my comment is appropriate for right now or we need, it, it would be best to wait and have a conversation about 2017, uh, 2027M later. I did have uh, the opportunity, Mrs. Kim was generous enough to give me some of her time and she kind of has an idea of, of my thoughts. Um, so I'm, I was just gonna ask her, is it appropriate for us to, to talk right now about 7027M in general, or do we just want to address the example and then and then maybe I pull it out of the consent calendar? Um, I believe it might be helpful to talk about it now just because it is about a, the same sub, subsection. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I I just um, I'm going to summarize my understanding of how this section works, and I'll go point by point, just to make sure that I'm correct and, and you can- I'm sorry, uh, I, I, just wanna, I just point of order. Um, Ms. De La Torre, do you mean you wanna talk about things that are not in the, that are, have, that are white backgrounded in this section? I see. 
Um, so the process that we were anticipating would be to talk about, to bring those things forward after we talk about the gray areas, um, which is what the exchange I just had with Mr. Lay. Um, if it's so integrated, as I asked him um, about his comment, if it's so integrated with what we were just discussing that you think it makes sense to bring it forward now, I'm, I, I'm fine with that. And if we need to modify um, how we operate, because in process, it turns out we need to, to do that, that's fine. I want to be sure that Mr. Lay understands that if in listening to Ms. De La Torre, it sounds like this was very similar to what you wanted to do, um, then we can circle back to you sooner if you would like, or we can wait. So thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, Ms. De La Torre, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. I, I, you know, and I'm fine whether we have that conversation now or later. It seems to me that um, Mrs. Kim is right because M is a section that has a lot of examples and we're talking about one of the examples. Um, so um, going back to what I was trying to say. So um, this section is about the requests to limit the use and disclosure of sensitive personal data. And as I understand uh, section M, basically what we're listing there are the situations where organizations do not need to provide this notice of the right to limit the use and disclosure of sensitive personal data. And obviously they don't need to provide a mechanism for it either. Is that correct, Mrs. Kim? Yes, I, I would say in short form, that is true. It, to be clear, um, what we're trying to do is explain the provision in 1798.121 subsection A, which sets forth um, you know, when a consumer shall have a right to limit the use of their sensitive personal information or the disclosure of sensitive personal information. And that subsection also includes you know, specific um, references to different sections of the statute that you know, would essentially create exceptions to that request to limit or that right to limit. Right, right. And so the, I was going to ask that, <laughs> that was my next question. So I think that what I hear from you is that um, this section is not really creating new limitations on the use or disclosure of sensitive personal data or allowing things that were not allowed by the statute. It's just trying to provide you know, a helpful list so that it's easier for business to find out what are the situations that do not trigger the request to limit the use and disclosure. Because if you go to a study, you basically have to be jumping from section to, to section to, to understand that. Is, that. is that correct? So we're not that changing. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, I don't believe we're changing what the statute provides for. Um, we're uh, simply including kind of in one place an easy to access um, list of, uh, of exceptions that are provided for within the statute. I would okay. just, so, uh, to, to just for everyone who is watching and as a reminder um, for any of us, the regulations basically do three things. One is where staff have deemed it useful. It repeats sometimes in sort of plain English, the statute to make it easy to understand where any regulations are nested in there. And also so someone can read the regulations um, and not have to constantly go back to the statute. Um, uh, it, uh, let's see, it reorder there, it orders things so that you can understand um, hopefully how the rights you have as a consumer and the responsibilities that you have as a business. Um, and it implements and interprets the statute um, in places where staff is uh, recommending that that's appropriate. So um, I think, Ms. De La Torre, you're asking if this is mostly in that sort of first um, category to help people understand the statute. Um, and I think Ms. Kim is saying, um, yes, it mostly is, um, but I, I wanna be sure that everybody is on the same page. Yes, I, I believe that that is my understanding. Thank you. Um, so uh, another um, kind of a general idea here is I understand that these situations that trigger the 
um, limitations on the use and disclosure of sensitive personal data under the statute are, are specific. So if you use, and I'm paraphrasing here, so it's not gonna be perfect, but just the general idea. If you use basically sensitive personal uh, information or disclose sensitive personal information uh, for, um, I think there's three, there's auditing related to add impressions, debugging to identify and repair errors, um, and or you're providing some form of advertising and marketing services. So this is whole, the whole thing is in the category of you're using sensitive data in the context of advertising in one way or another, or for um, debugging that might not be needed. In those cases, the new right to limit the use and the closure of uh, sensitive personal data allows the consumers to say, no, thank you. Do not use my, my personal data for this marketing advertising purposes that I do not agree with. Is that the gist of what we, are you know, with the statute is limiting there? Without going into like a legal interpretation of the law, which I, I, you I know, do I'm not, a little yeah. bit wary of, um, <laughs> but I, I do want to just note that in uh, 1790, Civil Code Section 1798-121, uh, subsection A, um, it very specifically says, you know, um, it specifically identifies uh, certain provisions of 1798.140, um, and that, uh, I'm sorry, subdivision E of 1798.140, which is the definition of business purpose. And within that reference to the definition of business purpose, it only, identify par it only identifies paragraphs two, four, five, and eight. And from what I understand that you're saying, Ms. Uh, Ms. De La Torre, is that you know some of those sections that are not included here explicitly by the statute are those references that you're making about ad impressions and adver cross contextual advertising, and I I would just yes I would agree that I would I would agree that in the reference included in 1798.121a those particular paragraphs are not included within exceptions to the um, right to limit. Okay, give me a second. I'm just double checking the citation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I was looking at the statute while Ms. Kim was reading it. Yes, she seems very well versed on this. Yeah. I need to go to the yeah. paper. Yeah. Um, Mr. McTaggart, while we wait, um, do you have a comment? Uh, thank you. I need to lower my hand here. Um, yeah, you know, one thing that's, it, I think uh, Ms. De La Torre is raising a reasonable point here. You know, if you think about the way the statute in 121, refers to business purposes in 140. Uh, the one thing I'm, now that we've enumerated the actual uh, allowable purposes per 121, which we're supposed to do in this section, M, which I think is 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 right, is what we're supposed to do. The, the one thing I'm wondering, Ms. Kim, is whether the preamble in 140 for business purpose includes the language provided that the use of the use of personal information shall be reasonably necessary and proportionate to achieve the purpose for which it was collected. Yeah, it was collected or processed. Yeah. And I'm kind of wondering whether that governing phrase is now missing because now we've said, okay, here in M is are the are the are the actual enumerated purposes, but we don't because we've now taken it out of 121 referring to 140 in the statute. You, you're missing that actual language. So I think if we could add that language in, uh, it, it, mm -hmm. would be, it would be um, statutory, it's what the statute says. And then there would be that kind of overlay in M now saying, by the way, you can't use this. So you don't wanna have a situation where someone says, I'm always gonna keep all your information. And I'm never gonna delete it because I wanna potentially prepare against the lawsuit. You know, you know, And so you wanna have some kind of get, uh, caveat here. So I think that would be my recommendation would be including that preamble uh, because it, 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 it was there for a reason. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Yeah, I, I just need, I want to I, be clear, I, just a minute, Ms. Billy Troy. I just want to be clear. Are you proposing adding that to M? But we, we're still having a conversation, I think. I, I, I just like to hear what Mr. McIntyre. Yeah. And again, my, uh, Madam Chair, my, my, uh, my, my main uh, goal is to not, uh, delay the implementation of regulations. So, okay whether it's now or in a subsequent round, I, I think 
that it would be wise to include that language, that governing, that limiting language, mm -hmm. uh, that concept in M here somewhere. In M. Okay, that's all I needed to know. I was just yep. trying to jot it down yep. um, while we were talking. Okay, Ms. De La Torre, uh, apologies for um, interrupting. Please go ahead. Sure. So uh, I think that's exactly right. So when I was going through this section, basically, when I was thinking about these use cases, right, and I was thinking about situations that, to me, are allowed under the statute, and they, it, it's not necessarily helpful for anybody to provide a notice of, of the right to opt out of the use of sensitive personal data for kind of in the context of advertising, because the use purposes um, do not correlate to that. So, and that's how um, I started to kind of deconstruct this. Uh, and I think that the answer is basically what Mr. McTiger just mentioned in terms of the solution. But let me um, give you the examples that I was thinking about. So let's say, for example, now we have HR covered by CCPA. If a business is collecting employee sensitive information, like for example, disability information, racial or ethnic origin information, religious or philosophical beliefs, and they are doing that to help monitor compliance with their own internal diversity and inclusion objectives, that is a use to me that has nothing to do with the things that are prohibited, but I can't find it in that, in that list. And the way I read M, if it's not in the list, then a notification is triggered. Um, so is it in the list? What is it in the list? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a bit wary of like how I'm a bit wary with regard to like the answer I think to that question may involve like legal interpretation and fact specific scenarios. Um, and, and so I'm a, a little bit wary of, of answering this that question that directly in this public setting. That being said, I, I would want to note that 1798.145 um, is with regard to exceptions to the entire statute and there are provisions in there that may address those kinds of situations or may not. Um, what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is subsection M is a, is a place in the regulations uh, where we identify what 1798.121 subsection A is referring to. Um, there may be other situations um, that would render different circumstances, but that is not what the intention of this subsection M is intended to do. It's simply to identify with regard to the exceptions that were statutorily included in 1798.121A um, to identify those to be helpful to both businesses and consumers because they are kind of all spread out through the statute. So that is the primary purpose of this regulation. Okay, I, um, and I don't wanna, thank you. I, I don't, want to put you in a position where you're providing legal advice. I'm just explaining my own process of how I started to have questions about this section because I was looking at uh, situations that to me had nothing to do with the, 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 the intent of the law to limit certain uses that could actually trigger a notice. It would be really confusing, I think, for an employee uh, if they are volunteering information about the racial or ethnic origin because uh, they want to help uh, uh, a business um, identify their in compliance with diversity and inclusion to receive an notice. And I don't see here like this. Ms. You know, Taylor, that... I, could I just ask, I mean, this may not work and i um, happy to have this discussion, but do you have a suggestion that Ms. Kim could consider? Yeah, I would like to have a conversation about it. Okay. Because I think that we should integrate also the thinking of other board members that might be reading the, the section before I'm, I made a suggestion. With um, Mr. McTaggart said makes a lot of sense to me mm -hmm. to make a reference to that test that is in the definition of business um, purposes. That's a very strict test. It requires that it be reasonably necessary. It regards that it be proportionate and that it anything that's done for the purpose for which the personal information was collected basically um, or for a compatible purpose and is reasonable, necessary and proportionate 
might not need to trigger a notice that is is just in my view going to confuse the individuals who receive it because they will basically be told you can opt out of something that we're really not even doing. Um, so I have other examples that I can offer in terms of helping other board members think through it. Thank I you, really Ms. appreciate Ms. The, So I just want to pause here because I, I'm trying to keep track of the conversation. So Mr. McTaggart, right. my suggestion. I, I, I understand that at this point you support Mr. McTaggart's suggestion, or you think it's a good idea at least. Um, you've been giving background. Do you have a suggestion that board members can consider in the discussion? I don't really understand your question right Is now. Is there a suggestion but... that you would like Ms. Kim to implement, changing the language in some way? Okay. I would appreciate if we could have a conversation and not stop every moment to think about suggestions because it might be that my suggestion evolves when I hear the thoughts of other board members. Uh, I, I, I see your um, desire to collect suggestions, but I, I just don't wanna preclude myself from supporting a suggestion that might come from another board member. Well, I won't hold you to it, Ms. De La Torre, but I'm not sure how to have a conversation that is not around some kind of suggestion to which we can react. Um, Ms. Kim? Um, so I, I just wanted to note, uh, if the recommendation that I had uh, previously discussed about including in the preamble of M uh, a notation that this is with regard to identifying the exceptions in Civil Code Section 1798.121A, if that at least would immediately address that concern that there may be uh, other kinds of situations or examples that uh, Ms. De La Torre is raising. Um, if that would at least address that for the purposes of these regulations in this rulemaking package in the immediate kind of uh, moving forward at that time. Um, I also would like to kind of would like to note that some of the examples that um, it sounds like you're you're raising this delatory pertain to employee specific information. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, um, that exception <laughs> has you know expired and uh starting in 2023 and that it, it is relatively an unknown area um and that may warrant conversation at a different like at a different juncture or maybe in with regard to different sections not necessarily this section immediately and perhaps we could um uh address those examples uh with some other discussion at a later time as to how we could strategically um, consider or, or how the board can consider those issues. Right. So I think there are a few things. So there's there's the there's the modified text that we have in front of us. Ms. De La Torre has asked good questions about the modified text. Mr. McTaggart has made a suggestion um, that I think was following from some of Ms. De La Torre's observations and his own observations. Ms. Kim has also made a suggestion um, and has also um, I want to pause and just say there are things that we can do with the modified text um, that we might modify further. We might say this text is what we're going to go with now, um, or we, we might want to change it here. And this, this is partly why I'm collecting selections, uh, suggestions. And then there are things um, that we can have recorded as something that a board member wants to be sure that staff understands that we continue to consider. Um, and Ms. Dilatory, I find all of your observations valuable and your expertise valuable. I'm just trying to understand what bucket to put it in um, in order for the board to decide what it is that we're going to do here. Um, okay, so uh, it's difficult for me to keep track of what um, Mrs. Kim is saying when there is an interruption, but I'm doing my best. Um, so the uh, that's exactly uh, that's exactly the point, Mrs. Kim. The, the HR function of organizations routinely uses employee contractor sensitive data for very good purposes. They use social security numbers, they use driver's license, they use union membership, they use health data, they use um, even sexual orientation. Uh, and without giving examples, I mean, I think that anybody who's familiar with the HR function can read that list and it's difficult to identify to me a, a item where those use cases fit. And it doesn't make sense to me that any of that would trigger the um, 
the right to limit the use of sensitive information because they are, they are sensitive, normal, reasonable users. And I, I understand what Mrs. Kim mentioned in terms of there should be another conversation about how we provide better guidelines on employment data. But the reality is that if we do not adjust the rules, and I think that the suggestion that Mr. McTyre had is a really good suggestion in terms of the adjustment to um, provide that to Mrs. Irvin for her um, um, functioning, organizing the conversation. If, if we do not adjust that, the, this is gonna go into effect next year. So we're not gonna have those guidelines next year. So what do you do as an organization where you're looking at a list of purposes that do not fit in the things that you're doing and that require you to trigger a notification that will be confusing from my point of view to employees because you're never intending, not using um, the, if, if you, for example, are um, um, in the midst of an internal investigation uh, of uh, employee that involves the use of the content of communications, that's sensitive information. Are you gonna provide them a, a right to opt out of that use? Um, so to sum it up, I think that some adjustment is needed now and it might be a high level adjustment um, like Mr. McTaggart suggested to incorporate that language that provides the flexibility in the statute because if not this um, very um, good list that was created with the purpose of being helpful is not going to be helpful. It's going to be potentially too limiting and, and a little confusing, uh, particularly in the context of the use of HR data. I believe. Um, Thank you, Ms. Ochoa. Ms. Ms. Kim, did you want to respond? We have a couple more. Yeah, no, I, actually, I would like to hear um, what board members McTaggart and Thompson say. And I, I, I do have some thoughts as to how to proceed forward, but um, after, <laughs> okay. after they speak. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Um, Mr. McTaggart and then Mr. Thompson. Uh, thank you. Um, as I understand, uh, Ms. De La Torre uh, is raising, uh, I think, a good question about you know, not wanting to be overwhelmed with notices uh, when businesses uh, are using information for you know, purposes that, that sort of uh, uh, not meant to trigger that. What I noticed about the language that is in the preamble of 140 um, of business purposes, uh, Ms. Kim, you, you, you've inserted it in subsections six and seven. Uh, it's new there in M six and seven. And I think if you just move it to M, it would, it would, it would uh, then kind of govern the entire list as opposed to just those two lists, of those two items in six and seven. And um, just, just to clarify, it is also listed in um, two and three and four. Oh, it already, it already was. Yeah, but then I, I, I take your notation um, under, you know, I'll jot down a note and re go back and look at it and reevaluate whether it would be more appropriate. And I think it's a start. It doesn't, it doesn't wholly address uh, Ms. Ms. Delatore's point, but I think it's a start, gets you some flexibility there. And maybe it's something we can uh, continue to examine uh, in light of the employer employee uh, stuff ex expiring. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Are you suggesting that one thing we might do would be to direct Ms. Kim and her team to uh, consider introducing that into the other subsections um, and to do that if they decide that that's the right thing to do in order to go to the 15 day? Or are you suggesting that that might be something to consider in a future rulemaking package? Yeah, I think um, my, again, my uh, approach to the whole thing is let's get something done now and mm -hmm. then fix it uh, and improve it later. So I, I would say uh, that I'd like to, uh, in a future rulemaking package, Okay. Uh, move that language to the preamble to actual M. Mm -hmm. You can either put it in every single subsection or put it in M. Right. You also have have uh, Miss Kim uh, think about what uh, Miss Delatore is saying about okay, what about uh, is there any other flexibility need necessary in order to effectuate this uh, clause? Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. That's very helpful, um, Mr. Thompson. 
Thank you, uh, Chairperson Urban. So just because in tracking uh, the, the various proposals, um, and this may be Chairperson Urban, you may be able to answer this, or Mr. McTaggart could answer it directly. Is a suggestion that Mr. McTaggart just does the suggestion that Mr. Ms. Mr. McTaggart just made supersede the previous suggestion for the uh, to include that that preamble language, the one that he made ten minutes or so ago? Because if if that's the case, then my question is moot. If it's not the case, then I needed to I I didn't catch the statutory reference that he was that he made for proposed insertion of that preamble language. And then I have a, a second observation after that question. Thanks. Okay. Um, Mr. McTaggart or Ms. Kim, yeah. And uh, my understanding, and please do uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. McTaggart, is that in addition to the language referencing um, Civil Code Section 1798.121A in the preamble, we would also consider including uh, that language of reasonably necessary and proportionate. Um, in addition to the reference to the statute. Um, but my understanding is um, that that may be something that could be done now, or it could also be done in a future rulemaking package. Okay, so they were they were two complementary suggestions is the answer. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. Then a suggestion for a potential path forward, uh, and, and sorry to, uh, this may complement or, or contradict the path forward that Ms. Kim is proposing, is one of the things I took from what Ms. Delatory was observing is that there are categories of sensitive personal information that perhaps should not be included in the exception in M. And I don't know if during a break or some other period, there could be a consultation on what her specific intent is that she could work with Ms. Kim to the to the purpose that the chair made of uh, of developing a, a a suggestion for perhaps a limitation on M if that was the intent. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, that I think is a distinct possibility. Um, do you agree, Ms. Kim? So my question, and, and I do want Ms. Delatory to uh, speak as well, and my recommendation as to a manner in which we can move forward mm -hmm. is really to tee up the question for the board. Um, many uh, tee up the question for the board uh, to this regard. Uh, is, is there a desire by the board to hold off on implementing this regulation um, so that we can consider situations that Ms. Delatory um, raises related to employee employment information or to move forward with the regulation with the suggestions that have been made as to referencing the statutory uh, language as well as the reasonable necessary and proportionate language and then moving forward and discussing these issues about um, HR data within a different context because you know that is something that um, can be pulled out of the consent agenda to discuss um, this new development in the law. So I, I guess my my two questions uh, or dis, uh, how I would frame up this discussion would be, um, would the board like to move forward at, with the recommendations made and then discuss this HR issue um, separately and then make modifications as necessary, depending on where the board comes out on the, you know, uh, employee HR kind of considerations? Or would you like to hold off on in having M as a whole? Um, to have that conversation. Thank you, um, Ms. Kim. For my part, and I think I understood Mr. McTaggart correctly, and I appreciate his framing of his remarks with his overall goal, um, would be for us to move forward and consider, consider his recommendations in a future rulemaking if we had to, although if staff wanted to implement them, I think they are good. And yes, I agree. Um, that when we get to the conversation about additional items, that would probably be the time to talk about um, the changes that might affect employee data um, uh, at, that, at that time. Um, so um, Ms. Delatore has been very patient, and then we have Mr. McTaggart, um, and then we have Mr. Lay.
Thank you. I concur with Mrs. Urban and Mr. McTaggart, and I think Mrs. Um, Mr. Thompson also um, expressed similar thoughts that th we shouldn't delay. Um, and, and I think that there will be opportunities in the future to provide better guidelines on HR. To me, the um, modification that Mr. McTaggart suggested, which is just simply the, the easier way to do it would be to tweak M, so you don't have to tweak all of the examples. Just include there a reference to the fact that there's um, you know, the, the definition of business purposes that can allow for uses that are not listed, but do not trigger. Um, that's a good solve because in reality, from how I read it, that's not a change in the statute and that's not really a change in the rules. It's just a clarification. So I will think that it will delay somewhat the release of the rules for comments, but only for so long as um, Mr. Scheme might need to do that small modification to M. And I know that Mr. Scheme is very, very good at drafting statue and rules. So it shouldn't be, um, you know, more than a few days. Um, and I will be comfortable with that kind of delay, like a short delay to allow Mrs. Kim to um, tweak that. And on my side, and I don't know, um, that's just more of a question for Mrs. Urban, but on my side, I will be very willing to approve it with the understanding that Mrs. Kim will do that modification and it can be published without necessarily having to come back to the board. If there is a logistic, um, way to do that so that she can work on those Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and um, we can just trust that. Once she understands um, the concern that I'm raising and Mr. McTaggart has raised, she, she will find a way to address it um, in, a, in a streamlined, simplified way that doesn't cause long delays. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. So just, just to be, because I do think it's important, I just wanna be sure I understand what, what you're saying which I believe to be that um, you would support going forward with the modifications and the, uh, with Ms. Kim taking into account the feedback and the um, additional sort of questions that you brought up here and for us to direct staff to make a decision to implement um, the concept um, in the proposed modifications and then send it out for 15 day. But the board would all have to agree that we will be directing um, that that concept be implemented um, by the staff um, and that we are giving them the discretion to do that. That's what you're proposing? Okay, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Mr. Laird, um, are we able to uh, do a process like that? Uh, absolutely, I wanted to... Okay jump in to acknowledge that it's perfectly fine for the board to direct staff to make sort of the general con conceptual modification mm -hmm. or even to give staff the direct discretion to make that determination or how they carry it out. Um, and then staff can proceed with publishing the modified text if, if that's the direction. Wonderful, uh, thank them. you. Thank you for verifying that, Mr. Laird. I thought so, and then you came on the screen and I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe I'm wrong about something. Um, but okay, so that um, that makes a lot of sense to me, Ms. De La Torre, personally. Um, Mr. Uh, Lay and then Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, I, I had a couple of questions. Um, when, I, when I heard about the preamble edition, it didn't really bother me, but I, I, I caught something, uh, Ms. De La Torre, and, and if I'm wrong, then that's fine. But I guess adding the preamble, would that turn this from a exclusive list of the, you know, the ways businesses can use this to allowing any necessary proportionate use in the in the mind of the business to be allowed an allowed business purpose? And if that's the case, then I wouldn't support that um, that addition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, Yes, I have a I have a similar question, and I, I don't think that we can try to interpret the statute um, exactly in this meeting, but it does raise the same question for me, um, and that might militate in favor of keeping the modifications the way they are, 
And again, noting Ms. De La Torre's and Mr. McTaggart's very good observations and asking staff to put those on the list to consider when we go um, into another rulemaking package. That's another way to deal with it. Um, that would be a little bit later, but it is becoming apparent, I think, that there are potential complications um, that and questions we may have not considered. So that may be the better approach. Um, yeah, and then, oh, yeah, I wasn't, I was like, so that's, that's, yeah, I had that concern as well. And, you know, to, to Ms. De La Torre's points, you know, I, I have the thought that, you know, without going into the legal interpretation of whether the language as is would allow a business to use employee data in, in these certain ways that Ms. De La Torre raised up, I believe, you know, there is already sections in there that allows, you know, just to restate the uh, the language is, you know, businesses can use sensitive personal information to perform services on behalf of the business if it's necessary and proportionate. Um, I don't know if that applies to employee data, but, um, you know, I, I think that would allow the use to use, uh, allow a business to use as personal information for their own, um, their own services. Um, so perhaps, this whole conversation is moot. Um, so I, that was just one additional thought that I had as like, I, this, I thought these business purposes were pretty, pretty broad or as is, and um, I don't necessarily support broadening it even more. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Mr. McTaggart. Uh, thank you. So I, I, I mean, I've confused things more, but I, I think I'm agreeing with both Mr. Lay and, and Ms. De La Torre. Um, I agree with Mr. Lay. I don't think we should be trying to um, broaden the exception here. And so that's why what I would have proposed is right after the end of the first sentence in the preamble of M, the purposes for which they may select are, you know, are, are as follows. And then I would stick the, the modifier in there provided that the use of the consumer's PI is reasonably necessary and proportionate to the purpose. So that way you've, it actually is a limitation, Mr. Lay, I think the way I read it anyway, and I agree with you, we don't need to uh, increase it. And then separately, I think Mr. Latour has raised a separate question, which is, okay, is, are the exceptions in there enough in, in certain situations? And uh, as Mr. Lay just said, maybe there, maybe the language already is there. But I think what I would suggest in the interest of moving forward is we already have the first edition about the 121A3. I would, I would support putting the preamble, moving it up from the different sections so it governs, it covers the entire M. And then to Ms. De La Torre's point, what I would suggest is we uh, ask uh, staff to come up with a recommendation. Uh, and for a future rule, given that we're not going to start enforcing until July, for a future rule to deal with, because this is actually a pretty thorny issue, uh, it is, it, are these, is this list extensive enough? Uh, and are there sort of use cases where like, oops, that's a problem. And that can allow Ms. Delatore maybe to kind of put together a list of things that we, you know, it, that she, in her mind, she could communicate. Um, and uh, so I think that's kind of where I would go is let's get most of it right here. And, 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 and then also, uh, uh, not forget that she's raising a good point. We can revisit that later. My two cents. Thank you, Ms. McTaggart. I'm actually going to ask Mr. Sultani um, to speak just in case, because um, as staff, I'm sure he has insight and may have turned on his camera to say something specific. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Cherubin. Um, I was just, I, I actually, I should um, kind of. Uh, made the suggestion that I was going to flag, which is that we are likely to be doing additional rulemakings um, for a number of other reasons. Uh, and so I, I would, um, you know, on these thorny issues, I would say to provide staff some ability to try to satisfy the intent of the full board um, with some of these changes, but give us the ability to um, kind of navigate the kind of implications and rather than make commitments in real time without having um, reviewed the implications on the you know it's a it's a pretty complicated machine the statute and so and the rules and so we want to just make sure we have adequate time to satisfy the needs and if not I think there's additional time if not so that was just going to be um, just a flag that we have multiple trains 
um, likely moving the, out of the station at some point. Thank you, Mr. Soltani. For my part, I think that that is a prudent approach, um, that there has been a, a lot of analysis and um, work that has gone into the text that we have in front of us, that it is important to flag issues and that we should be judicious um, in terms of what we ask staff um, to do now and what we um, ask staff to consider in the future. Uh, and I think that this is something um, that the the, so the 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 second part of what Mr. McTaggart was describing um, is better for the future. Um, Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. I just want to go back, I think, three comments ago when uh, Mr. Lay was asking the question of whether we will be opening um, um, avenues that are not meant to be uh, open, and that is not my intent. And I don't think that the um, that the uh, suggestion that was made um, for uh, modification of M will do that. And that's because, and I understand we cannot ask staff for opinions because it's, there's, um, there's a um, whole process for the agency to come to an opinion on any specific case. But I feel that as a board member, I can speak to my own understanding of the law uh, freely. So um, that definition of business purposes that is in um, doesn't say that you can do whatever you want. It says that you can only do certain things. First of all, you have to use the data for an objective that is valid. And there are only two ways of doing that under that definition. Either the objective is an operational requirement for the business or two, is identical to the operational objective for which the information was collected and is compatible with the context of collection. So in the example that I volunteered before, I'm not gonna volunteer more examples, but in the example that I mentioned before, um, if you're collecting sensitive personal information to monitor um, diversity program, to me that's a valid objective in that the employee knows what you're collecting, they understand what you're collecting it for. Um, if it was some um, different situation where that information is collected without the awareness of the employee or without the employee um, volunteering it, the, the objective itself will not be valid. It will not fit within the definition of business purpose from my perspective. And even if the objective is valid, that definition requires two things. It requires that it be reasonably necessary and that it be proportionate. So reasonably necessary means that you could not achieve the same goal without using the data. The data is necessary for that objective. Again, in the one example that I provided, if you wanna monitor your diversity program, you need some form of diversity information to do that. It is necessary. Um, and, and the last one, the proportionality test, it requires a balancing. And in my mind, that's a balancing between the privacy rights of the individuals and the valid objective that the business might have. So even if the valid objective uh, is, is justified, even if the data is necessary, if it's not proportional, if you're using it in a way where you are um, infringing on the privacy rights of an individual to achieve a goal that is perhaps not as important, you will be outside of the definition. So for me, for example, in the same example that I was giving, um, that means that if you're, as an employer, collecting diversity data, it should be voluntary. It shouldn't be mandatory. Because if it's mandatory, it's not proportional. You are in, infringing on the right of privacy of the individual by requiring that they provide that information. So. Um, Thank you for uh, allowing me the time to explain my mind. I, I um, completely understand that it will not be appropriate for the staff to provide their opinion, but that's, I've been looking at this law for a long time and that's how I have read it. And I think that's how, that's how it read. So the intent of, um, certainly my intent, and I'm sure that Mr. McTaggart intent when he made the suggestion was not to open the door to any use. I mean, what would be the purpose of that when we're supporting a statute that provides 
uh, limitations on the use and disclosure of sensitive per personal um, information. This is one of the innovations of CPRA that was not in CCPA. Um, so um, hopefully that at least partially answers the comment that uh, Mr. Lee um, shared with us. Thank you, Ms. De La Troy. Mr. Lay? Yeah, um, I think that, that partially answers it, but I, I guess in that case, you could just replace all of them with, with that test, right? Um, Actually, you know what will be easier is to list what you prohibit. The, the challenge with this list is that it, it tries to list everything that's allowed. And that, that's very difficult to do. I think that one of the innovations of CCPA was to create a definition of what's a cell, like what are you prohibiting? Um, creating a full list of everything that is allowed, it's, I think, very challenging. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. All right. I think this has been a helpful um, conversation. It's helpful to hear the expertise of Ms. De La Torre, Mr. Lay, and Mr. McTaggart. In listening further, what I would like to propose, and I'm asking Ms. De La Torre if this is um, uh, acceptable to you, is that we staff take all of this information and all of the analysis that you have provided and for um, much of what you were just talking about, they consider whether it makes sense to consider further modifications after um, we finish this rulemaking package for the next rulemaking package. Because I will be clear that I think this is complicated and I think that um, it would mean that there needs to be a fair amount of work um, in order to implement it correctly. So that is one thing. The second thing is that Mr. McTaggart um, has suggested a change that um, uh, doesn't necessarily cover everything we've been talking about here, um, but that covers um, your first point, I think, um, which would be to um, add um, that language about reasonably necessary and proportionate where appropriate. Uh, so I think that I would be happy moving forward with the modifications staff have already made and the understanding that Mr. McTaggart's suggestion is something that they will consider and that Ms. De La Torre's um, background and analysis um, and thoughts about what might need to change will be considered in a future rulemaking package. I would also be comfortable um, directing staff to make the change that Mr. McTaggart suggested um, uh, and asking staff to consider the, the broader questions, the ones that relate to employee data um, and other things that Ms. De La Torre has been explaining to us in the future rulemaking package. I would not be comfortable trying to do all of that at once. I don't think that this is the right time to do it. I think that staff need more time. And I think the board would need more time um, to consider this. And for that, I would also circle back to Mr. Thompson's comment, which I think was very astute um, and suggestion um, that we uh, carve off the things that would be better suited to um, consultation between Ms. De La Torre and staff so that everyone has a full understanding of all the different pieces. Ms. De La Torre, is one of those acceptable to you? Um, so I actually would like to ask Mrs. Kim, because she will be the person basically uh, mm -hmm. redrafting um, from her perspective, whether that is something that might, um, you know, be too complicated. It doesn't strike me as something that is complicated for somebody with her skills in drafting, but let's, let's, let's get that. So the idea is we want to... Um, integrate the basically the definition of business purposes without opening doors that shouldn't be open. Mrs. Kim, do you think that's something that can be reasonably done in basically a few sentences or one sentence to be added to um, M? I, I don't think it's, it, it's something that is feasible to do at this point. I think it uh, we need a little bit more time to analyze things because um, it really kind of Yes, like uh, I'll have to give that some, I, I believe we should give this some more thought 
Um, and we certainly can consult with Ms. De La Torre um, with regards to future amendments, but at this time, I don't think that that's something that can be done in the immediate term. I, I would support, um, I, I do think it's doable for us to move forward with the changes that we have identified about tying the exceptions um, listed in subsection M to the statute, mm -hmm. as well as also giving some thought with regard to whether or not we can incorporate the language Mr. McTaggart um, has suggest, suggested the, you know, basically couching reasonably necessary and proportionate as additional language to address the exceptions listed in um, subsection M. I do think that's doable to do in the time frame that we have, but I, I, I believe we need a little bit more time to um, consider uh, what Ms. Delatore is suggesting. Thank you, Ms. Kim. And thank you. I apologize. I didn't mean to elide that first bucket. Um, thank you for bringing it up. So if, um, and I would like to defer to staff here because they have the most not background knowledge and they have been thinking about it um, the most carefully. Uh, so Ms. Kim's judgment as to what is appropriate and feasible to do now is very, as I believe, not just important, um, but also a very practical way to proceed. Um, and um, so I would like to check with the rest of the board as to whether there is agreement and we can move on or whether um, whether there is not. Ms. De La Torre. Okay, thank you. So going back to what Mrs. Kim was just saying, so if, it is not feasible to include a small modification. And as we agree at the beginning, this section doesn't add anything. It doesn't limit anything and it doesn't restrict anything. Then my position is that we should strike it because it's gonna cause more confusion that it is gonna solve for, it's not necessary. Um, so if we cannot fix it, then just don't include it because it's already in the statute. It, to me, the statute is clear. Um, the the list is not. Ms. De La Torre, are you willing though to go with what staff's recommendation is or are you saying you are not? Oh, okay. So let's go back uh, to Mrs. Kim. I understood what Mrs. Kim said to mean that I, um, Streamline modification that will be an addition to M is 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 too complex and is not workable. Is that correct, Mrs. King? In, no, in, in a I, short I period of time. No, I, I um, you know, it's it's difficult for me to respond because I do think that this um, involves interpretation of law and also other considerations that maybe not be appropriate to discuss during this public meeting. And that is also why um, it is my recommendation that we not um, uh, incorporate the changes that you are suggesting at this time, because it requires us to um, further discuss and analyze this issue and what is being proposed. Right, uh, okay, so we cannot modify this. Not The recommendation of the staff is that it's not a good idea to modify this subsection. And we know that this is just a list of examples it's not adding anything. It's just trying to make things simple. And it seems to me that it's not gonna make seem, uh, things simple because I can think of a, a number of use cases that really don't fit. Why don't we just take it up uh, and, and rely on the statute? The statute imposes appropriate limitations. We're not trying to modify that. Uh, Mr. Laird, I'm going to ask you to please um, uh, Yeah, yeah. I, apologies. <laughs> Given that you, yeah, um, please come up. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. I mean, I, I really support, I want to say, you know, obviously I'm, I'm pretty new to the board as the general counsel, but uh, Lisa's been here for a while doing tremendous work, kind of putting together very careful legal analyses on these positions. And so I'm just wary of sort of the legal division offering legal advice or an opinion on sort of some of these concepts as they're brought up in real time. I think uh, responsibly we'll need to evaluate them a bit more thoroughly. Um, so I, to, to that extent, I, I certainly support um, Ms. Kim's 
point that I think staff will just need to evaluate to make sure we comply with all aspects of the Administrative Procedures Act, which not just are procedural, but you know, requires to, to make some substantive considerations of, of things like authority, clarity, reference. You know, these are the standards we need to make sure we're meeting. So um, uh, with, with sort of deferring to, to Ms. Kim's initial assessment that we'll need to further analyze that, we can definitely do so. In terms though, of other, other suggestions, like the one um, Ms. Delatory is just providing, I mean, I'll, I'll defer to the board if there's uh, further interest in pursuing that or, or um, what the direction is. But um, in, in general, I would say sort of uh, any kind of major changes to these modifications uh, in, in certain instances may, may require more evaluation by staff uh, and, unless the board feels prepared to move forward without those, those um, analyses or recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Laird. I teach my students never to do legal analysis on the fly. I am uncomfortable with legal analysis on the fly. I don't think it's a good idea, um, regardless of other considerations. And I, 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 um, I am also not comfortable trying to make a decision on the fly on something that I agree probably requires some legal analysis and background research. So what I would like to do is take Ms. De La Torre's good observations um, and go with the modified text as it is or with suggestions that Ms. Kim is comfortable with um, at this time. I'm happy to support any of those. My only concern is that we are working with the text on the fly um, and we don't understand all of the potential ramifications and staff is uncomfortable that staff understands all of the potential ramifications because that is appropriate work for staff to do um, and have the time to do the analysis and then bring it to the board with that analysis. So that is what I would like to do at this point. I'm going to ask Mr. Lay and Mr. McTaggart to weigh in. Um, and if we are unable to come to a consensus on this point, then I am going to suggest that we move on and return to it later. Mr. Lay? Yeah, I, I support that recommendation. And I'll just know, I don't think we can. I mean, to, to the extent Ms. Kim can explain why we have those lists, I believe that's like statute, it's in the statute. Uh, so I don't think we can get rid of it. Um, you know, 1798.140 and, and then 121. But I, I would suggest that uh, rec so we follow that recommendation. You know, I have no issue with restating the in the preamble that it must be necessary and proportionate. Um, yeah, and I would caution against just getting rid of those section M entirely, um, as I believe, and maybe maybe Ms. Kim can can clarify that that has to be there in some shape or form because of the statute. Thank you, Mr. Lay, Mr. McTaggart. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I think I, I'd like to just uh, see if I can just summarize uh, and, and maybe we make a, I don't know if it's a motion, but like a, it's a sort of thing to, to, to move on. First of all, I do think 121 requires this list per 185, 19AC, I think it is, that says you have to have the list. By the way, I just actually noticed one thing, um, Ms. Kim, that list actually does have one further thing. So for future, it says you got to make sure that these things can't be used for health related research. So we should we should note that and, and have a have a have a note about that. Uh, these exceptions Two, I do think, uh, Mr. Latore, that actually this is a this is a limitation. It's not a bunch of examples because it says a right to limit are as follows. It doesn't say as follows, including but not limited to. So I think this is a good start. I would suggest we keep the 120 the reference to 121 uh, a that was that, that staff is suggesting we insert. I, would suggest at the end of the first sentence, we, we include that, provided that. I would suggest that's the second thing. I was just, third thing is we ask staff to go away and study the issue of, do we need more in this? And then that, I would suggest we just move on. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. I agree. Um, Ms. Kim, if Ms. Kim is comfortable with that approach. Yes, um, I, I do think that that's something that we can move forward with. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Kim. Do other board members agree with this approach? Um, Mr. Thompson, this is not, I, I, I'm just trying to make sure that I've heard from everybody before we move on if we can. Do you mind rest <laughs> restating what the, what the resolution is? That would, that would be helpful. Um, 
I see a pro there's a substance and a process thing here for me. One is I think we're we're driving towards resolution on the substance, um, uh, with the presumption that that is to Ms. De La Torre's satisfaction. But as a process matter, how we if it's not how how we drive to resolution where her concerns are addressed, uh, understand the aversion to you know legal analysis on the fly. We had previously talked about the potential for uh, staff or, or board members and staff to work on modifications on breaks to come back with something. I don't know if th this has, sounds compli sufficiently complicated that a 15 or 20 minute break is not going to resolve it. Um, so I, I do have an interest in us figuring out as as we work through this stuff as a group how we will drive to resolution when when a board member uh, addresses raises a concern that is complicated um i don't want us only to drive to, to conclusion on the simple ones we, we've got to drive to conclusion on the complex ones too thank you mr thompson i think that um if it's all right with you ms kim i could restate for mr thompson but i would like you to um if, if that's all right because i would like to locate this with you since staff is going to be implementing what the board decides is that all right yes i i would appreciate that um, so my understanding of how to move forward with regard to this provision, subsection um, M of 7027, would be to include uh, in the preamble the tying of the language or the purposes to the identified sections of Civil Code Section 1798-121A, um, to also include language that references that those exceptions also need to comply with being reasonably necessary and proportionate. Um, or the, that the use collection be reasonably necessary and proportionate to um, uh, to address those purposes for which it's being collected. Um, and that would be the sole modifications to be made um, in this rulemaking package presently. Um, with regard to future considerations, we will note what Mr. McTaggart said regarding the health related issue uh, or research. We'll also take some time to uh, to consider perhaps employment related situations or HR related data. Um, and then also we will take some time to discuss with uh, board member De La Torre her other suggestions regarding her interpretation of business purpose as it relates to this section. Um, that will be something separately done, but we don't think it's, um, uh, yeah, uh, separately done. Um, and if necessary, uh, addressed in a future rulemaking package. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Ms. De La Torre, does that sound acceptable? Uh, I just wanted to circle back to what Mr. Thompson mentioned in terms of the process, because um, we this is our first conversation on rulemaking um, substance as a board. And it seems to me that that suggestion is really valid. Uh, one possibility could be for, so we have a two-day meeting, right? Like from today to tomorrow, maybe there is an opportunity for Mr. Skin and I to get on a call and see if we can come up with a simple edit to um, to propose to the board um, tomorrow. Um, I, I will very much make myself available if that's in compliance with back leaking, et cetera. Um, and I think it could be a good process, not, not only for me, but for other board members that might have specific suggestions, because it could be that in my conversation with Mrs. Kim, she can disclose things to me that we cannot disclose in a public meeting that you know uh, affect my um, understanding of, of, the, of the possibility of the edit. Um, so um, before we go into something else, can we go back to that process and, and get an understanding maybe from our general counsel as to whether that is a possibility or not? Or Ms. Ms. Sorba might know, I don't, because we, I think in the subcommittee thought it was possible. Um, I, I'm happy to jump in and just say, I mean, uh, under Bagley Keen, it's it's certainly allowable um, what you just described. Um, although I would defer largely to to Miss Kim on 
sort of uh, the depth of legal analysis she feels like might need to go into some of these considerations. That's that's the only thing I, I will defer to her if she would, for instance, need further further time and uh, for staff to kind of come together and, and investigate any of these things. Um, that's my only concern is, as you know, sometimes 24 hours is still even a tight timeline for, for sort of a, a robust legal analysis. But if, if it's something uh, we think we can handle, it, it is allowable. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thank you so Mayor. much. I don't so, know that it is recommend, it, that is it, it is not a recommendation that I would make for most questions that are gonna actually require research and legal analysis outside of the board meeting. If we have um, a process by which there are multiple items through which there has to be a bunch of legal research and analysis, we are going to have a lot of trouble moving forward on the rules. And that is not in any way a comment on the value of the substance. It is a comment on the practical um, uh, balance that we have to strike between getting um, the work done for the public taking account of the things that are still open that we will, um, we think we have a responsibility or it's desirable or both um, to consider in the future and modifications that we either think are very necessary now um, or are straightforward enough that we can go ahead and make them and continue with the process. Um, I also appreciate Mr. Thompson's question um, about the process for continuing to go through um, the proposed modifications. Um, uh, as um, as um, has been mentioned, obviously this is the first time that the board has um, uh, worked through this particular um, process and looking at modifications for a proposed rulemaking package. The rulemaking process subcommittee did a lot of valuable and helpful thinking in trying to predict um, what might be a good process um, and how to move forward with that. Um, every process then encounters reality. Um, the modification or the sort of implementation of the process that I am hoping for was that we would be able to talk through all of the proposed modifications following the rulemaking process subcommittees, in my view, good suggestion for batching um, a number of things and also having things that are discussed individually that we talk through all of them. And then we have a decision that is clear on the record at the end um, of any potential additional modifications or disagreements that we had with what staff proposed, otherwise agreement with staff and to direct staff to move into the 15 day rulemaking period. If it is the case that we are unable to find consensus on this topic, then I am certainly prepared to put it to a motion, but I think that that is much more unwieldy given the amount of things that we are hoping to get through. So for me, the process question is a balance of our responsibilities um, to have substantive oversight, of course, of the rules, to be sure that we are transparent with the public, and to be sure that we are also making progress on the guidance that the public needs in order to implement the law. The balance for me at this point is that we take Ms. Kim's recommendation and that we do not try to do the things that on an initial reaction, which is a lot to ask of staff in a public meeting, staff thinks it's complicated that we not try to do that um, in this meeting, whether today or tomorrow. So that's my recommendation. And it has nothing to do with the value or the substance of the underlying observations. It is simply the fact that we can only do so much. We are now on record. Ms. De La Torre is on record with observations that I think are valuable to the public. She's on record with the board that this is important and it is something that she would like staff to consider. And I think that we should um, take all of that into account and not try to put it into this rulemaking package. Mr. McTiger. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to kind of reiterate some of what you just said. 
to Miss Delatore, I actually think you're raising an excellent point. I mean, I really do. And I think it's a thorny one. And I think whether it's employer, employee, or B2B, I mean, you're going to hold, hear me at some point during this meeting come up with a long list of things that I think still need to be addressed or that I didn't love. And they're going to be my suggestions to staff. Um, but, you know, you have my support in addressing this issue. Uh, just not, I don't think it's necessary to do it right now. I think in the interest of time, my own, my own recommendation would be that we advance this package. But I want you to know, as a fellow board member, I think you're raising a really excellent point. So, you know, this, this, is, this, is this list comprehensive enough? Is it the right list? Absolutely, we need to address that. Um, I just think that right now, in the interest of time, I would support moving this forward. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. I also agree. I, I am not ready to speak on the specifics, but it's absolutely, they're good questions and a thorny topic. Um, there, I certainly agree, um, as I said, that the substance is important. Thank you. Um, and Ms. De La Torre? Uh, I just wanted to go back to what um, our general counsel just mentioned, which is that I think it's possible for that conversation to happen potentially between um, Mrs. Kima and myself between today and tomorrow. I understand, and I'm, it, it is a very valid point that Mrs. Urban is bringing to, you know, how do we get through two days and everything and allow for those kinds of conversations in multiple items. So my suggestion would be table the idea of allowing for that conversation until we are towards the end of the day. If at the end of the day, there are no other items like this item, that might benefit from that conversation, then I think it's very possible that we might uh, sit down for 30 minutes and come back with a suggestion tomorrow that, that um, is sufficiently tied and, and gathers the uh, consent of the board. If at the end of the calendar today, we find ourselves in a situation where there are multiple items, I myself will take the same position that Mr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Irvin and Mr. McTaggart has suggested, which is do not delay the package because we really want the rules to be final. Um, so if we could perhaps take that if approach I, with until the end of the day, um, we will know better how visible things are. Um, just to address uh, Ms. Della Torre's suggestion, I do not think it's something that can be done in a day, uh, and I'm happy to have a conversation with her, um, even at a break today, as to why I don't think it can be done in a day, um, but I don't think it's something that I, is feasible to do, uh, uh, and that's why I would recommend that we move forward as previously discussed. And I'll just take the opportunity to clarify that um, while I do think it's, you know, possible under Bagley King to do these things, I, I certainly, you know, any indication that these are not simple fixes, I do recommend that staff be given um, sufficient time to provide, a, you know, a complete legal analysis so that we can, we can provide you the best service that we can. Thank you, Mr. Laird. Legally allowable does not necessarily mean practicable or the best approach when balancing all the different interests. Um, Ms. De La Torre, I appreciate your thoughts um, of checking back at the end of the day. I will um, defer to Ms. Kim on the question of whether for this particular item that is feasible even in and of itself. Um, so I'm happy to check in at the end of the day, um, but I am going to defer to Ms. Kim on whether for the, um, let me just back up and say the employee um, questions and the other more complicated questions that you identified, um, whether those are things that we reasonably could really cover in this meeting. Um, with that, I'm going to suggest that we take a break um, for 10 minutes um, and come back at 1140. We're going to take kind of a late lunch break, so I want to be sure people have time to get a drink um, and they have time you know, to, to stand up and move around. I want to thank the board um, for, um, as ever, a very robust um, discussion and for everybody's efforts um, to try to help staff and try to help me um, find the balance um, to do the work for the public. So we're going to take a break um, and come back at 1140. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. I want to give our moderator a chance to switch things around and everyone to put their cameras on and let us know if they're ready. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Welcome back, Mr. Thompson, Mr. McTaggart. Thank you. Wonderful. Welcome back, Ms. De La Torre. Thanks, everyone, again, for the robust discussion of the last item. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next item that Ms. Kim um, has identified. Uh, in order to help us um, with our discussion, I'm going to ask everyone to keep in mind that we have three choices uh, for each thing. One is, of course, to take staff's recommendation as it is. Another would be to propose um, minor modifications that are easy to implement. And a third would be to propose um, things uh, or bring up topics that might be best suited for a future rulemaking. Um, it is possible that there is a gray area between the second two, but I would really like to encourage the board um, to uh, focus uh, their priorities on things that are uh, that they prioritize highly um, for this rulemaking uh, and um, and communicating to the staff um, anything uh, that is important for a next rulemaking if they think it's necessary at this time. We're going to move through each of the items um, and we will check in at the end of the day as Ms. De La Torre suggested. Um, Mr. Thompson. Uh Thank you, Chair Urban. I had one other observation that goes into your third category mm -hmm. sure. in subsection M. Um, if I might, before we move on, if, if we really, I don't know if we really leaving subsection M. I, I apologize. I didn't hear the last part. You didn't know if. If we're leaving, if, if we were leaving subsection M at this time, there was one other item I just wanted to, okay. to ask a um, question about. Uh, okay. And, yeah, it was my intent to leave um, uh, subsection M. Uh, if it's an item, so there you have a couple of choices. One, of course, is to talk with staff at any time if it's in the third bucket. Um, if you think that it is important um, to mention it here in the public meeting, um, I will um, certainly uh, will give you room to do that. I think it's important to mention in the in the public meeting. Okay, please go ahead. Um, so my question is and i'm open to i i'm if i'm missing a cross reference or something else in the statute please let me know but the intersection of the addition of collect in subsection m and then with um the subsect of m4 uh the example to the exception uh from the, the right to limit uh, for to ensure the physical safety of natural persons, um, provided the use of the consumer's personal information is reasonably necessary and proportionate um, for this purpose. And then the example is, for example, a business may disclose a consumer's geolocation information to law enforcement to investigate an alleged kidnapping, um, which is obviously a situation we would all want resolved quickly. Uh, my question is typically the disclosure of that kind of information would be subject to a court order or a warrant. Um, are we creating a situation, are we giving permission for disclosure? If a company want or a business wanted to require a court order, they could, but are we give are we giving additional permission there that the disclosure could could be made? And where this intersection is is potentially concerning to me, is obviously sens sensitive personal information includes things such as racial or ethnic origin, religious or philosophical beliefs. Um, so the, the kidnapping example is obviously a, a sympathetic one. Um, there, there could be businesses that exist now or arise that collect information about people for these purposes uh, of, of, and those characteristics. And, and are we creating a situation where that business could then disclose to law enforcement uh, if law enforcement believes that a person of a certain philosophical bent is planning on 
planting an explosive, I'm just making up a different, or, or taking some other action that that business that arose to collect information could disclose it without a court order if they so chose. Um, that, if that interpretation is in the realm of possibility, that would be concerning to me. Um, certainly in the category of complex issues that cannot be uh, probably analyzed or resolved on the fly. But if I'm missing something glaring that that concern is not valid, open to, to hearing that. If not, what, I think we should look at how to potentially address this down the road. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. I, I think this is a very important observation myself. Uh, I'm going to refrain from saying more and encourage folks to refrain from analyzing things that are best in the third bucket in this meeting so that staff have the time to analyze them. Uh, I would like to say, as, as I did to Ms. De La Torre, I think substantively that this is important personally. Um, there may also be items that will arise where I haven't had a chance to analyze whether I think it is substantively important. And I also think that um, we want to be careful to remember that we have two paths to suggesting things um, for future rulemaking. One is in the meeting, one is to talk with staff. Um, and I'm hesitant to consider things um, on the fly just in general. I've made that point before. Um, I do think this is an important point, Mr. Thompson. I'm glad that you brought it up and we will collect that. I, Ms. Kim, please nod if that sounds right. We will collect that um, as well. Um, Mr. McTaggart, um, you may have a word. Yeah, this is not to say anything other than um, to Mr. Thompson, you know, this is something we considered at, at length when we were writing it. And if you look in 145, the exemptions, the reason 145 uh, A4 is structured so that you can, if a natural person is at risk of danger or death, you can cooperate with government agency. But that was, this, there was quite a bit of to and, to and froing with, uh, you know, civil society folks. And so the caveats are that the, it has to be approved by a high ranking agency officer it's got to be a good faith determination. It's a lawful basis. And then because a court order can take too long in, in an emergency situation, if it's a suicide or, as you say, a, you know, a, a terrorist or something like that, it, there's a there's a it has to be a court order within three days. And then even within the uh, A2 exemption around the uh, the court order and everything, it, it actually there's also the language uh, around um, uh, it's pursuant to a law enforcement agency approved investigation, which gets you around kind of the rogue investigator. So there's quite a lot of, you know, thought we went into 145A, some of those exemptions there. Uh, and I just, you know, might have you take a look at those too, because just to make sure that, you know, that th there was some thought about this whole area. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, I would please again like to encourage the board not to get into substance that is not before us now, although I certainly value um, everyone's perspective and um, noting things um, that they think should be considered for another rulemaking package. Uh, I really do not um, think that it is the best use of our time or a good approach when we haven't had a chance to analyze it carefully to have a discussion about the merits of things that are outside um, what we are considering today. Um, that does not mean that your expertise and observations are not valuable or that it's simply a matter of trying to make sure that we are most appropriately um, using this meeting. So um, thank you. I'm inclined to move on. Ms. De La Torre, do you have um, something on this? I just wanted to move back to the comment from Mr. Masagar because I didn't completely understand it. So are we saying that there is there's other language in the statute that was just not incorporated into the list. That's why Mr. Um, Thomas is not reading it. I, I, his point seemed valid to me. Is, is that the case that there's language in the statute that was just not incorporated in the, uh, in the you, rules? Thank you, Ms. Kim. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to note the context in which uh, this exception is listed. It's really with regard to the exception to um, giving a consumer the right to opt out of the disclosure of the sensitive personal information in this instance. I believe the um, scenario that Mr. Thompson is uh, raising 
uh, would be outside of that situation of the context of this uh, regulation, but it's certainly a valid one for the staff to consider. And I do think that um, the staff is, itself can do a bit more analysis of explaining different situations to board members at a later time. But I certainly, um, uh, Ms. Delatory, to answer your question, I don't think that it, it the context is not, the context of what that exception falls into is with regard to whether or not a right to limit is offered to a consumer in uh, in those situations. And it's something that is statutorily included. And um, with regard to what Mr. Thompson is talking about, I do think it's a little bit of a different scenario that certainly staff can analyze. And my question was to really try to understand um, Mr. McTaggart's comment. Did, so, did I understand you, it correctly? Yeah, I, I think, again, it's an important question that you have. I think that we should have this conversation after staff has a chance to go through the items in the third bucket, which is where Mr. Thompson placed it. We could talk about the statute all day. I was just trying to understand a comment that another board member made. That's all I'm trying to do. Is that something we want to do later? I think so. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, um, Mr. Thompson. Um, Ms. Kim, do you have what you need um, for the moment um, on this provision? And shall we move to the next one? Yes, I, I believe it would be appropriate to move on if everyone's ready to do so. Um, the next item or the sections that we'll be covering are basically all in Article 4. So it'd be Section 7050, 7051, 7052, and 7053. These are the sections that pertain to service providers and contractors and third parties. And I just grouped them together just because even though not all of the sections related to those provisions um, were necessarily highlighted in gray, I just wanted to provide a greater overview of the comments made so that I could bring awareness to the actual changes that we did make um, as they relate to those grayed out portions. So, uh, you know, I am taking a bit of a step back to give a broader point of view regarding those sections, um, although not every single provision I think are is really necessary to discuss or um, or I don't anticipate that the board will want to discuss all of these items. Um, so just giving, taking a step back and giving some explanation, um, you know, we received many comments on this whole article <laughs> section about um, service providers, contractors, and third parties. Contractors, as you may recall, is a new term that was added to um, the statute by the CPRA amendments. Um, many of the comments, I think, have issues with the law in and of itself and not necessarily our regulations. Perhaps it is a, a bit of an oversight on the comments part with regard to understanding that these are requirements in the statute um, and not, not new requirements or extra statutory. But just to give a general overview of the, de of the themes that we were seeing, um, some of the comments uh, dealt with requirements of what needed to be in the contracts. They claim that you know, we were including things in addition to what the law required and it was increasing burden and they wanted some more flexibility on how to include that information. Um, I would note one particular example is that uh, they, uh, many commenters uh, discussed or noted that uh, they thought it was extremely burdensome to specifically identify the business purpose that they were servicing within the service provider or contractor contract. Um, I do believe that this is something that is explicitly required by the statute. And so with regard to that, we have not made any changes to uh, the regulations. Uh, another uh, comment that they uh, suggested was they, you know, comment, some commenters objected to the similarity of the contractual requirements for third parties, that it was too prescriptive for third parties to have these um, provisions included in their contracts. And uh, generally speaking, we did not make any significant changes to those provisions because again, we believe that it is explicitly referenced in the statute itself, um, specifically 1798.100D, um, and that's all set forth in our ISOR. Uh, there was additional comments about um, in, uh, you know, uh, assertions that cross-contextual behavioral advertising was something that service providers and contractors could do under 
uh, as a service provider or contractor. And again, this is contrary to the law. Um, we set forth our explanation in the ISOR very explicitly, although we did make some slight changes to the regulations to address that it pertains to the specific personal information that is collected pursuant to the, uh, you know, some couching of that behavior, uh, couching of that language, and I'll, I'll explain it a little bit in greater detail later time. Um, there were general other comments made regarding, you know, uh, extra examples where people had issues with thinking that the examples in our uh, contracts were excessive or um, seeking some clarification or confirmation that uh, CCPA obligations apply to personal information, only the personal information collected um, by the service provider and contractor and not all of the personal information that particular entity holds. Um, there was some question as to asking us to clarify what is a business purpose um, and when service providers and contractors can combine personal information, especially as it pertains to data security. Um, there were some objections to due diligence requirements um, in 7051 and 7053. But in addition, I just want to point out that there was support for the requirements um, of written contracts. You know, on, they, there was support by people in the public who appreciated the fact that we included some baseline requirements for service providers and contractors and third parties so that it's easily referenced um, and easy for uh, these entities to understand. So uh, that's a general overview of some of the comments that were made. Um, now I wanna kind of walk you through or explain some of the modifications that were made to these sections generally. Um, one of the high level explanations I would give is that we really made an effort to go back to all of these regulations uh, to tie all the requirements, particularly the requirements of what needs to be in the contract, very closely with the requirements of the statute. So we deleted some sections as unnecessary given explicit contractual requirements, but we, you know, we did take a closer look at uh, 1798-100D in particular to really make specific and really make clear what was required under the statute to include. Um, you know, I wanted to note that provisions in section 7052 um, were deleted because we thought that 1798 100, uh, I'm sorry, the section subsections in the regulation 7052 were deleted because we thought that civil code section 1798 100D and 1798-135F were clear enough with regard to what kind of obligations third parties hold with regard to the personal information at issue. And so that is part of the reason we deleted those sections. Um, we also used more precise language throughout the entire Article 4 um, about how the CCPA obligations applies to the personal information, quote, collected pursuant to the written contract with the business. Now we capitalize the word C, collect, because that is specifically defined in the statute. And so we wanted to make sure that people saw and recognize that the definition or the term was being used in the statute. Um, this language or this phrasing that we use throughout this article is significant be it, because it accounts for the difference between what a service provider is and what a contractor is. In many instances, it sounds the same. And I think all of the requirements that the regulations set forth would apply equally to a service provider and a contractor. But there is a slight nuance between the definition of a service provider and contractor. And that's where a service provider collects personal information from the business or the consumer who is interacting with that business directly. For um, the service provider collects um, from the business or conser, uh, consumer, the personal information that is necessary to service that business. Um, in contrast, the contractor um, may collect personal information from another business in order to service the business with whom they have the contract. And so it's, it's a very slight nuance, um, but because of that, we wanted to make sure that we use more precise language throughout Article 4, and we thought that collected um, pursuant to the written, their written contract with the business was the best um, or the most accurate or precise way in which to de designate or articulate um, where the CCPA obligations, to what personal information those CCPA obligations apply to. I do want to note um, there were a few spots, one or two spots that where we forgot to change or we didn't catch changing that phrase 
collective uh, pursuant to a written contract. Um, one is in 7050A, so we recommend making that change to maintain consistency throughout the regulations. Um, and we just wanted to, uh, I wanted to make sure that the board was aware of that. Um, in addition, I, I wanted to note with regard to 7050B, um, for cross-contextual behavior advertising services, we added that clarifying language there as well, that the service provider or contractor is a third party with respect to cross-contextual behavioral advertising services, because that is not uh, a business purpose for which a service provider or contractor can um, uh, contract uh, with a business and therefore uh, fall within exception to a sale or sharing of data. So that is something that we were very, uh, we want to clarify and make more precise. Um, but to be clear, you know, there was a lot of comments regarding that provision and uh, we just want to know, I think the law is very clear that when a consumer opts out of the sale or sharing of personal information, that also applies to cross-contextual behavioral advertising services, and thus cross-contextual advertising services cannot be a valid business purpose for which a service provider or contractor can um, contract with a business. And that is because service provider or contractor is an exception to sale or sharing. So it's, it, it, you cannot be in that exception to sale or sharing when you're dealing with cross-contextual behavior advertising. Um, with regard to another modification we made, um, we clarified uh, where a service provider or contractor can combine personal information even when it's not explicitly addressed in the contract. And that is notated in 7050A3 um, for instances where the, uh, where the service provider or contractor is building or improving services contracted for. That doesn't need to be explicitly stated in the uh, contract. And again, with regard to 7050A4, as it relates to today's security, fraud, and illegal activity, um, there is a new item that I wanted to note again, uh, another new item, and that's in 7051A3. And I'll just note that that is um, on page, I believe, 56. Um, in that instance, we do recommend striking the last sentence in uh, 7051A3. And that last sentence says, this section shall list the specific business purposes and services identified in subsection A2. We thought it was a necessary, uh, the reason why we're striking that language is because it's a necessary and duplicative since, uh, since the contract already needs to identify that in A2. So we just thought it was a bit uh, unnecessary um, and unnecessary and du duplicative in that instance. Now, uh, what I have, you know, teed up for board discussion today is basically four items um, and a few additional modifications I want to bring to the board's attention. Um, the, you know, the four on the chart, um, you know, sorry, and I'll go through these in order chronologically, but they are basically the first one is 7050G, which pertains to non-business. Um, and I can direct you to 7050G. I believe it is in on page, I believe it's page 55, in case you want to look at your notes or your doc, document. I, I might be off because I'm working off of a different uh, document on my uh, computer, but I just want to tee this up for the board. Um, previously, we included a section called uh, section 7050A. And that is something that we recommended that we withdraw um, in this, in the proposed modifications made. Um, you know, upon reconsideration, we thought it was not as applicable because of new contractual requirements for service providers and contractors that were included by the CPRA amendments. Um, how we wanted to address the situation instead was to add a new definition of non-business and explain how an entity providing services should assess whether they are a business. Um, basically, we included this section in subsection G, whether an entity that provides services to a non-business, which would be, for example, it would be like a nonprofit or um, a government entity, you know, whether or not they must comply with a CCPA request depends on whether that entity is a business as defined by civil code section. 1798 140D. And so our new item or recommendation is for us to just 
state that first line. Um, request depends on whether the entity is a business. Add just the reference to the actual definition of business that is included in the statute, which is 1798-140B, uh, I'm sorry, 140D. And then we recommend that we delete the rest of the uh, language within that section. Um, our recommended, we recommend deleting it because we think the law is clear on its face. And I also think that, um, well, staff believes that the example could be imprecise and open to nuances depending on the factual situation. And so for that uh, reason, we think it's better just to direct and uh, direct those in um, who are reading the regulation uh, to note what the, what the statute says. Um, we do think that the regulation in and of itself is necessary or is helpful and necessary to clarify for businesses like how to or clarify for these entities what to look at. But as to um, the example, I think that the example is probably imprecise or could be interpreted as being imprecise. And so we don't think it's necessary at this time. We'd rather just proceed with the um, reference to the actual definition, defin uh, the definition of business in the civil code section. So I'm going to take I'm going to stop right there just in case there's any questions or discussion regarding that recommendation before moving on to another uh, discussion item. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Kim. For my own benefit, um, if you will indulge me, could you um, suggest a page number for the last um, suggestion? Sure. It is page 55 and it is um, subsection G. So 7050 subsection G. Okay, I have green underlining. I was looking for the deleted example. Oh, that is new. So basically, what the uh, deletion Thank would you. be? That's that's okay. I, okay. I apologize. <laughs> I was I was looking and I was listening, and so it's from the green text that yeah. you are recommending that the example be deleted. Thank you. My apologies. I am in the right place. Um, all right. Uh, and thank you, Ms. Kim. She has asked if there are questions or comments on that change. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. It looks like a prudent change to me. So thank you, Ms. Kim. Shall we go to the next? Sure. The next section is 70, and this is the gray highlighted sections. It is 7051A6, 7052B, and 7053A3. Um, this is all the provisions in these statutes that talk, in these regulations, I'm sorry, that refer to the same level of privacy protection as required of businesses. Um, we just wanted to highlight, I, I'm not sure if this is really um, necessary for the board to discuss about, but the reason why this section, these sections were highlighted in gray was we wanted to make sure to bring to the attention um, our understanding of, of the statute as it pertains to these contractual requirements for businesses, uh, for service providers and contractors and even third parties. Um, we wanted to note that um, civil code section 1798 100D, D2, and D3 basically state, you know, D2 states that um, the service provider, contractor, or third party must uh, be, must, I'm sorry, the contract with the service provider, contractor, or third party must include a provision that requires them to provide the same level of privacy protection as required under this title. And then 1798 100 E3 goes on to require that the service provider, contractor, or third party uses the personal information transferred in a manner consistent with the business's obligations under this title. And so therefore, that is why we included that language of providing the same level of privacy protection as required by of businesses, because in essence, the third party service provider or contractor is standing in the shoes of the business. Those are, uh, that is, you know, in effect, in effect, um, this means that these people are contractually required to treat it like the business does. And so these modifications in this section make that clear throughout. Thank you, Ms. Kim. All right, um, I am looking for hands. I don't see any. Are there further 
I, sub items that you'd like to go through, Ms. Kim? With regard to this, oh. Okay, um, Mr. McTaggart. Sorry, I, and just um, Ms. Kim, on the third party, 7052, the struck language A, B, and C, is your, I just rem, is your contention that uh, yes. the new A, B, and the new A and B cover? Yes. Um, uh, just to clarify, I, I, I know I'm anticipating your question, Mr. McTaggart, so I'll go ahead and uh, note that. I believe the sections in uh, 752, we, we deleted those sections because we think the obligations um, in 1798-100D and also included within the contractual provisions in the regulations, which basically mirror 1798.100D, are sufficient enough, uh, sufficient to address these kinds of situations. Um, and so that that is why at this point in time we we deleted those sections to um, to simplify implementation at this time, and because we thought that the other contractual provisions were um, adequate to address those uh, interests. And so, a the new A and B talk about third parties that don't have contracts. Uh, and so, those are not new provisions. They were just moved over okay. from the 7053 yeah. section. Shall not collect, you know, use, process, retain, sell, or share the personal information that the business made available to it. And then B also talks about the business made available to it. And I guess I'd just like to maybe flag for a future rulemaking that I think is, may, I might be misunderstanding, but isn't there a world where there's a third party processing information that the business hasn't made available to it? Uh, they're just... I'm just trying to think about that. Um, if you, I guess made available would, would cover selling. Yeah, I, I think we intentionally used that phrase because okay. it yeah. seemed to be the most, um, it, the broadest. Yeah. Okay, I was thinking I was thinking of someone parked on someone's page, but if, you're, if it covers sale as well, I think you're good. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm good, thank you. Thanks, Mr. McTaggart. Further questions? All right. Um, Ms. Kim, uh, yes. I'm looking at my gray. Um, is, is, there, is there more or is it time, would you like to summarize? Sure. Uh, well, as far as I understand, um, what has been included as modifications in section 7050, 7051, 7052, and 7053, mm -hmm. um, uh, that the board has uh, no issues or further discussion or changes to be made to those sections. And in addition uh, to the two uh, hi highlighted or three highlighted new items, one in which um, in 7050A, where we want to apply the collected pursuant to the written contract with the business, that that is also to be included. Um, 7051A3, the last sentence uh, referencing the specified business purpose um, will be struck out. And with regard to 7050G, anything after the first sentence um, as slightly changed to reference the civil code section definition of business will be also struck um, from that section. That is my understanding of the modifications made to these sections. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kim. We paused for part of that, but not all of it. So I would like to pause now based on Ms. Kim's, I think, very succinct and clear summary. Mr. McTaggart, um, please go ahead. So my uh, question, which is not for this rulemaking, but is for the future. So the struck insertion in 7053, B, the orange language is at the top of page 60. Um, when I look at this, a business that authorizes, the, the struck language is that authorizes third party to collect personal information from a consumer through its own website. And then I look at the statute in 1798 135F. I, I would like to ask staff to go back and look at that in the future because the intention in 135F was that if you're a newspaper, for example, and you know you have a service provider, other people, it could be third parties or, or, or service providers collecting information, call them third, third parties collecting information on your uh, on your website, uh, that they also would 
eventually have to comply with the consumer's request to opt out. And I think by striking this language, we have uh, uh, potentially weakened uh, or, or, or diverged from the intent of, of 135F. So I'd like to ask them uh, to go back and look at 135F in light of the fact that that was a pretty important um, uh, 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 concept. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Mr. McTaggart, um, I, so, go ahead, Ms. Kim. I, Yes, I, I just wanted to address that 753B was removed um, to simplify implementation at this time because it pertains specifically to requiring third parties to search for and look for the opt out preference signal. Um, I don't, uh, we, we certainly, I, I think uh, my understanding of Mr. McTaggart's um, comment is actually broader than just looking at the opt out preference signal, but with regard to um, any kind of request to opt out that is forwarded to uh, third parties or that are that is recently apparent to the third parties, um, we will certainly uh, take a look at that. And um, I'll put that in that third bucket of uh, future rulemaking and for consideration. Thank you, Ms. Kim, and thank you, Mr. McTaggart, um, for pointing that out. Ms. De La Torre? Uh, thank you. I just wanted to point out that I have an item in 7050 that I want to bring up. I, I don't think it's sufficiently related to the conversation we're having. So maybe it's something that needs to be moved to the end, but I just wanted to flag it for, for the chair. Okay, great. Wonderful. What is the subsection? Uh, it's just a general comment to 7050. There's no specific sub, subsection. Okay. Thank you. It is on the list. Thank you. Sorry. Much. Yes. All right. Anything further from the board? Um, going off of Ms. Kim's, I think, very helpful summary of the changes in these sections. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the two remaining sections are 7002 and 7025. You know, I propose that we move forward with 7025 first just because. Um, uh, to have the benefit of Mr. Soltani's experience, um, uh, technical experience, and I don't want to catch him too late in the day since he um, is presently in Turkey. Uh, so I think it might make sense to take 7025 first if it's all right uh, with the board. Please go ahead. Okay, wonderful. Um, so with regard to 7025, um, this is the section that pertains to opt-out preference signals. Sorry, Ms. Kim, you know what I'm going to ask for. Um, I'm scrolling madly on my chart and sure. <laughs> on my modified text. And so um, if you have a page, if you don't, it's okay. I'll no, no, it. it's page 40. So okay. page 40, yeah, um, page 40. So uh, the opt-out preference signal is probably, you know, an area in which we receive the most amount of uh, uh, comments. Uh, that being said, I have to say that they, none of the comments that we received were things that we didn't already anticipate seeing and uh, may in many respects be uh, addressed by our current ISOR. The in, in, I'm sorry, the initial statement of reasons that we ha had included with regard to the draft regulations. Uh, we received many comments on this section, both in support of opt-out preference signals general, generally in our uh, regulations themselves, as well as those raising some concerns about it. Um, the high level themes, I would say, with regard to those sections had to do with, um, you know, uh, a, a disagreement as to the interpretation of the statute that it was not mandatory, but optional. Um, again, I believe that our initial statement of reasons very explicitly goes through our understanding, our interpretation of the statute. And so um, none of the changes, there were no changes made um, in response to those comments. Um, in addition, there were uh, questions as to the technical specifications or, you know, desiring that the agency provide technical specifications, um, comments regarding whether or not, um, comments alleging that the agency did not comply with the guidance given in 1798, 185A, 19 through 20. Um, and so I, I, Again, I don't think those are anything that we didn't anticipate and we explained our reasoning within the initial statement of reasons to address those concerns. Um, some of the other concerns raised were that uh, implementing the opt-out preferences signal was too hard or burdensome. And with regard to that topic, I do think that much of 
our regulations, <laughs> the draft regulations are very um, similar, if not identical to regulations that are already in place that implement the California, the CCPA, and not only those that are in place for the CCPA, but those that are already being enforced by the Attorney General's office. So um, I want to note that, that that is already something that is required under the law currently. Uh, there were some concerns about the level of friction allowed by the regulations, and so uh, friction in the process of using opt-out preference signal, and I do think some of our modifications address those concerns. Um, and just generally speaking, some people pointed out that you know using opt-out preference signal may be confusing to some to consumers. That being said, you know there were also a number of uh, supporting comments um, that also reemphasize that uh, the opt-out preference signal is not optional, but mandatory according to how the statute is written. Um, support for how the opt-out preference should apply to the consumer and not just the browser or device, meaning that there should be some linkage between the browser and device and the consumer if they are known um, to the business. And that generally speaking, opt-out preference signals uh, you know, should, should exist because they make opt-out easy for consumers across different websites and that sort of thing. Uh, so high level, I wanted to note the changes that you know, we have um, made to the section and also those who uh, which are you know designated for discussion um you know there sorry let me take a step back there are some that uh, uh changes that are that i will tee up for discussion for the board but i also wanted to note for the board uh first um that as i mentioned earlier no changes were made um based upon the argument that you know the opt-out preferences signal was off optional. I believe that's an incorrect interpretation of the law. Um, also, with regard to technical specifications and the compliance given, uh, the comments do not bring up anything new that wasn't already considered and accounted for in the initial statement of reasons. Um, we do make some clarification that a business that does not sell or share personal information does not need to respond to opt-out preference signal. I believe this goes without saying, but we added this language to make this clear in the modifications, it's one of the consent items. It's not designated for discussion necessarily today. Um, we also added language to make clear that when we refer to processing of the opt-out preference signal, that means that the business is treating it as a valid request to opt out of sale or sharing, just in case there was any kind of ambiguity with regard to that. Um, we added some language throughout the section to clarify that certain obligations only flow to the consumer when that consumer is known to the business. And um, with regard to 7025 G3, which is talking about whether or not you can fully effectuate the frictionless response, we added language to clarify that if the business needs additional information from the consumer to fully effectuate the requirement, they do not qualify for that frictionless exception. Um, those are just high level changes that aren't necessarily um, ones that I thought were, uh, or that staff designated for discussion um, for, from the board. But uh, those who, those which I, uh, the staff has identified uh, for discussion, two of which are on the chart, and then two are additional modifications that staff would like to recommend um, are basically. 7025C, 7025C2, 7025C4, C7D. And basically, I'll, I'll go through these chronologically. I, I don't think it, it's necessary for me to necessarily um, go through them. But I, I just wanted to make a note that um, the following items are ones that I uh, that staff thinks either wants to make the board aware of because they are new modifications. Um, or are, are ones that have been previously highlighted on the chart, but because of ease of reference, I'm gonna walk you through them chronologically. So it's not just gonna be the gray items first, but rather I'm gonna walk you through them chronologically so that it makes a bit more sense. Um, and, and so I'm gonna start off with 7025C and 7025C is on page 40. Um, this is the section that really sets forth um, when a business has to, uh, when a business is, uh, uh, how the business treats an opt-out signal, preference signal that it receives. Um, one of the, com you know, one of the things that staff had come to um, uh, have ha have been thinking about is, um, you know, 
the way that the regulations are set up is that a business is to treat an opt-out preference signal as a valid right to opt out for the browser and device, and then if known for the consumer. That is how the regulation is set up. Now, the clearest example of when a consumer is known to the business is when that consumer is logged in to like say their account and that there's some type of connection made between the browser device and the, the business's account with the consumer so that there's some type of linkage. But there can also be some cases or instances where businesses have pseudonymous profiles of the consumer associated with the browser or uh, with the browser or device identifier. And you know, one example would be a business identifies user one, two, three um, as logged in in browser A, but also logged in, or I'm sorry, let me not use the word logged in, but uh, one example is, you know, is, um, is that you know, a business might identify user one, two, three as being on their website, um, both with using a browser, browser A, but also with regard to a mobile device B. So this is not associated with necessarily a logged in account or account name, but rather a user one, two, three, but it's linking across different kinds of devices and browser identifiers. And so what is, uh, you know, what I think that this understanding of if known with regard to the consumer, yes, it's clear if it's a, if known with regard to a logged in account, but it also would be if known with regard to any kind of consumer profile associated with that browser or device. And I, 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 we recommend including some language in 7025C1 that makes clear that the opt out preference signal should apply to the browser and device and, and quote, any consumer profile associated with that browser or device. Um, that is the recommendation we make, and we want to just uh, make that clarifying, um, tee that up for the board's discussion or uh, questions related to that as to the direction we take. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Mr. Sultani, um, did you have something to add on that? Yeah, if, it, if it's helpful, I can just um, kind of try to um, simplify Lisa's uh, presentation in the sense that, you know, typically, individuals are known to websites, either when you explicitly declare your identity to the website using, uh, you know, by creating an account and signing in. And so that's often the logged in known, but more often or quite often, um, businesses often, or businesses link individuals devices together in, in a fashion known as probabilistic right, linking. So I might not know who you are, but I might know that your phone and your uh, browser are linked to the same individual. And that's another way of knowing the consumer as is the same consumer. And I think that the examples were to clarify that those are also known individuals. They're known uh, by the de definition of consumer um, linked by any unique identifier, including probabilistic identifiers, which is in the definition of um, uh, of the statute. And so the example was just to refer back to the unique identifier and probabilistic identifiers as described in consumer um, uh, in the statute. That's helpful. Thank you. Shall we ask for questions now, Ms. Kim? Oh, okay. yes. All right. Yeah. Um, questions or comments on this? on, excuse me, on accommodating pseudonymous probabilistic identifiers for consumers and the changes were, that were made in order to do that. Mr. McTaggart, your hand went up and it went down. Well, just to note, like a thumbs up on a video, it, it probably would help if you verbalize it just for the transcript's sake, That's but right. thank you. Oh, was it a thumbs up? Okay, yes, Mr. Uh, McTech, if you have an agreement, please state it for so, the transcript. Sorry, that's a very valid point as my uh, first recorded. Yes, uh, I, I, I agree. I think it's supported in the statute uh, given the definition of personal information, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Any other comments or questions? I also agree. I think this, these are helpful clarifying changes. The statute says what the statute says, and I think it's pretty clear, but I also think that it's always helpful for the regulations um, to give guidance of how people understand what the statute says. So I think these are helpful clarifying modifications and appreciate them. Uh, further comments? Okay. Um, Ms. Kim, then I think you said that you had two items that you wanted to tee up um, within this general area. Yes. Uh, 
there may be a couple more, but let me go ahead and walk through. Um, I just want to make clear that that um, with regard to this idea of pseudonymous uh, profiles, that the direction that the board, uh, that staff is making and that appears to have no opposition um, with regard to the board is uh, making clear that the opt-out preference signal is a valid request to opt out um, for the browser and device and any consumer profile associated with that browser or device in which the signal comes from. Great. Um, so the next item is 7025C2. Um, 75C2 is also on page 40, but it also runs into page 42 or possibly may run into page 42. Um, now, you know, as, ex as set forth in the regulations, there is an opt-out preference signal that is mandatory for consumer, uh, for businesses to honor as a valid request to opt out, but there is also two kind of ways in which a business can respond to them. One way that is required is that they respond and they can have a certain amount, a limited amount of friction with regard to understanding and interpreting the opt-out preference signal. And then separately, there is this frictionless um, response to an opt-out preference signal that gives the business an additional benefit of falling within an exception to uh, posting a do not sell my personal information link or do not limit the use of my sensitive personal information link. Um, so that is a frictionless response. What I wanted to do and explain here um, for the board or tee up for understanding is that with regards to C2, um, the business is only allowed to create friction in three ways uh, and, and to articulate this. First, the business is allowed to ask the consumer if they want to identify themselves um, to facilitate the right to opt out for further kind of implication. Like for example, uh, the business is allowed to ask the consumer to, um, I, uh, do you wanna log into your account so that we can apply your request to opt out to more than just the browser and device, but perhaps offline sales that the, that the business is getting if they're selling or sharing their data to say marketing, you know, other marketing situations or something like that, or other businesses. Second, the second instance in which they can create quote unquote friction would be to inform the consumer of the conflict with a pre-existing account setting and ask them if they want to opt back into the sale of sharing of personal information. Um, I'll go into this in greater detail later, but that can only be one, done once within a 12 month period, especially if the consumer is known and that's, you know, there's other provisions that apply to that. And third, the third instance when they can introduce friction is to inform of a conflict with a financial incentive program and ask the consumer what they want to do in that situation. Um, we think it is clear from C1 that with regard to scenario number one, which is the, you know, if uh, scenario number one is which the business says, hey, do you want to identify yourself? Do you want to log into the account so that we can apply this to offline sales or additional settings where we need to know who you are. Um, if the consumer does not decide to opt in, like it does not decide to account for themselves, um, the business is, is still needs to respond to the opt-out preference signal, but only as to the browser and device. Um, I think that is clear from you know C1, but to the extent that that is not clear, um, to the extent, you know, just to make sure that people understand that fully, we do make a recommendation to include in C2 the language of like, however, if the consumer does not respond, the business shall still process the opt-out preference signal as a valid request to opt out of sale or sharing for that browser device or any consumer profile associated with that browser and device. Um, we thought it might be uh, helpful to include that language just to make that ultimate clear that you can't just ask them, do you wanna log in? And then if they don't respond or do anything that they can somehow ignore the opt-out preference signal as a whole. And I don't think that's, how the, the regulation is written, but it, it certainly um, can be helpful to make that explicit. So that is the, the item that you know we are proposing here. Thank you very, very much. And um, could you just give us the, um, the regulation section and subsection again, so everyone can have it in front of them if they have questions? Sure, it is 7025 C2. Mm -hmm. um, what we propose including is that in that section, um, we would, you know, just for ease of readability, we would take the line 
the sentence that says any information provided by the, well, uh, any information provided by the consumer shall not be used or disclosed or retained for any purpose other than processing the request to opt out of sale or sharing. That's already in there, but just for ease of reading, we'll move it up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then we would add at the very end, an additional line that says, you know, after, for example, um, a business may give the consumer the option to provide information that identifies the consumer so that the request to opt out of sale or sharing can apply to offline sale or sharing of personal information. And then what we would recommend adding is, however, if the consumer does not respond, the business shall still process the opt-out preference signal as a valid request to opt out of sale or sharing for that browser or device and any consumer profile the business maintains linked to that browser or device. Thank you very much. Um, and this is new. This is a new modification. I, I just want to make sure. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> this is a new modification. modification um, I should given that, that earlier in the meeting, I was searching around um, for it in case anybody else was. Um, this is a new modification that you yeah, are. I've read C2 now five times looking for the, <laughs> that. So thank you for that clarification. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Kim. I see that um, Mr. Thompson and I are now like have the right language in the right place. And Mr. McTaggart has his hand up. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, st I strongly support the addition of this language. My, you know, my concern originally with, with 7025C was that businesses would use it as a way to, to kind of scare you into giving more information saying well this isn't going to work unless you give us your email and then just kind of have consumer friction and just general uh make it less workable and i think specifying it is useful because i really think um as long as it's one click where i say no i don't want to do it just x and i'm done fine but if it's like six clicks where i have to everybody's going to turn off their opt-out it's got to be simple so I, I support this language thanks thank you mr mctaggart mr lay I had a question. So to what extent, yeah, to, to Mr. McTaggart's point and, you know, um, can this friction having like, uh, you know, this friction having method constitute a dark pattern? Is there any protections against that? Um, yeah, so I'm just kind of curious how those two sections interact with each other. Sure, thank you. And I can answer that question. Um, 7025 is for opt-out because an opt-out preference signal is supposed to be seen as a valid request to opt out 7004 which is the section that provides guidance regarding obtaining consent and methods of uh, uh creating methods for consumer requests still applies to an opt-out preference signal so you know creating six clicks and all that kind of stuff you know uh, if that doesn't match up with the guidance provided in 7004 about having some synchrony and that sort of thing, um, making it easy for consumers to execute or choice architecture that, you know, would be, uh, would impair a consumer's choice, that, that, those provisions would still apply. Um, what we note is that there is um, essentially three instances in which a business may allow a limited amount of friction, and those are identified here. One is to ask the consumer if you would like to log into your account or identify yourself further so that you can further execute that um, request to opt out. And then in the instances of financial incentive programs and previously included, um, uh, previously existing settings. So those are the only three instances that we think um, friction would be allowed. And again, we have an extra, you know, extra scenario where there's even less friction and then you can, you know, you have the additional benefit of not having to post the do not sell or share my personal information link. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. DeLay. Ms. DeLatroy? Thank you, Mrs. Irvin. Um, um, just going back to the comment from Mr. Lee, I've been wondering, um, because this, this whole um, friction is something that has happened before and, and organizations that might have an economic benefit in creating friction tend to be really creative. Um, so in terms of the, the strategy that we're setting here, how are we gonna monitor the reaction 
in the market. I mean, how if if what we are proposing results in something that maybe we're not really anticipating, do we think that we will redo the rules to address that behavior? The goal really, I think, from the proponents of the CCPA side was to ensure that the consumers had an easy way to express their preference and that they really had a better experience navigating online, being confident that their information was not reused. Um, so have we given it some thought? It's not as specific to the rules, but to, to this provision, but I think it's sufficiently related to, to bring it into the conversation, Mrs. Sherman. Yes, thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I quite agree. And I see that Mr. Soltani um, may be able to shed some light on this. I can, I can jump in. Um, we, we've had, staff has had a, um, a lot of discussions about this very point, Ms. De La Torre. And um, the reason we flag this as a kind of a board conversation is that there are trade-offs, there's policy trade-offs. So indeed providing um, the user the ability to essentially further identify themselves or authenticate themselves does create friction um, that might disincentivize the use of a global setting to opt out of sale. However, the alternative incentive exists where um, you may have an account with the business and you essentially uh, um, use the global setting to opt out of sale, but uh, the global setting only applies to your current browsing session uh, and the additional kind of uh, data that's associated with your authenticated account, the browsing history, history with your logged in account will then still be permitted to be sold because the business doesn't have that link for you. So, so the the this kind of additional friction, while small, and remember the additional information request, it can't be used for any other purpose other than effectuating the opt out, right? So, um, this additional friction, while may provide a disincentive in, uh, to some folks, also has a huge policy benefit. If particularly there's a lot of dis data associated to your logged in account, um, and so that was kind of the balancing. But I think it's a it's an important point for the board to consider whether it's worthwhile. Um, and the thing that I'll that I'll flag is that you know uh, um, oftentimes users won't know uh, which kind of what state they're in, right? Whether you're logged into an account or not, and may have uh, uh, misaligned expectations. And so that was kind of the goal of this balancing act. But I do recognize there are trade offs. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. It is a balancing act, but there are benefits and and also potentially um, potentially. Um, barriers. I did also want to respond to Ms. De La Torre's sort of initial question, I think about treatment and, and, and everything that's going into the decision as to which balance to, to um, work from now. Absolutely, I, I would certainly support and I think that staff uh, has on its radar to, as with other provisions, keep a close eye on how things are developing in the marketplace. Um, in order to inform whether or not in the future it would make sense to um, amend the regulation in order to address something that has arisen that wasn't anticipated. And I would also just say that that is going to be the case and must be the case for all of all situations and all regulations, certainly under our purview, because we are working in a space where technology is changing rapidly, innovation is happening rapidly, you know, social, um, social, um, uh, social, uh, uh, social aspects are, are, are changing. And of course, we have in our statute um, a reminder and responsibility to do exactly that, to keep an eye on, on the technology and any changes um, so that we can be responsive. So um, I just wanted to respond to that part. Um, and we can talk about that, but we can, and we can also talk about the balance that we've struck uh, right now, um, which I also support. Um, but I wanted to be sure that that didn't get left on the table. So, Ms. De La Torre, thank you, Mrs. Servan, for the comments. They are really helpful, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Sultani. Wonderful. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Mr. McTaggart. Thanks. I, I just had a quick question, and it may, I, I apologize if it's out of order or chronological order. But there's a there's the same change in seventy twenty seven around limit the personal information, and so are you also making the conforming change 
Ms. Kim in 7027E with respect to limit the personal, the limit the use of my uh, personal information. Cause I think that, that same uh, change needs to be made there as well to make sure that businesses don't use it as an opportunity to kind of scare people into getting more information than people can understand. Um, yes, I, um, I, I just wanna note that currently as written, uh, 7025 pertains to the opt-out preference signal of applying to a valid request to opt out of sale or sharing. Um, we do acknowledge that the statute would extend that to a right uh, a request to limit, but because, um, because that is, uh, as far as we are aware, there is no opt-out preference signal existing that addresses that new right yet. Um, that is why we made a, a deliberate decision to uh, couch 7025 to only apply to a request to opt out of sale and sharing at this time. Um, I do think to note um, with regard to what Chairperson Urban said that this is an iterative process. I do believe that um, as time progresses and as we see things develop in the market, or even as you know, after we uh, implement these provisions immediately, we can come back and really address the opt-out preference signals to the extent they exist or have developed as they pertain to a request to limit in the future. Yeah, I'm just concerned about 7027E, even if you, it's not an opt-out single, it still says that a business, you know, may ask the consumer for additional information. And I suppose your answer will be the second sentence as well, the business, if it can comply without additional information, it shall do so. I'm a little, I just think you could maybe have some language kind of just telling the business, no, by the way, you know, it's not four clicks to tell the consumer that, you know, you can still comply. I just, I, I get nervous about, to the whole dark, dark pattern thing, I, I, you know, so I, that's kind of where I'm and just, Oh, thank you. Um, and just to be clear, you know, 7004, which pertains to dark patterns and uh, methods to uh, submit requests would also apply to um, the, you know, methods to submit a request to limit. So I don't think that there should be any kind of uh, confusion with regard to that. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Uh, Mr. Sultani, did you have um, clarifying? Okay. I just wanted I just wanted to clarify, um, Mr. Board Member McTaggart. So your your concern is in uh, limit SPI that um, that it be equally applied to pseudonymous, non logged in kind of information uh, users, uh, and then also equally. I think we we can take that back to make sure that it's consistent. So um, what I hear you to be saying is um, outside of even the global kind of automatic opt out of sale the opt-out preference signal, um, any time a person clicks either um, their opt-out, uh, their regular kind of do not sell button, or they uh, the limit my the use of my personal information, uh, that they it be applied to their kind of non-logged in state, uh, and the business can ask for additional information. Uh, and then, um, but, but not for, but, but if the user declines offering that, that it be applied to uh, to that non-logged in state as well. Is that what I understand you yes. to be saying? So yes. we can, um, I I believe we architected it that way, but we're sure we can be sure to go back and um, confirm. And then if not kind of plan that for a future meeting. And Lisa, feel free to, if, if, if I just wanted to just clarify, if that's what I understood him to be asking. Um, uh Okay, I understand that. I, I'm going to have to take a look at it just to ensure and refresh my memory as that as to whether that's the case. Uh, to the extent that there's additional clarifying language that can be included, I do recommend that that be done in a future rulemaking package, as opposed to uh, immediately. Um, but certainly, that's something that we can put on our list of items to revisit. Thank you, Ms. Delatory. You're muted. I have a process question that might not belong here. I'm going to formulate it and then ask Mrs. Urban how we may want to address it. In terms of this kind of um, suggestions, like this suggestion that Mr. McTaggart just made to basically improve uh, on, on, the, on the structure of the rules, if they are going to be considered for, for the future, how, how does that mechanically happen? Because there is no subcommittee necessarily i think they will go back to staff and then um i don't know if we need to do some thinking 
on the process to kind of list those and and understand when and how they will happen. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. It is a little bit, um, I mean, it's a more general question using the mm -hmm. example of Mr. McTaggart's observation and suggestion. Uh, I'm Mr. Laird can like reach in and like hook me away um, if I'm getting off topic, but I think that um, uh, I think that we might as well talk about it now if we can. So I think it's a good question, Ms. De La Torre, um, because we have operated from this point forward, as you know, and as we mentioned earlier, we started without staff. And so we formulated a plan that allowed us to move forward with our rulemaking obligations without staff. And that involved the subcommittees kind of digging in at a level that is fairly, fairly uncommon. Um, and then the subcommittees began working with staff um, as, we, um, as we gained resources. Now we're in a state where we have resources of staff, we have resources of council. And so um, we can, um, I think, rely on staff to be sure to be collecting each of these items. Um, they will formulate future rulemaking packages. Um, and I don't think that it makes sense to try to get into at this time you know, exact details of how they report to the board, like what they're thinking they're going to put into the next rulemaking package and so forth. I think we can talk about that um, down the road or staff can sort of make recommendations. Um, but we do not rely on subcommittees in order to do rulemaking packages in any way other than the, the fact that we, um, we didn't have resources of staff and council um, at the time we started. Subcommittees, uh, as a remind, just as a reminder, because I think it's always helpful, are solely advisory. They don't make any decisions. Um, otherwise, we would be out of compliance with Bagley Keene as it is. Um, and so, um, frankly, I mean, just to, just, uh, just to sum up, um, it, it's it's a pretty we, we now that we have resources of staff, it's pretty straightforward to collect these things um, uh, into potential rulemaking packages and put them together in a way that makes sense in the future. Um, so, so a related question is that, um, and I will ask Mr. Thompson to maybe refresh my recollection, but. Is that something that is connected to the process of committee or it happens completely outside of the process of committee? That's in part why the question came up when I was um, observing the interaction. And, and Mrs. Irvin, we don't need to have an answer right now and it might not be the meeting to discuss it. I guess I think we are trying to understand. I think Mr. <laughs> I, Mr. Laird will tell us if the cane is coming out, but I think we're skating away right. from the question of how to deal with the topics in this conversation. Um, uh, but thank you for, for, for the question. And, and thank you, uh, Ms. De La Torre and Ms. Urban. I just jump in to say, um, I, I just want to say, uh, I know staff, legal staff sort of that aren't on camera are taking, you know, vigorous notes on all of this right now. And, and we do plan to, to, um, uh, monitor and be supportive with these efforts, but I agree that probably best for a future agenda item, uh, to sort of tackle the specifics of how we want to operate, um, the rulemaking process going forward. In, in Mr. Laird, is it all? Is it a? Is it okay for me to observe that we did discuss in our May meeting? I believe it was um, some thoughts about um, subcommittees, sort of through the process, this rulemaking process, and at the end of it. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, absolutely. I guess I'm just suggesting to, and and I think to Ms. De La Torre's point, we don't need to come to a resolution today. Right. But. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for the question, Ms. De La Torre. Um, anything else on this um, sub item? Ms. Kim, would you like to summarize this for us or um, move on and summarize? I, I can move on to the right. next item. I believe that the understanding of including that language to uh, uh, to C2 to make it more explicit it was uh, well received. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you very much, Ms. Kim. I, I apologize. I do want to just remind everyone that we're planning to take a later lunch break starting at 1.45. I believe it was 1.45. So 
Um, I definitely raise your hand if you're desperate for a drink of water or something, but otherwise that's, that's the plan. Um, all right, thank you, Ms. Kim, sorry for the interruption. Please go ahead. Great, so moving on to 70, this is also somewhat of a new item. Um, so you may not uh, readily see it, but it's under 7025 subsection C4. So it's on the very next page. Um, to turn to it myself. <laughs> um, as I mentioned to you that there's those three limited situations in which you may um, introduce friction in the opt-out preference signal, uh, signal, you know, in responding to opt-out preference signal. Um, we address the third situation, which is regarding financial incentive programs. So the question is, um, how is a business to respond to an opt-out preference signal when it conflicts with the consumer's participation in a financial incentive program? What we had done previously and noted for the board in our uh, mater board materials was that we changed the word shall to may in C4 the business instead of the business shall notify the consumer that you know it is uh, conflicting with the financial incentive program. We said the business may do so because um, that gives a bit more flexibility to the business as to um, how to respond to opt-out preference signal, um, and it simplifies implementation at this time. But then I think one thing we noticed was that the question then becomes, you know. It, it, that change, I, I, we realize, uh, leads to two questions. The first question is, how should a business treat an opt-out preference signal if the business does not ask the consumer, chooses not to ask the consumer, hey, this is conflicting? And then the second question that it raises was, was how should a business treat an opt-out preference signal if it does ask, but the consumer just X's out, doesn't say anything, response explicitly? Um, how we had framed this previously was that, and the reasoning that we set forth in our initial uh, statement of reasons was that if the business does ask um, and the consumer just X's out without making any further notation, that the business could ignore the opt-out preference signal as to the financial incentive program. And so we also included some language that says, you know, with regard to that financial incentive program, um, you know, the business may ignore the opt-out preference signal. So we do not like, but the question I think then becomes if the business does not ask, should they still process the opt-out preference signal? And I believe that uh, they should uh, still process the opt-out preference, preference signal because that is what's required in the framework presently. Um, and that if you were to change that, the business would have an incentive not to ask because then they could always ignore without giving the consumer the choice at all. And so what we propose as a recommendation to add to uh, C4 is to include the language in the last sentence that says, if the business asks and the consumer does not affirm, they, um, does not affirm their intent to withdraw, the business may ignore the opt-out preference signal. Just to clarify that it's only in the situation where a business asks that um, you know, they can apply that exception if the consumer uh, decides not to do anything further. Thank um, you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kim. And so this is, this is again, new um, in the discussion. Um, it is both, yes, it is both new, but also kind of sprinkled in with some changes that we had previously made. Yes. Understood. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Thompson? Um, I had a question just to clarify. Where's the insertion and what are the words? Because I, I sure. just want to make sure I'm, I don't want to do sure. the same thing. Sure. And then I have a, a observation on your sure. comment. So in C4, the very last sentence of that section um, but begins with the word, if, if the consumer does not affirm their intent to withdraw. Um, so with that language, what we would recommend including is to say, if the quote, new language, business asks and the consumer does not affirm the intent to withdraw the business name, so proceed there. So basically we would be inserting four words, the business business asks and the consumer. <laughs> so that is what we propose including. So it would read, if the business asks and the consumer does not affirm their intent to withdraw? Yes. Thank you. And did you have an observation then? Mr. I Thompson? did. Well, as I think Ms. Kim was, was posing somewhat of a policy question and for, for some 
feedback and you, you teed up two scenarios. One was where there is that conflict that is unresolved. Um, you, the business receives a global opt out. Uh, they ask, do you want to remain in the financial incentive program? And the consumer does not respond. Um, and then you teed up the other question, which was, should, should, should the business ask? Um, and, um, you know, how strong should the requirement that the business ask be in, in, the, in the regulation? Um, my personal opinion on the former question is a decision to participate in a financial incentive program seems like an affirmative act that is that trumps the passive act of, of non-response. Um, so in my, I'm reading that as if, if I choose to uh, participate in a financial incentive program, uh, it's almost super, I, I don't want, this is maybe too strong, but it's like super consent. Um, I did that on purpose, very deliberately. I probably had to take some steps to do it. So it, my, my passive non-response should not trump the active participation um, that that's on the former question. Um, I think my my view on your latter question is yes, the business should ask, um, and I think the question maybe for the board and, and the staff is how strong is the requirement that the business ask in that situation? Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Could I could I um, could I check my understanding of what you said? Um, I believe that I agree with you and I want to check my understanding of what you said. <laughs> oh, now I've given you an incentive to just like, if I'm wrong, but it sounds good <laughs> to just agree with me. Um, so uh, so um, uh, in the situation where the business asks, the consumers previously opted in, they don't say anything. They've already opted into that financial incentive program. And thus, the appropriate um, outcome is that the business um, keeps the consumer in the financial incentive program that the consumer has already opted in um, uh, in in the past. And then in a situation, that's what I was saying. Okay, thank you. And then in a situation where the business didn't ask, now that we've changed this to May, um, obviously they're not going to get a response from the consumer. Um, so, so let me just back up. As I understand this, the order of events, Ms. Kim, please correct me. At some point, a consumer is opting into a financial incentive program at some point in time. At another point in time, which may be fairly close in time or maybe very far in the future, the consumer um, has a set and opt out preference signal that the business detects. Um, and the business detects that and also realizes that the consumer opted in to their financial incentive program some at some point in the past. The business can either at that point ask the consumer or not ask the consumer what the consumer wants to do. If the business asks the consumer and the consumer says, keep me in the financial incentive program, everything's copacetic, we're good. If the business asks the consumer and the consumer says, oh, I did that 10 years ago, I don't wanna be in that financial incentive program, um, then the business um, respects that choice and everything is good. If the business asks the consumer um, what the consumer would like to do and the business does, uh, sorry, the consumer does not respond, the business has given the consumer the opportunity um, to uh, state their preference and they got no response. Previously, the consumer had opted into the financial incentive program. And so the, the business can keep the consumer in the financial incentive program. If, however, that opt-out preference signal comes in and the business does not ask the consumer what the consumer's preference with regards to that opt-out preference signal is or doesn't give the consumer a chance to clarify, I suppose, because the opt-out preference signal says, I wanna opt out. Then the business needs to respect the opt-out because we don't wanna create a situation where, and okay, so is that is correct technically? Okay, because I, I have a, this I suppose yeah. is a policy point, so I should make it myself. Yes. We, we don't I wanna create a situation 
where there is an incentive for businesses not to ask, right? Um, right. We want to always be encouraging the consumer to be able to express the cons the consumer's preference. And so I um, I do support this. I think it was carefully thought through um, in order to balance the fact that you we you know in this world we're going to undoubtedly have situations where a consumer kind of wasn't thinking about it and they didn't really want to opt out of that financial incentive program. And we're also going to have situations where um, they do. Um, and we want to be sure that we have clear guidance. So I think I think that this is a good change. Um, if I if I could just, uh, I, I know uh, Ms. Stellatori's um, hand is raised, but I just want to interject just to clear, uh, to make sure um, or to affirm Jennifer, uh, Chairperson Urban's uh, interpretation of this. I also wanted to note that currently how the CCPA regulations read is that with regard to a business who does not ask, um, they must still honor the opt-out preference signal. So with regard to how it currently operates, um, it's actually, actually, let me take a step back. How CCPA regulations currently operate is a business may ask, but if they do not ask, they still have to honor the opt-out preference signal. In addition, how it works now, which is a, a bit of a departure from what we are proposing here, is that if the business asks and the consumer does not respond, they just X out of the question, does not respond to it, they must still honor the opt-out preference signal, which is the difference between what we are proposing now. Is that in that instance where a consumer does not respond, we are saying that the business may ignore the opt-out preference signal because precisely what Mr. Thompson noted is that there is an idea that consent was given and consent was given in accordance with 7004 um, about, you know, no, uh, no dark patterns were included in that consent. And so there's that policy justification. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Thank you. Um, Ms. De La Torre and then Mr. McTaggart. Ms. De La Torre. Um, I have two questions and I, they are related, but they are not completely, you know, a follow-up to what just was said. So Mrs. Urban, feel free to maybe uh, allow others to participate and then I can I can ask at the end. Okay, sure. Let's go to Mr. McTaggart and then return um, when it's a, when when it's an appropriate time, Ms. Ellisroy. Mr. McTaggart. Thank you. I had a question for Ms. Kim. Uh, and I may be missing it, but given that in this statute, it, it's financial incentive sounds like it's money, but it's actually also service difference. You know, you can offer a different speed, you could offer a different, you know, offering. Uh, and in the regs, there is the non discrimination 7080, and there is the 7081 that calculating the value of a consumer data. You know, I've always believed that one of the things here, which is going to be, um, helpful over time is is sort of transparency so that when uh you know you're the at some point the business says well yes because we can charge you 150 dollars more per month if your cell phone plan includes us selling your location they have to actually tie that to actually the value of you know your your cell phone data and then people will be sort of like what you know that's crazy i'm not gonna you know there'll, there'll be some 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 Transparency there, uh, or they should, or they shouldn't be able to use an inflated number just to kind of push you into something. And so the couple things, I guess one question, one point for uh, Madam Chair would be to say, could we in the future uh, look at the financial incentive language here in this in this part here and tie it back to um, the language, the statute in in one twenty five, where it talks about. Um, if that price or difference is reasonably related to the value provided to the business by the consumer's data. And I just didn't see that tie in here. And even in the definition of financial incentive in the regs, I didn't see a tie in to section 7080 or 7081. I may be missing something, but I just think that the, I don't wanna stop the train right now, but I would like the staff to, and it's complicated. So I'd like to just put it on the agenda for the future, but, but trying to uh, tie back this difference in price financial incentive thing to a reasonable uh, uh, relation to the value of the, of, the, of the data and and start to 
incent some transparency where, where we're starting to get a glimpse into what companies are making by selling our data. Thank you very much, Mr. McTaggart. Um, Ms. Kim, are you comfortable kind of reading back to Mr. McTaggart um, the suggestion? Yes. Um, my understanding of Mr. McTaggart's uh, comment, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, you'd like for staff to take some time and look at the difference of price and service. Uh, the di uh, I'm sorry, to let me restate. <laughs> um, from my understanding of Mr. McTaggart's comment is not necessarily related to this provision of 7025 at all, but with regard to generally speaking, um, you know, 7080, 7081, and uh, Civil Code Section 1798, 125 about the provisions that relate to financial incentives that are price or service differences and whether or not they are reasonably tied to the value of consumer data. And uh, wanting to put that on the agenda for future rulemaking to investigate or to analyze and recommend, um, you know, additional language or um, regulations that pertain to those items. Is that correct? Yeah, just because right now the definition of financial incentive in the regs does not tie into any of those uh, 70, 7080, 7081, or 1798, 125. And I think it's a really uh, important, and this is one of the distinctions we have compared to the proposed federal bill, ADPPA, which didn't have any of this you know, consumer protection. Uh, so I really don't want to see us lose that consumer protection here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. You have what you need, Ms. Kim? Yes, I do. Thank you. Okay. Um, seeing uh, no further hands on this, I think it would be appropriate to circle back to Ms. De La Torre now. Ms. De La Torre, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two questions. Um, I, I, I found the um, explanation of Mr. Thompson and this summary by uh, Mrs. Urban really helpful, uh, but I was not sure if we were talking about situations where consumers are logging versus consumers not logging and how the logistics work. Uh, because to me, if the organization doesn't know exactly, I mean, they have the identity of the browser, but they don't know who the person is, I'm not sure how they can operationalize meaningfully an opt-out of a financial incentive program. Um, I, I could speak generally to this, but it really kind of is probably fact specific as to how businesses operate their financial incentive programs and whether or not it is tied to pseudonymous profiles as opposed to a logged in or like an account specific or consumer specific um, situation. So um, I believe that the opt-out preference signal to the extent it's linked to a pseudonymous profile that it, the business is aware of when it's... Um, when the response is related to that opt-out preference, oh, with uh, when it is related to a consumer pro profile that is associated with a browser device, then yes, the business is it should respond in this manner set forth in C4. Um, if that financial incentive program is linked to a known consumer, like a account with a logged in kind of situation, then that would be um, also the the distinguishing mark or the, the, the determining factor with regard to whether or not um, how the business responds to say an opt-out preference signal that is just sent by um, a browser or device. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but if, you know, I'm, I'm, ha I'm sure that um, Mr. Sultani might have additional language to the extent that um, you have additional technical questions. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, Ms. Delatore, do you wanna kind of restate um, well, first, I, I just wanted to check if Ms. De La Torre found Ms. Kim's explanation, if that if that answered right. the question. Okay, right. that was that was really helpful. I um I think what I take away is that to the extent that the consumer can be identified, then you have to apply that opt out to um, the incentive program. But to the extent I'm just talking in general terms, but to the extent mm -hmm. that the consumer cannot be identified it wouldn't make sense for a pop-up coming up, like you might have an incentive program with us. You know, if, if there is no identification, I think that would be a potential undesirable outcome that would be confusing. Um, so a follow-up question on this, um, 
so in the example that Mr. Thompson proposed and, and Mrs. Urban summarized, there is a lapse in time between the moment that the consumer consents and the moment that the consumer is um, um, browsing or visiting a site with an opt-out signal on. What happens if in that period of time, the program changes? Because to me, at the moment that the consumer enter into the program, those incentives might have been fair. I think this connects with what Mr. McTaggart was mentioning, right? Like if the incentive has changed, if the program has changed, um, then somehow the consumer should be made aware of it and, and not just, um, we should make the assumption that the consent is valid where the relationship has um, kind of, uh, but there has been a long span of time, particularly if there are changes to the program. Yes, um, if it's all right, um, I, I, um, the way that I see this connecting to what we're talking about now in terms of the provision and the opt-out preference signal um, is that that is a, an, an important policy reason to make sure the structure that um, Ms. Kim and, and staff set out is the structure so that, you know, because one of the scenarios that could happen is precisely what you described in this de la Torre, which is a consumer signs up for a financial incentive program, opt in at point one, we get to time point two, maybe it's been a long time, maybe something has changed about the financial incentive program, we don't really know um, and so if the business doesn't ask and could still not respect the opt out, then we could have a real mismatch between the consumer's preferences and the mismatch. Um, in my view, um, your scenario is a really important example of when that mismatch could be um, something that we really do not want to have for the consumer. Um, in terms of the general, the more broader question of if one consents to a financial incentives program at one point in time, and then later it changes, um, I think that that's a broader, a broader question um, uh, and uh, would defer to Ms. Kim as to whether it's something that would be appropriate for looking into again for the future. But as you can imagine, Ms. Delatory, even if the consumer opted into the financial incentives program and never set an opt-out preference signal, in five years, that program could change. And I think you were asking, you know, is the consent still good um, at that point? Um, and that I think is a question that is um, uh, not just about the opt-out preference signal, if that makes sense, but that the opt-out preference signal um, architecture or the the regulatory architecture and the statutory architecture around the opt-out preference signal that has been constructed uh, for that for the for the opt-out preference signal takes that kind of situation into account. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, absolutely. So in, in the, a high level um, kind of perspective of what I'm trying to say is notifications are tricky. If if we over notify a consumer, the consumer is going to stop looking at the notification. It's going to just navigate away. And so it, it's not helpful if we are triggering too many notifications. But at the same time, they are really useful and appropriate in some circumstances. And how do we strike the right balance so that we have the experience that I think the intent of the law is proposing, which is a much better experience um, navigating online? and uh, understanding of the general preferences of the consumer without bombarding them with um, notifications um, at the same time highlighting what is important for them to reconsider whether they still wanna participate, for example, in a financial program. So um, thank you. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's exactly what I was trying to go. Thank you, Ms. Delatory. I realized mm -hmm. another habit that the board has and I am a terrible, um, sort of, uh, I'm a, a terrible example, example of the habit. Sometimes the board does thumbs up or things, but also we nod. <laughs> and there was nodding going on while Ms. De La Torre was talking and transcript has no idea. 
that there's not anything going on. So thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Uh, and I'm going to pause um, here and ask again if Ms. Kim would like to summarize, because I would like to be sure that you feel confident that you have guidance from the board that on this provision and on the proposals, um, the balance that you have struck for now um, uh, has supported the board. Yes, I will go ahead and reiterate that. Um, I think the, 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 the clear recommendation or the new recommendation that is not already uh, reflected in the modifications in the document would be that we add the language to the last line or last sentence of C4 that says, um, that basically states, if the business asks and the consumer does not affirm their intent to withdraw, the business may ignore the opt-out preference signal. Um, we may also, to the extent that the board, uh, uh, we can also include language to make clear that if the business does not act ask at all, they should still process the opt-out preference signal as is, um, because that is what is currently required under the CCPA regulations, and so as to not further incentivize businesses to not ask so that they can take advantage of that provision. Um, that is my understanding moving forward. Thank you, Ms. Kim. I see more nods. Um, I'll add mine. Uh, yes, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> Ms. De La Torre. Yes, absolutely agree. Just this small clarification um, that for financial incentives, the way the law is structured, it allows for flexibility, but it also creates a potential risk that those incentives might um, be used to the um, uh, detriment of individuals that might have uh, not the same financial situation, right? Like a discount is not the same to me that to somebody who's much wealthier than me or to somebody who is you know, in, in a in a worse situation financially. So to me, this specific area of financial incentives and how organizations are reacting to them and whether we're really creating that choice and that fairness is an area where I will definitely encourage the agency to be active and monitor, particularly in that space, in the space where we might be creating incentives for um groups in society that might find a relatively small discount very attractive when the actual back end of it is not fair um, so that the, their privacy can also be protected. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. That is so noted. Um, I believe it, it is similar in vain with Mr. McTaggart's comments earlier. So, so noted. Yes. All right, Ms. Kim. What's next? What's next? Okay, we're we're getting close, guys. Everyone, um, with regard to seventy twenty five C six, I I just want to also note that seventy twenty five C six we had changed May. Uh, I'm sorry, shall to May to simplify implementation at this time. Uh, this was not necessarily something that we had highlighted, but I just want to bring it to your attention for awareness sake. With regard to sorry, I think you said shall to me and it was should to me. Just should to me. I apologize. You're right. Um, we had changed the language of should to me. Uh, and, and the reason being is to simplify implementation at this time. With regard, yeah, I think Mr. McTaggart oh, um, sorry. would like to ask a question or make a comment. Yeah, I, I just would love love to uh, put on the list for future consideration, not to let that one drop. I thought it was a great idea originally. And I'd love to maybe, it'd be great if just I'm on the web, I don't have to think about whether I'm opted out or not. I can automatically confirm. It's kind of like, you know, my kids, when the when they unclick their seatbelt, the little thing lights up on the dashboard saying, you know, your kid's undone a seatbelt. It's just nice to know without me having to be like, hey, you know, fast time, you guys got your seatbelts done up. And it just would be nice to, to be able to see on a website uh, whether uh, they've opted me out. So it does not need to happen now. I get that it's complicated. I get that it's, you know, but I think it's something that would be really consumer friendly in the future. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Ms. De La Troy? Yeah, I, I um, appreciate and understand the reasons why the agency is making the change, but I also am very supportive of the um, preference and the idea that uh, Mr. McTaggart expressed. And in reality, um, when we think about um, 
future iterations of the rules. I think that we're going to have to deal not only with the feedback that we're providing the agency right now, but with changes that we're not um, seeing um, coming right now and, and might surprise us. Um, I personally feel, and I am one of those uh, hopefully not rare individuals who click no on the banners. And, you know, I, I really try to opt out with it difficult system that we have now. And I personally constantly wonder if it's working. <laughs> like, is somebody listening on the other side? And, and having some form of, of way for the consumer to just be confident that that's actually happened in a way that is streamlined and simplified will have a lot of value. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. De La Troy. I also click and, and, and make my choices and make I think privacy protective choices and hope that I'm not making them into a void. So um, I also support um, staff's recommendation um, to, to, to table this for now and also um, would like to align myself with Mr. McTaggart and Ms. De La Torre on considering it more um, in the future. I okay. think that, you know, staff appreciates that feedback and um, we'll take that under consideration. We're working to move things in an incremental way so that we can quickly put these regulations into place. Um, but certainly, I think that's a, um, I think I, we appreciate that feedback. Um, moving forward, uh, we're, I only have, I think I only have one more item left on uh, for this section, and it is with regard to 7025C7B. Uh, 7025C7B, that is uh, the modification. It, this was highlighted in gray. It's one of the gray ro rows and um, I wanted to bring to uh, the board's attention. Um, this modification to the example set forth in 7B, uh, and that is on page 41, I believe, addresses that situation number two that I had previously alluded to, you know, as you may recall, there are three instances in which um, a business may introduce some level of friction with regard to opt-out preference signal. The first was, do you want to apply it to offline sales or identify yourself so that we can apply it to more than just the online browser and device? The second situation is, oh, this conflicts with your pre-existing settings. Do you want to opt back in? You know, just clarifying whether or not you really intended to um, change your pre-existing settings. What we did was we clarified the example to note that the business can't ask uh, Noel in this instance to back, opt back into the sale or sharing for 12 months per section 7026 subsection K. Um, 7026 subsection K, which is the already existing regulation, implements civil code section 1798.135C4. Um, with regard to how many times a business may uh, ask the consumer to opt back in after they have opted out, and there's a restriction of 12 months. Now, we've noted that if the business knows it's no hell and they've already asked them one time to opt back in, they can't do that every single time Noel comes to that website, especially if they know that it's Noel that's com coming to that website. Um, um, we also noted that, you know, if you do ask that question, though, you don't fall within the exception of a frictionless response um, that allows you to, uh, that exempts you from posting the do not sell or share my personal information link. So we just wanted to bring that modification to the board's attention just so that um, it's clear um, uh, how, you know, we wanted to make the example especially clear as it relates to other provisions in the regulations. Thank you, Ms. Kim. That makes sense to me. Other comments or questions from the board? Yes, Mr. Thompson. Um, I'm fine with the with the change in the proposal, um, but would ask as we move as as we continue on this rulemaking in future that we kind of think about what those time periods are and what the basis for them are. Uh, and a year sounds good, um, but I, I just I would love for us to know that there's a basis either in consumer expectation, business preference, et cetera, as we go forward, um, hearing from the regulated and the, and the, the, the public about the, those intervals might be helpful. Um, I think a year is a great starting point, but we may want to refine that down the road. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. 
And I will um, just observe that um, the modifications will uh, have the benefit of a the 15 day comment period um, as well. So there will be an opportunity for a comment on what the what the modifications say now. And I think your point about, again, monitoring and keeping an eye on things is very well taken. Anything else from the board in terms of questions or comments on this? All right, um, Ms. Kim. Um, I, I believe just... that's all for 7025. Um, did you, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't think there's necessarily any need to reiterate uh, the direction with regard to 7025 C7B because it is what is the language inside the um, the proposed modifications mm -hmm. and it, it so I just want to make sure that as for 7025 that that is all the existing points I have designated or the staff has designated for discussion. Thank you very much Ms. Kim. Mr. Thompson? Uh, just as we closed out 7025 I wanted to just make the observation this is a big stride forward um, mm -hmm. and and thank the staff who, and the subcommittee members and everyone else who, who were involved in drafting the, the initial proposed draft and the, and the revisions. Um, it's the, I think the, our comments and our discussion reflect that the work that was done was really thoughtful and deliberative. And, and um, I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're doing this. And I think it, it represents a big, big step forward. And I just I didn't want this moment to pass without acknowledging that. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. I quite agree. Um, there's a lot of um, complicated thought work to do and balancing to do. And I really appreciate the staff's technical work on this issue and the board's uh, careful consideration of it. Ms. De La Torre? I just want to second that. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I, I believe our staff, who is all listening right now really appreciates that as well. <laughs> um, it shows that there's a lot of thought, a lot of work, a lot of expertise that goes in, um, that has gone into both the proposed rules, the draft, original draft proposed rules and the modifications. Um, so we have just under 10 minutes before we take our lunch break. Um, Ms. Kim, I will ask for your judgment in terms of whether you would like to introduce the next topic um, or whether you would like to wait. Mr. Thompson would like to <laughs> go ahead. I agree. I, you know, the next okay. uh, section is 7002. So this is a really good uh, okay. breaking point for our lunch break. Yes, I know that was on your list for discussion that staff recommends for discussion. All right, um, let's take our late lunch break. Um, we will reconvene at 2.30 unless someone tells me they need more time. Please do now. You have the opportunity and it's fine. And otherwise, we'll come back at 2.30. Okay, thumbs up for the transcript. Uh, thanks, everyone. See you back here at 2.30 p.m. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. I understand we had some brief tech issues. Um, Mr. Sabo, are we ready to continue now? Yes, okay. we are recording. We are recording. OK, thank you very much. Um, the California Privacy Protection Agency is now returning from break, and we will continue our discussion of agenda item number three. And I believe that. Um, Ms. Kim was um, ready to introduce um, the next item. Yes, I was. So thank you. I hope you all had a nice lunch break. <laughs> Actually, Ms. Uh, Kim, just because it has been um, a fairly long conversation, would it be helpful if I just mentioned where I understand that we are um, and where we're headed at the high level? Um, sure. that Okay, um, so we've been walking through the items that highlighted in gray um, in the chart with some um, related discussion. I believe this might be the last of those items that Ms. Kim is going to introduce. Then our plan 
is to move to the batched items um, and also to circle back on things that we have saved um, for discussion then. And I know I have something from Mr. Lay and I have something from Ms. De La Torre. And it is possible that board members might want to pull um, uh, item that hasn't been mentioned yet out of the batched item. So there will be the opportunity for that and we'll have the discussion on um, those items. Uh, just so everyone who's been dipping in and out has a sense of where we are. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Ms. Kim. Thanks very much. Thank you. So uh, what I have on our last gray item um, for discussion by the board is section 7002. And that is the restrictions on collection and use of personal information. Uh, some people have designated this our data minimization section, and we can talk about it. And I'm happy to walk through the changes that we've made here. Um, at, to start off with, we received many comments in this section, both again in support of the, the regulation, as well as addressing some concerns that they have about the regulation itself. From a high level, uh, the general themes that we saw with regard to this section um, was first that the comments claim that the regulation doesn't consider the statutory requirements for notice and opt out. Um, some noted that, that the average consumer test is not specified or defined or is ambiguous, confusing, or too subjective. Um, others have noted that the reg regulation lacks any type of balancing test or objective guide for com companies to apply, and that it should apply balancing tests such as those in GDPR or other jurisdictions. Um, some note that other jurisdictions do not use that, the quote, average consumer standard, and may uh, conflict with those laws, and or the average consumer test hampers businesses' ability to process da data for back-end processes that maybe the consumer is not aware of. Uh, that being said, you know there are a number of um, commenters who express their support of the regulation. Um, they support the use of consumer expectations as part of the business's assessment as to whether the process, uh, processing of personal information is reasonably necessary and proportionate to achieve that purpose. And generally speaking, they support the concept of compatibility standard for businesses or proportionality requirements for businesses. Um, in light of many of these comments, as well as you know, further analysis by our staff, um, we made some significant modifications to section 7002. And I wanna walk the board uh, through those changes. First off, I wanted to note that we spent a lot of attention to address how each portion of section, Civil Code section 1798 100C, um, 100C statutory requirements should be understood by businesses and consumers. So we spent some time really emphasizing and um, explicitly stating in subsection A um, what 1798 100C says. And we organize each aspect of the law clearly in each of these subsections and provided factors for determining each aspect of the law. So really this was meant to be helpful guidance with regard to understanding and interpreting um, section 1798-100C. So just on a high level, section C sets out the law. It's directly from 1798-100. It says, you know, it, it explains how 1798-100-C has to be read in connection with 1798-100-A. So this is um, the portion that basically breaks down that, um, hold on, let me bring up my document just to make sure I'm not citing, speaking about it incorrectly. But it speci uh, specifically says in accordance with the Civil Code section 1798-100-C, a business's collection, use, retention, and or sharing of consumers' personal information shall be reasonably necessary and proportionate to achieve subsection A, the purpose for which the personal information was collected or processed, as that is understood by the requirements set forth in subsection B, and then two, another disclosed purpose that is compatible with the context in which the personal information was collected. And then we kind of note to the fact that subsection C helps give the factors to understand what is compatible within the context um, that personal information was collected. Now, subsection B explains what the reasonable expectations of the consumer would be 
So B sets forth the interpretation of A1. So the purposes for which personal information was collected or processed shall be consistent with the reasonable expectations of the consumer. And we believe that, that is consistent with the guidance provided in the Civil Code Section 1798-185-A10, which specifically says notified purposes should be consistent with the consumer's expectations. And it also generally, the factors included within subsection B um, considers other jurisdictions and how they understand or factor in, or take certain things into consideration when determining what purposes um, are, are, are to be used for the personal information collected in the process. Now, um, you know, I, I can go into any of the specific factors, but instead for right now, I'm just going to stay at a high level and describe each of the subsections. Um, moving forward with regard to subsection C, this explains A2. <laughs> what are the purposes that are compatible with the context in which personal information was collected? And we provide some helpful guidance with regard to what should be considered in determining compatibility. And then subsection B explains what is reasonably necessary and proportionate. It specifically emphasizes how every purpose identified in subsection A1 or A2, whether it be a purpose for the, the purpose for which personal information was collected or processed, or another compatible purpose or disclosed purpose that is compatible with the context um, in which it was collected. In any either of those situations, um, the, the amount that is collected and used and retained or shared should be reasonably necessary and proportionate to that purpose. Um, we do have a new item within that section of D, and I, I'll come back to it, but I just wanna explain that Subsection D is really that concept of data minimization. Like for whatever purpose you're collecting, you still have to, you know, consider the minimum amount that is really necessary to accomplish that purpose and limit it to that or limit it within that proportionality of that um, minimum amount. With regard to subsection E now, this is the natural, explains what happens when a business can't meet the requirements of A1. Um, it is taken from the statute and explicitly gives um, the guidance that um, the business must obtain the consumer's consent with regard to any purpose that does not fall within A1 or A2. And then subsection F explains that the disclosures about you know, disclosed purposes should be in the notice at collection and that is um, reflected or you know, based upon 1798-100A. Um, as I mentioned, or I noted, there is a new item that we would like to include in 7002D. And again, 7002D is the section that talks about reasonably necessary and proportionate. We suggest adding language to clarify that even for purposes for which a consumer consents to um, the collection, use, retention, sharing of that personal information, um, the business must still you know, undergo this reasonably necessary and proportionate analysis. I think that is consistent with how 100C should be read, um, but we just want to make that additional clarification uh, to note in D that both for any purpose identified in A1, any purpose identified in A2, and any purpose identified in subsection E, which is, you know, where a consumer obtains, con or the business obtains consent, all of those purposes should undergo the same reasonably necessary and proportionate analysis to ensure that um, whatever you sharing retention of that information is um, reasonably necessary and proportionate uh, to achieve that purpose. So that is a high level. I, you know, I, I imagine this is gonna be a topic that you know, the board members may have opinions about and I'm happy to field those questions and um, provide guidance. Thank you very much, Ms. Kim. And I think that it probably is a good idea to stay at the high level now because the high level itself is um, interlocking, the, the statute is interlocking and the regulation is interlocking. I just want to say that I really appreciate and am, am, am impressed with the work that the staff has done here to help regulated entities and consumers um, understand the relationship 
um, among the different subsections of 1798-100. I think there's real value in both quoting the statute and then putting it together in such a way that people can easily follow it. Um, and I certainly agree with your last, the, the new suggestion, which would be an additional clarification um, in the regulations that just helps people um, read the statute and then gives them guidance um, that makes it more concrete. So I really um, appreciate the work on this one in particular. I mean, all of them, um, but um, I think that this is a very um, helpful regulation. So thank you, Ms. Kim, and I'm sure board members will um, will let you know if um, they don't want to stay at the high level <laughs> and, and we can get there uh, as well when we get there. Um, all right, comments or questions? Um, I have Ms. De La Torre um, to start us off. Uh, thank you. I want to go a little bit on the background on why we have this rule. It, um, I was trying to remember this, um, and I don't think it was ever listed in the in the topics that were assigned um, to subcommittees. So I know that uh, Mrs. Urban remembers better than me because it, it came from her subcommittee. So is it correct that it was never specifically assigned and if it was not specifically assigned by the board um, and it is not mandatory for this um, deadline that we have, uh, how did the committee take on this task and why do you prioritize it and, and how was it assigned, I guess? Thank you. Um, in a, as a mechanistic matter, uh, I hope that I will remember enough, Ms. De La Torre. We were on the regulation subcommittee together, so now I'm scared. <laughs> um, but um, uh, as, as I know you will recall, Ms. De La Torre, and to, um, and to uh, re-familiarize everyone else, uh, the very beginning of the process, when we didn't have the resources of staff, Ms. De La Torre and I were the regulation subcommittee who put together um, the um, first, the, the two subject matter subcommittees and the rulemaking process subcommittee, the, the plan for that. And as part of that task, we identified a number of provisions for regulation. Um, most of them are drawn from 185, um, excuse me, 1798.185. Um, and there was a sense, I think, between Ms. De La Torre and myself, at least, which we conveyed to the board, um, and I think had agreement, I mean, we didn't vote on this, like, sense, but consensus that um, in, you know, our first, like, most, our highest priority was anything that was mandatory in the first rulemaking package. Um, and so um, that was the reason why um, we kind of marched through um, 185. Um, uh, we also had a couple of other items on there. And the reason we did it that way is because, again, remember, we didn't have the benefit of staff resources and the board operates under Bagley King. And we had to be very clear as to who would be working on what items so that we didn't accidentally have more than the two members on a subcommittee working on the same issue as we we're bound by Bagley King. Um, when we got through that list, um, we had allocated and everybody knew um, who was working on what. Um, in November, I think it was, we finished as a group, as a board, the allocation, which um, Mr. Thompson and Ms. De La Torre shepherded for us with, as, the, as part of the rulemaking process subcommittee. And then uh, we left the rest of it to staff now that we were developing resources of staff who would be able to direct traffic without accidentally putting, um, uh, giving more than the two members on a subcommittee information um, about, um, about the same thing. Um, and that I think was the right stage to do that because we were then at the point where we had allocated the kind of chunks that we could see and staff um, was in the best position just as a practical matter too to understand how things interacted. Um, and so um, they, um, they directed traffic. I obviously don't have any insight into the new rules subcommittees work um, under Bagley Keene other than the items I know were allocated to it. So there may well be things in addition that staff um, have, have brought to that subcommittee um, for sort of guidance and, and discussion that we will 
and and I know there are things that are allocated that we will see um, at at a future board meeting. Similarly, with the update CCPA rule subcommittee, um, Angela, Sierra, and myself, um, there were things that um, staff included. Um, uh, that work together with the rest of the regulatory package. Um, I, uh, I, I think it may, yes, I do believe that this would have been one of them because I don't remember it being on our initial list. Um, I don't recall directly if there are others. Um, we can all look at the list and look at the rules. But anyway, so that was the, how the, that's how the process worked. Um, in terms of why it's in there, um, uh, I um, my own my under my own thinking about it, and again, this was this was staff was directing traffic, but I think it makes sense for it to be in there, um, both because of the fact that regardless of whether it's listed in 1798.185, as I said, I just think it's helpful um, to help people parse and apply that. Um, provision and also is intimately connected to the notice requirements and the notice requirements um, uh, uh, are interrelated. So, um, so that is my that's my understanding of the history. I hope I got it right um, and a little bit about um, how I think it how I personally think it, that it connects. Thank you so much for that helpful explanation. The um, reason why I was asking is because I know the public is aware of the presentations that have. Um, come forward from the subcommittees and there's very specific lists and they won't find this particular item in the list. And I myself was wondering why, because quite honestly, when we talked about directing traffic uh, or allowing the staff to direct traffic, I'm not completely sure that I understood it the way the other subcommittee understood it, but this is just part of, yes, you know, the way we work is so isolated, but I totally um, support the fact that it was allocated to the uh, CCPA update. Um, so committee, I think it was um, it was better resourced and, and more able to take on the task. I just wanted to make sure that we communicated to the public why this is here. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Ms. De La Troy. Um, are there additional comments or questions on this provision? Uh, yes. I have, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Lay, Mr. McTaggart, Mr. Lay, Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, um, no, I, I just wanted to say that, uh, yeah, I, I didn't see this, um, you know, if this wasn't part of my subcommittee, but I was very glad to see this language. Um, I, you know, I've long thought that the this notice and consent approach uh, where, you know, you, you know, businesses can kind of notice away any use of data uh, was, was quite flawed. And, um, you know, with this connecting the use of data to people's reasonable expectations, uh, it seems to me a much better approach. So, you know, I'm very happy to see this language. And I do think, uh, you know, what we see here will will factor into the comments I have around 712 and 713 later on. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Lay. And just to clarify, the concept that you just described is in the statute. Um, and the regulation helps apply, helps people apply the statute. Right, and yeah, yeah. sorry, but there were so many comments around, you know, what's the explanation, and now there's more factors, um, a lot more explanation of how businesses can approach this. Yes, thank you very much. Mr. McTaggart? Well, this is where you all are, are unhappy that I joined the board, but I, I, uh, I, have a, I don't have a 30,000 foot uh, level comment. I have a two foot uh, comment, however, you, you know, I first of all, I love the regs. If I could just ask in the examples, like for example, 702 B2 and B4, it's a small little thing, but uh, what I'd love it is if we said that, you know, when the consumer has an expectation that the business's use of their, you know, fingerprint will be used for the purpose of unlocking the mobile device, if we could just, in all those examples, put, you know, will only be used or will be limited to the use of it. I just want to further lock down this, you know, reasonable expectation that, you know, you, you, you know, it's, there's not a like, oh, and we also used it for this. And I, and I know uh, that that's generally what it said, but my suggestion, I don't need to, we don't need to redo it here. My suggestion would be where possible if Lisa, I'm sorry, if Ms. Kim, if the staff could look at this and, and potentially uh, see any, any areas where you could put a, you know, because there's a number of places where you could put limited to or only used for the purposes of, and I think it just clarifies again, everybody's mind 
but that's only what you're using it for. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Can I offer a friendly amendment? Um, I'm all I'm I'm yes. I I, uh, I support the two foot intervention. Um, thank you for it. Uh, is it okay with you um, if staff take that and and use their legal analysis um, to decide whether that is something that is required legally? Would be helpful legally, just to be sure. If we're gonna if we're gonna parse the individual words, that it does um, meet the um, goals that you've just articulated. Uh, sure. Yes, that's fine. And I just I would be interested if, to find out if it's not the case, what why it wouldn't be the case. Mm. So if, if they're gonna not be able to say it, maybe they could tell us why. Just because it feels uh, it might be belt and suspenders, but sometimes that's a good thing when you're dealing with. Uh, yes, and I'll things. just say, I, you know, I, I don't know, I, you know, I, I just, um, I think that I, um, uh, I want to be cautious just as a lawyer, sometimes the way uh, interpretation is done sort of in a formal manner, you know, something that seems like it adds clarity um, doesn't, and I don't think that's the case here, I don't know that that's the case here, I just wanted to be sure that staff had the discretion to um, do the proper analysis on that um, and implement the the um, the change that you're looking for, which is to be absolutely clear um, about the limits here. Um, and that is something that I certainly support. Um, okay, other comments or questions? Ms. De La Torre? Oh, I'm not really sorry. Um, so, um, I was hoping to go section by section and maybe um, I can share the questions that I have and Mrs. Kim can answer and I don't know if other board members might, might have additional comments or questions. Will that be a good uh, approach to follow as it, it is a structure into different okay. pieces? Um, Ms. Kim, can we move from the 30,000 foot view? Yes. We, we, went to the, we went to the 200 foot view and um, uh, I guess maybe now, Ms. Dilatory, we're at the thousand foot view. I don't know. But if that's all right with you, Ms. Kim, I'm going to let um, Executive Director Sultani um, uh, give us the gu guidance or, or, or make his comments. Um, and then we can go through um, as Ms. Dilatory suggests. I just wanted to, uh, if I could, um, just make an observation based on the earlier conversation, which is that um, rather than potentially um, requesting that staff interpret the statute, uh, if it would be possible to just give guidance to staff on the direction where that you'd like us to go, um, since that would make, similar to the earlier conversation uh, with regards to the changes Mr. McTaggart suggested, uh, letting staff interpret, or sorry, implement those changes is often, uh, particularly in a really kind of um, high level and uh, core piece of the statute, um, I think would be more effective than having uh, Lisa or others try to respond to very detailed legal questions in real time. So that'll be my my only suggestion uh, based on the earlier conversation this morning. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Um, I think that we got that message <laughs> earlier, and I appreciate um, Mr. McTaggart's you know willingness to let staff, for example, analyze the little thing. But yes, absolutely. We don't want to try to do legal interpretation um, on the fly. Um, all right, uh, Ms. Kim, um, Ms. De La Torre was hoping to go somewhere below 30,000 feet. Are we ready to do that? Of course. Okay, sure. Ms. De La Torre. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to um, second the words of uh, Mr. Lee. I think that this um, particular provision of the law in CPRA moves the needle forward considerably by moving us away from the notice and consent framework that privacy legislation has been traditionally crafted around in the US and more into a purpose limitation, secondary uh, purpose analysis and data minimization. This is very common. I would say it is um, universal in jurisdictions that have uh, data protection laws. And it's also something that has been in place for a very, very long time, like probably from the 70s, um, there were 
regulations that were implementing this kind of approach. So I'm really uh, happy to see that happen here in California. So the um, the seven zero zero two B, I mean, this scheme, if I understand it, I understand it correctly, is uh, our initial purpose analysis, right? Like how will a business identify what is an appropriate purpose for using the data based on the initial collection. Um, and interrupt me if I'm wrong, but um, I think I think that you um, said that a moment ago, and that's how it reads to me. So one question that I had is in Proposition 24, in the um, section that talks about the intent of the law, there is a really good, um, I think there is really good language that supports this idea of um, initial purpose. It's in section 1B3. I'm going to read it out loud. Um, it says business should collect consumers' personal information only to the extent that it is relevant and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purpose for which it is being collected, used, and shared. I didn't see that link into the rules, but it might be that it's in the ISR, like there is a cross reference to it in the ISR. Could you um, help me understand if that's the case? Um, I believe we do reference it in the ISOR um, as a consideration as to how we drafted subsection, um, you know, 7002 or section 7002. Okay, that's great. I, if that was not the case, I will encourage us to, to list it because I think it will make it much stronger um, from the perspective of our statutory authority to implement uh, an initial purpose uh, limitation requirement. Uh, another thing that I think I heard you mention is that this comes from other jurisdictions. And I am you know, familiar with many jurisdictions that have this um, purpose, but what I have not seen in other jurisdictions is the factors that we have here. So the um, first sentence, the purpose for which the personal information was collected, the process shall be consistent with the reasonable expectation of the consumer that I think uh, has my full support and I've seen it in many places, but I, I have never seen the five specific factors that we list here. Did we take them from uh, another jurisdiction or was that more the agency creating it based on the language of CCPA? So um, I just wanna clarify with regard to the way subsection A is structured is that it is really mapping out section 1798-100C, which is the actual uh, language of the statute. So, uh, you know, uh, with regard to our ISO, we do refer to the intent and purposes that are set forth with regard to uh, Proposition 24, but with regard to the actual regulation itself, we made it a point to be very specific and um, closely aligned to the actual statutory language, and that is a decision um, that is, you know, why it was crafted in the way that it was. With regard to the different factors, um, you know, I, I will have to go back and look at my notes, but generally speaking, we took into consideration different jurisdictions and different types of tests that are out there with regard to uh, determining, you know, purposes for which personal information were collected, some of which include um, different tests that are set forth um, in GDPR, um, but to note, uh, GDPR is a different statute than the California Consumer for, uh, Privacy um, Consumer Privacy Act or Protection mm -hmm. Act. Uh, it, it doesn't exactly always match um, in accordance with it, but it's certainly something that we took into consideration and um, used to help us understand and um, help us give guidance as to how to walk through different uh, statutory components of 1798-100C. I'm really familiar. I, I have to. I'm. I'm. Maybe. Maybe it is. It is three o'clock, and um, I should. I should. Um, but I. I do. I do have a law professor sort of um, urge at the moment to um, say that ISOR stands for Initial Statement of Reasons, and GDPR <laughs> stands for General Data Protection Regulation, uh, and it's European. So. Thank you for indulging me in that little interlude. Um, and I believe Ms. De La Torre, um, you were going to follow up with another question perhaps. I, I, I'm very familiar with um, the uh, GDPR and it does have that initial purpose. It doesn't have factors. What it has is 
um, so in initial purpose, what it has is a list of requirements, not factors. So you have to obviously make sure that it aligns with the consumer reasonable expectation. And then the requirements are, to, you have to be clear from the outset on what you're collecting, comply um, with documentation obligations, comply with transparency related obligations. Um, and obviously this, and we're gonna move to C now and ensure that if you were to change the purpose, then you have to run um, your um, new purpose through the secondary purpose test. So the secondary purpose test does have factors. I've seen them everywhere, but I've never seen factors for the initial purpose. Maybe they are coming from jurisdictions I'm not familiar with, uh, Mrs. Kim. No, I think it's, uh, or it's maybe factors that, so, you know, just to be clear, um, again, uh, the CCPA and the amendments to the CCPA by the CPRA are not the GDPR. It's, it, it's a different framework in which it functions. While I believe CCPA took into consideration and, you know, had the benefit of having GDPR exist prior to its enactment, um, this is not like it's not the same framework. And so what we have done is interpreted or set forth the provisions that are in the civil code section and did our best to provide helpful guidance that is informed, not only about other jurisdictions, but just informed um, by uh, various other considerations. It may not be solely GDPR. Um, it could also be taking into consideration federal laws um, how the FTC has worked with regard, you know, unfair competition right, laws right, right. generally, consumer expectation. There, there's so many different kind of legal considerations that I think um, informed our uh, uh, our our inclusion of certain factors into this test. Um, okay, and so, so that's what. Let I me ask this this question another way because I think that maybe we're saying the same thing, but maybe um, yeah. I'm not expressing my idea clearly. So we don't, we're not reading uh, the factors in 7002B as factors under which some calculation under those factors will lead to disregard the reasonable expectation of the consumer. That's a requirement that doesn't go away because, because of a balancing of factors, right? So that's I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I understand the question. Okay. So it's put because I'm probably not making myself clear. So the way I think about initial purpose, that's a requirement. It's a requirement that there has to be a coordination between the purpose and the reasonable expectation. So it's not subject to factors. It's a requirement. If there are factors, it, it seems to me that there's some kind of balancing or equilibrium. And if the factors point in one direction, then we have to align with the consumer expectation. And if they point in a different direction, they might, you might not have to align with the consumer expectation. I mean, they- No, I don't think that, that's how it- factor. Um, Just, yeah, sorry, make me I think didn't, that I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt <laughs> no, you, Ms. De no, 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 Mrs. No, no, no. What I wanted to say is, no, I don't think that that is the case. Um, what the requirement is, is that this purpose for which uh, personal information was collected or processed has to be consistent with the reasonable expectations of a right. consumer. And th the factors are provided as helpful guidance because many people have asked, well, what are the reasonable expectations of a consumer? How do I figure that out? And those factors were really included to very, to give guidance to businesses to understand, like, here's what should be considered um, when you're trying to determine what the reasonable expectations of a consumer are. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Mr. McTaggart? Um, yeah, and I, I um, so I, if I'm understanding uh, Ms. De La Torre, you're, you're just trying to clarify that uh, where these factors came from and then are they conclusive or sort of are they you know do they come down on the tablet and are they you know forever immutable and i guess my point would be you know the statute uh specifies uh reasonable expectations and it specifies the context you know in which they're collected 
and this is kind of the this is where it 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 tasks originally the the AG and now the agency with with coming up with you know uh, regulations and so this would be I, in my mind 185b you know further regulations um, uh, to to implement the statute and I you know when I went through them I thought it was a pretty good list of 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 you know and again I I guess I'm new to this process so I apologize if I'm you're talking too much or whatever, but it does feel like this is a good starting pot spot. Um, and as as they change, if 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 it turns out that there's something that's missing, uh, we could probably add it. Um, you know, when I had my little issues about the you know wordsmithing, but I but I think it's a pretty good. I mean, are, are there are there ones that for you you think oh that shouldn't be in there or 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 because I I looked at this. No, no, I was just surprised by the approach, but I think Mrs. Kim just explaining that these are not factors that might you know lead to disregarding the consumer expectation. That they are just factors to help businesses. Correct. That's that's my interpretation. Derive. I don't want to speak for okay. Mrs. Kim, but that's yeah. my that's yeah. my. I, I think that's what she just said. That makes sense to me. Yeah, we can't change the foundational requirements of the statute. But I mean, we, the agency cannot, um, but the agency can help people implement it. Um, the same, thing, same thing for C, they go through, okay, well, yeah. what, what is it, another disclosed purpose is compatible. They're doing, you know, the, 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 the staff is doing their best to come up with, with those. And again, I, I thought they were a good starting spot. And especially, I really liked uh, C3, uh, which I thought was an you know, innovative approach. So anyway, I'll stop talking, but I, I, thought, I thought it was a, a reasonable approach to the task that the agency uh, is given under the statute. Thank you very much, Mr. McTaggart. Mr. Thompson? Uh, I actually, uh, what Mr. McTaggart's last comment was, was an excellent segue and very similar to what my observation was, which I think the, the staff has a difficult job to do with defining, uh, meeting the mandate that's in the statute to uh, align Further with cons uh, consumers' expectations is is the way I read it in the in the underlying statute. And when I first read our our ISOR and, and the regulations, I struggled with okay, how do we determine what consumers' expectations are? Um, and those change over time. Um, I have kids; their their expectations are different than mine. Um, I grew up in a in a different era where you know, all the collection of this information didn't exist. So my expectations are, are different than, you know, somebody who's 15. Um, but I thought, I think that this is an excellent um, way to, to start to express that. I assume it's going to take refinement over, over time and, and clarification. Um, but, you know, I, I thought the examples and the illustrative examples were, were very helpful um, to, to take, an amorphous concept and, and put it into words um, was was a, a big task, and I, I think the staff did a did a good job. Um, so I just wanted to to share that. I mean, I think the approach makes sense to me, and but I, I also want to recognize that we're going to have to probably continue to refine over time. I, I don't have a proposed change, but you know, th this is somebody used the phrase "is this immutable?" Um, you know, I. This is an area where I think some refinement will over year, over coming years will be needed um, because people's expectations and their what what a reasonable expectation by a consumer is will change over time. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. If I could take um, chairperson's prerogative uh, and offer a comment in response to Mr. Thompson and other things that I've heard in the very good conversation um, now. Um, expectations are likely to be affected again by technological change, by social change, um, by many things. And um, that is the real, that is one real power of having a statute that specifically has the agency do implementing regulations because the regulations, nothing's immutable. <laughs> Let me just pause and say nothing's immutable. The legislature can amend the statute. Um, uh, at the same time, the statute is more, um, more um, stable and is intended to be stable. Um, and the regulations are intended to be stable guidance, but they are the place in which um, we can help reflect and respond to changes as they, as they come up. 
Um, I've also been listening to Ms. De La Torre's sort of questions and the expertise that's embedded within them um, with a lot of interest. And uh, I don't know, this may be a little bit too nerdy of a comment, but okay, I'm going to say it anyway. I think that the um, that the uh, approach that staff have taken with 7002 is a really elegant balance that takes into account, or at least when I read it, I think it's taking into account both some of the sources they looked at, like the GDPR, which is a valuable thing to do, of course, because um, uh, we want to be as coherent you know, as we can in general, and also takes into account the fact that, of course, California um, is its own jurisdiction, but also that California is in the United States, which has its own history with these concepts. Um, the fair information practice principles from which data minimization and purpose disclosure both come were developed in the 1970s in the United States. And then as Ms. De La Torre um, alluded to earlier, eventually um, some of the things in the fair information practice principles, the FIPS, um, kind of got dropped um, in the overall um, framework. And we ended up with sort of some kind of notice and then choice, um, but at the and at the same time, Europe was taking a more complete approach. Um, so we have both of those things, like histories, and both the statute, I think, and um, staff's intervention take into account. Like we are in one place, we were in one place in the U.S. and another place in Europe, um, and we would like to. Um, be, you know, cohesive and coherent um, uh, as we can, um, and reflecting that history of the FIPS um, as well, um, both in the statute and in the regulation. So I just think it's an elegant, it's definitely a more elegant approach than my comments just now. Um, and I, again, I, I really commend, I really commend the staff. Um, are there other comments or questions? Uh, and not on that section, uh, I just wanted to clarify that we're not talking about you know, a set of factors that could deviate from the uh, obligation, but I do have comments on other sections. Let's go around and see if anybody wants to share comments on this section before we move on. Thank you, Ms. Or, you, you probably can see you, it. Yeah, um, you, so you don't have further comments on 7002? On 7002B. Okay. So I would like to talk about C. I see, okay, please go ahead. Okay, so the C section, so the, the first section is our primary purpose. You have to connect that to the expectation of the consumer. We're giving you factors so that you can understand what that expectation is. C is a secondary purpose test, as I understand it, which, you know, I'm going to go into my professional <laughs> role here a little bit, but apologies for that. So what it basically means is, okay, I have this data that I collected for this specific purpose, and the consumer expects me to do this, but I really want to use it for something that's different. Is there a universe where I can do that? And in general, the answer is probably not. You have to go back and get consent, but there is an exception to that general rule, and that's the secondary purpose test when the purposes are sufficiently aligned based on a test that has factors, then you might proceed and, and use the data for that secondary purpose. Um, so apologies on that piece, but I just, I'm trying to give um, a little bit of perspective here. So the one thing that surprised me in this section is that there are only two factors because I'm used to five and I don't know why the other three are missing and maybe they are missing for a good reason. And I was going to maybe ask um, Mrs. Kim if we could go through the ones that I am used to seeing and are not there, and we can um, learn. You know, if there was there's a reason for sure. it. Maybe that's California specific. So the um, first factor, yes, um, it is a little repetitive. But the, the first factor is the link between those purposes and the purposes of the intended part of the uh, processing that. Um, assist in other jurisdictions. The second one is the context in which the data was collected. That makes a lot of sense and it assists in other jurisdictions. I don't see as a factor 
the nature of the personal information. So to me, that should be a factor because if the information is sensitive, then I'm not that inclined to allow for a secondary use without consent versus if the information is not sensitive. And why did we choose to not include that as a factor? Um, I, you know, we'll like, I, I'm just trying to take some, a moment to like digest that a little bit. Um, just to clarify with regard to, um, you know, uh, A or second, this concept of secondary purpose, um, I understand what is being said. And I think in many ways, this idea of compatible with the context in which it was collected is similar, perhaps not identical to secondary purpose, but it's similar um, because it's just a difference in how we're describing it. Um, but it's certainly something that we can take into consideration if we add, wanted to add it. As you notice, it's part of the test for B. Um, it's a you know, something to be considered. Sorry, I, I guess I'm stumbling over my words. I, I, I'm gonna jot this down and kind of give some thought to it. Um, perhaps this is something we can continue to move forward on if you wanna identify other factors for us to consider in adding to that compatibility test. Okay, thank you. So I definitely would like to add that factor because to me, um, it shouldn't be equally easy to use for a secondary purpose sensitive information and non-sensitive information. Um, and I don't know, you know, what's the right context of doing it. I don't know if it's in the context of this rulemaking or a future one, maybe we can table that for the end of the conversation. Um, so the, the other factor that I'm used to that is not there is considering the consequences of the intended further processing to the individuals. To me, that's something that should be considered when you're thinking about secondary purposes. Those secondary purposes in many cases could be beneficial to the individual. And those cases, I think that is more understandable to not have to go back and obtain consent versus if those purposes are not beneficial to the individual, that should be a factor to maybe not allow for that secondary use without consent. Why? Um, Maybe would you support including that factor, I guess? So uh, could you repeat what the factor is? Consequences to other consumers? Is that? Uh... Consequences of the intended activities for the individuals to whom the data relate, for, for the individuals that um, whose personal data we're talking about. Yeah, how, because... how about this? Um, I'll, I'll write this down. Um, and perhaps during a break, let me give it give a chance for me to just really kind of right. um, sit with it. But um, I appreciate that. Right. And, and let me stop here and just express appreciation for all the work that you have done and the staff has done and all of the time that you have been here trying to help us with this. And so um, I'm just trying to build on what we are doing and uh, provide ideas for um, improving. Um, so there's a, a, a one more factor. Oh, sorry, Ms. Dale, one more. Uh, sorry, can I just follow up on what you just said? Right. Um, so uh, given that we've been following a structure of um, the proposed mod the modification staff suggested in the chart, the modification staff um, suggests have suggested in the meeting, the specific modifications to the tax, modifications um, perhaps proposed by board members, and then things that are important to um, include in a future um, potential revision or a future rulemaking for a new topic entirely. Um, are you proposing, or are you maybe not proposing yet, but are you thinking um, that this is something um, that we would think about for a future um, modification? Because that, 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 I mean, that's what I, yeah, I, that that would help to clarify. Is this something that you want us yeah. to include this time around, or something to that we can kind of sit and chew on a little bit longer? Um, I I would like to table that conversation for the end because, uh, from my perspective, again, giving priority to moving this package forward is is very important.
important, but at the same time, maybe not including the sensitivity of the personal information as a factor is a reason enough to delay this particular provision, not the rest of the rule, but this particular provision, and maybe then it can move forward with um, the second package that shouldn't be maybe, you know, I'm, I'm just guessing, guessing, but maybe six, eight months away, because the um, the core of this is already in the law. Like we're basically restating something that in my view is in the law. It's just making sure that we, um, you know, don't create unintended consequences or that we are thoughtful and, and we come up with the best package possible. So let's table that for the end and, and then we can decide. Okay, so we'll, we will we'll return to sort of the bucket there at the end. I do want to give Mr. McTaggart, Mr. Lay, and Mr. Thompson a chance to comment. Um, I think I have the order you raised your hands in correct. It's Mr. McTaggart and Mr. Lay and Mr. Thompson. So Mr. McTaggart, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think um, as usual, Ms. Ms. Delatore's heart's in the right place trying to push uh, for maximum consumer protection here. I do think though that the right now, the, in the interest of getting these things out, um, the difficulty probably is that uh, staff was looking at the statute and some of those comments might go a little further than the statute, which is 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 pretty specific about the context. And so I, I think um, these, I guess my two cents would be that these, you know, 7002C does a good job of uh, elucidating the statutory language in 100C and and uh, is is a, is is good for now, and and there may be a time to 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 re revisit that in the future. But I think it's I think it's really a good start for now, and I think it's it's on safe ground, given what's in the statute. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Mr. Lay. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I do appreciate those additional secondary purpose factors. I do wonder if you know, at least the nature of the data is kind of incorporated. Uh, because we say, you know, what are the reasonable expectations and the compatible purpose? And, you know, that is a factor in B. So do those reasonable expectation factors get incorporated into C? Um, I, I don't know. I, I think it, to kind of second Mr. Montaggart, um, I think this is in good grounds. I, you know, we have the reasonable expectations kind of restated in this section that would cover the nature of the data used and kind of the consequences of that use in, in you know, perhaps um and and I, I guess i would i would say to the extent we could get this in you know to the next uh you know within the next board meeting and then we could actually just vote on it and still fit the schedule if that was possible and the staff thought that was possible then i would support that but yeah if this is going to take you know longer and it would delay the, the the regulation a lot um and or would require us to take out <clears throat> consideration of C, I wouldn't want to do that. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Mr. Thompson? Um, my comment was on a different subject, so I can wait until this is done. Um, let me go ahead and then just interject. I, I, uh, uh, board member Lay reminds me <laughs> as to some of the reasoning as to why that wasn't included in um, subsection C. And it was because we thought it was somewhat duplicative since subsection C with regard to the compatibility con um, analysis takes into consideration reasonable expectations of consumer. And that it also includes the source of the, or the nature of the personal information as well as the consequences of that, or um, some of these considerations, we just thought it was duplicative. But I do wanna give some, thought as to whether or not it's something that um, we can either uh, address, you know, quickly or not. I think I, it's something that I, I would like to consult with other members of the staff in order to make that determination. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Um, additional comments? And just to be clear, Ms. Della Torre, um, what a board member, um, it was those two factors or were there additional factors as well? There is one more that I don't see. Um, another factor that I'm really used to is the, the existence of appropriate safeguards in both the original uh, purpose and the in the further processing. And this, would, it really talks about these ideas of like encryption and pseudonymization. And to me, 
again, these are factors that naturally should point towards uh, more flexibility in the secondary use purpose where if they are not there, it should maybe be seen in a more restrictive way, right? Like if you have taken steps to create more security and to create some form of anonymization, you might be in better grounds to use the data for a secondary purpose without relying on additional consent. Um, yes, and I, I do have a point with regard to that because I do think those are things that we consider, but instead we included them in the factor test for subsection D um, with regard to reasonably necessary and proportionate. And since every single purpose has to undergo all of the, uh, you know, all of the various factors to be considered, I do think it's, um, it's, it's sufficient, that concern is sufficiently addressed by including that consideration in subsection D. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Um, Mr. Sultani? Oh, no? Oh, you're muted. Uh, I was just going to re-articulate, Ms. Delatore. So is your concern just the order that things are in? Or, because, I mean, it sounds like most of the pieces you're highlighting, we've applied just in a different format that, that conforms to the structure of the statute. And so as... Ms. Kim outlined that we have the kind of compatibility test in C, but we have the data minimization function in D, and then we have essentially the purpose limitation in B, and it's just applied in a different format. And I recognize it might be alien if you're looking at it from a European lens, but we are in California and we have a different statute. So I just want to yes. understand your guidance is rather than kind of Again, back to the earlier point, I'd love your guidance on what would you like staff to do and in what timeline. And I'd like the board to put, provide that input because we, we've we done, we've spent probably the most amount of time on this section and we feel like uh, it, it conforms to what the statute uh, guides us to do, including the purpose and intent of the statute. And so I just would love the guidance rather than kind of more of an interrogation, to be honest. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to better provide the comments without having a conversation, but maybe I shouldn't have a conversation. Is that what you're saying that I should just, no, I would just love to see, um, uh, yeah, no, no, it's, it's not that I, I want to discourage con conversation. I just want to kind of discourage. So back to the earlier point that I made, the goal of the staff is to kind of take the policy direction from the board and implement that policy direction conforming to the restrictions of the statute. And so we've spent quite a lot of time trying to implement the statute. If there are pieces missing, then we would love to know what you think the statute should do and what the rest of the board think, sorry, what the, the guidance should do. But rather than trying to um, essentially interrogate what staff's interpretation is in real time, which I, I don't think um, serves you know, Ms. Kim, for example, is trying to be responsive, but I think it's kind of putting her on a spot. Um, we'd be happy to take guidance okay. and then try to, try to come back with whether we could try to implement that guidance in either this time frame or in the next time frame. But I think for the purpose of kind of trying to assimilate what you'd like to see, it would be just great if like, if there is a problem with what how we've implemented other than it being out of order, I think would be helpful to understand. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try to do it in a different way. And I do apologize if I made Mrs. Kim feel uncomfortable in any way. I have great admiration for her professionally. She has crafted, you know, a whole set of rules that I will be incapable. To be honest, I, you know, when she's providing her comments, I'm like, oh, I guess she's going faster than I could ever go. So um, if, if, you know, my approach in any way, deviated from expressing that um, professional admiration. I, I apologize and that was that was not the intent of it. Um, so it, it wasn't taken that way too. I just want to clarify. Okay, okay. And, and I appreciate Mr. Sultani, you know, being um, a little bit, you know, guarding the, the staff and I, I appreciate that. So let me try it in a different way. And if, if it's not helpful, you can let me know and I can adapt. Um, but I mean, to Mrs. Sultani's point, precisely what I'm trying to do is be very specific with my guidance so that it is 
um, easier to um, take in by staff and analyze. And I'm, you know, I'm available to have all the conversations. Is that part of the process or, um, you know, we can decide, but, um, okay. So, um, and in regards to the order, so that's another thing that I was surprised about because uh, D is data minimization, right? That, that's what I understood from the comments earlier. And data minimization in our lease has factors. And I don't conceive data minimization as something that's subject to factors. You have to minimize your data no matter what. So if you're doing something that could be done without using sensitive information, you have to do it. There is no factors. If you could, um, if you're doing something that is taking a, a large amount of data, and you could do it with half of that data, with pseudonymized data. Sorry, I, I mispronounced that. That is a. It's from my perspective an obligation that is not subject to factors. Um, I, 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 maybe that's the way I'm used to looking at it, but there could be room. And Mrs. Kim pointed to this because the statute anyway requires you to run all of the steps. Maybe we end up in a place that's similar. Um, so, um, yes. So, um, I mean, I thank you, Ms. Ms. De La Torre. I would like to now circle back around to the question of the buckets um, because, the, excuse me, the the categories of of potential change. Um, or potential additional modifications, whether they are potential additional modifications um, to the language that's right here on the page um, or um, potential additional modifications um, when and if we revisit, and, and I think there's embedded in here a request to revisit um, section 7002 um, in a, a future rulemaking package. Um, this is really sounding to me like it is most appropriately dealt with in the latter. And this is, this is the reason why. Um, as uh, Mr. Sultani said, um, this required um, a lot of thought and work in order to be sure that the, the statute um, and the guidance um, are perfectly aligned and that it provides useful guidance um, to the public. And so um, it, you know, I, I think that it's been carefully considered as it is. Secondly, um, the requirements of the statute, and I don't know if this is entirely responsive to your last um, uh, potential concern, Ms. De La Torre, which, which um, I, I definitely um, support the general idea um, of, of the concern, but the statute itself um, is not something that is modified by the regulations. It cannot be modified by the regulations. Um, so those fundamental protections are already in the statute. And the way that I, um, the way that I analyze that, if there is something here that I would like to see added, for example, a different factor would be um, that that um, we have the protection from the statute now. We have the guidance from um, 702 as modified, suggested as modified by the staff now, um, and that is both protective of the public, good guidance for businesses now, and we um, definitely um, can look at improving it in the future um, if that's needed. Um, but I currently am not seeing um, or hearing at least um, something that I would think um, didn't fall into that last category because I think it is something that would need to be considered pretty, pretty carefully. Um, okay, Mr. Lay and then Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I think perhaps Ms. De La Torre, and we all could be served by maybe one-on-one -on -one meetings with Ms. Kim around some of these questions around interpretation. Um, you know, for example, I believe, you know, D says, you know, if, if the business's use is reasonably necessarily proportionate, it's based on whether the minimum personal information was used. So that, that may align with your uh, kind of thoughts, Ms. De La Torre, and it may not. Um, but I, I think that would probably be better served and, you know, kind of these one-on-one -on -one, rather than asking Ms. Kim right now to explain whether or not that's the right interpretation of, you know, of, of D1. Um, so, yeah, I, I would like this if we can table this and, and move on. It's just my, my one 
There's one vote on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Lay. Mr. McTaggart. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd echo Mr. Lay and actually, you know, Mr. Thompson's uh, comments that this, the only thing we know for sure is this, these standards are going to change over time and uh, expectations will change. I actually think, Mr. LaTorre, maybe she's raising a point that none of us really expect, you know, to see factors. And it's funny, if you just remove the three words factors from the end of each paragraph and just based on the following, you might not have had the same reaction Ms. Delatore, uh, so just either you could remove those words and reads the same, uh, or you could just mentally not focus on the word factor. It's just kind of, it's almost just grammatic. It's, it's a way of layout, just like laying out these, some of these tests, which will change over time. So I think they're just, to me, they're not dispositive. They're just helpful guidance. Um, and so uh, I, I would also echo uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Lee's, Mr. Lay's, uh, suggestion just that we, we we move on with this because I think uh, okay thank you I appreciate I appreciate those perspectives from Mr. Lay and Mr. McTaggart I'm also inclined um, for um, us to move um, to the next category of things with the expectation that um, Ms. Kim um, and I think that she has um, very carefully um, collected the observations um, and thoughts that Ms. De La Torre provided I, I but first, I, have I a wanted to make sure I want to check with Mr. Thompson. And I, yes, I will circle back to you, Ms. De La Torre. I just want to be sure that other board members have um, the opportunity to weigh in. Uh, my observation on, uh, on this discussion is I, I feel like we were all going through this process for the first time. And we have various interlocking overlapping and sometimes contradictory constraints on what we can talk about and with whom and when um so i i i, I fully understand the desire to uh take the opportunity when it is presented to get questions answered um i concur with mr lay's observation there are other there are other uh, venues but i am I tend to, to to defer to the desire to get questions answered because it, it, our process is a little bit confusing. I think probably we, we hear some consensus around um, the nature of the of the input and guidance that that occurs in a as we consider changes to the rules. But this is our first time, so I, I think we're we're kind of feeling our way along as as we go. Um, I'm going to hold there for a second, just. Um, because I had a, I had a minor observation comment um, modification on on subsection B, um, but happy to to discuss that and bring that up at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, and I do agree that it is enjoyable, at least for us, if not for everybody watching, to nerd out a little bit um, together as a group. Um, uh, we just remind everyone as well, I think this echoes um, some of what Mr. Lay was suggesting as well, that at the top of the meeting, um, we discussed that there are different approaches that we can take with the policy guidance that we give the staff in terms of timing and where it might be implemented. And also we have more than one path to provide feedback um, and to ask questions. And one is in the meeting and one is talking with staff. Um, and I absolutely um, love to nerd out, and I absolutely support um, Ms. De La Torre um, asking all of her questions, but I do think that we need to make a decision um, on a continuum um, uh, 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 of when, when one path is better, um, and I tend to agree that um, I think we have things on the table now um, uh, for staff to consider and that it would be a good idea um, to move to the next topic. But I don't want to you know, um, do that without um, circling back to Ms. De La Torre um, uh, to check in with her since she was the um, person who started this very interesting conversation. Right, so I, I wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, uh, Mrs. Kim has not been only generous enough to endure me right now, but she also offered two hours of her time this week 
to go with me over this section. And we together went through it granularly and I expressed to her my difficulty kind of correlating the, the, the concepts to the concepts in, in that I'm more used to. And the purpose was to basically educate myself, which probably she failed to do um, because of my deficiencies, but also to, um, to kind of let her know that, that I was gonna bring up these things. Um, I, um, I, I won't follow the same process because I think that Mrs. Utani made a very good um, comment that it seems like an interrogation. It was not meant to be an interrogation. It was meant to be a conversation. But I have several other things that came to mind for me when I was reading this section that are just not aligned with how data minimization, purpose limitation, and, and the secondary purpose use um, uh, that I'm used to, to see implemented, uh, which cause confusion to the extent, and this is going back to Mr. Sultani, to the extent that it's just changing order, so long as they are there and, and the effect is the same, uh, you know, that wouldn't be anything that should delay the rules. Um, in, from my perspective, my main concern is that what we're talking about is really kind of the core of how we switch from notice and consent to something that's more functional. And I think it's really important to get that core right from the beginning if we're gonna go through the process. Um, so again, thank you um, to all of you for your feedback. And if you can endure, I have a few more comments. And there's, there's only one that is really confusing to me. Um, and I think a second one that is very important that maybe I'm missing and where it is in the law, but um, I can highlight those as I go through it. Is it a good uh, idea for me to continue? For me, for me, certainly, I would like to know those items so that even if we don't implement it them immediately, it's something that we can take under consideration and and understand. I did want to respond to your response regarding data minimization. Um, we don't have anything specifically that says data minimization in our statute, but we do have the language of reasonably necessary and proportionate. And in many ways, uh, we interpret that as somewhat synonymous <laughs> to this concept of data minimization. And so, um, but those factors, I think, you know, minimum is is certainly there, but there's also the language of, of, of some type of proportionality that we wanted to include that. We didn't think it really made as much sense in the compatibility section, but it made sense with the regard to necessary and proportionate, like the additional safeguards, um, having appropriate safeguards, um, that sort of thing. So. That is why it's in subsection D and we think it serves kind of the same purpose. Um, ultimately, um, you get to the same endpoint essentially. Um, but yes, please do go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. And I, again, and my, my... can you offer your, your next, can you offer your next two points together? Uh, I'm, I'm maintaining on being granular with exactly that just to be able to provide clarity so that the guidelines are clear whether it's something that we as a board decide um, maybe we want to give the staff more time to craft this absolutely the way we see it and um, basically move it forward in the second train that's coming or whether we say, well, this is good enough. We want to implement it this way and we will modify it whenever, uh, which I think we should, that's conversation to have at the end, but okay. So um, the, the one thing that was um, more, um, works on to me because I'm, I'm um, very connected with this space is that um, under the European framework and really under the modernized convention 101, which is basically what is being implemented in many other countries, there's a, a set of um, purposes that are excluded from the secondary test. And I think for a good reason to, um, so, processing for archiving purposes in the public interest, scientific and historical research purposes, which are very, very often secondary purposes and statistical purposes are a priori considered compatible. They are not necessarily run through the test the same way that, that other uses are. And I couldn't see that reflected in this um, section um, 7002. And I, I, I'm concerned that that could lead to unintended consequences in um, restricting 
um, uses of data that, that are very beneficial uh, for society. And the example that it's a high level example, hopefully, <laughs> that came to mind is um, if we are trying to fight global warming, a warming and we want to use um, uh, electricity consumption in households in California, to me, that secondary purpose, it, we should be much more flexible in making it compatible than a purpose that's very um, commercial, for example. Um, so that's another thing that I will definitely urge us to consider uh, to what degree we wanna identify these statistical, scientific, historical research purposes as something that should, should be less restricted perhaps than other secondary um, purposes. Um, one more thing is that it, it's also to my understanding universal, but I think it could be addressed in other places of CCPA is legal compliance. Uh, secondary uses for legal compliance are usually excluded from any kind of factor test because if you're legally required to do something, uh, even if that was not expected by the um, uh, consumer, you should, you should be able to do it, right? Um, the last one is journalistic purposes. I, could I just add, respond to that point? Um, uh, legal compliance issues are included in 1798-145 civil code section. So I just want to make a note. I don't think it's necessary to include that here. Thank you. Um, like I mentioned before, Mrs. Kim, you know, runs circles around me when it comes to citation. So that might be um, something that is already excluded somewhere else in the law. But even as we consider, um, you know, improving on this um, version, maybe we should mention it here just for more clarity. Um, I, that would be my suggestion. Um, and the last one is journalistic purposes. The use of um, data for secondary purposes in the journalistic space is something that should have a different set of considerations um, because that is, again, a use that in my opinion is you know, supportive of freedom of speech and also um, in, the, in the public benefit. Um, so I'm just... Um, so that, that the, the core one for me there in terms of exceptions to the secondary pur uh, purpose test is really the scientific historical research piece and, and just try to um, maybe bring it up if not in this iteration as soon as possible because we do not want to create a situation where this law is, that was intended for one um, very good purpose ends up, uh, ends up having consequences that were not um, intended. But the, the one thing that was really most difficult for me to understand in this section is who is the consumer? Because I read the examples and the different examples kind of tended to give me different answers. So my first question was, and I, this is not for Mrs. Kim, this is just me asking myself, is the California resident to whom the data relates the consumer that we're talking about here in the examples? So there's one example, for example, uh, there's one example that says, I think it's in B2, if a business collects the consumer's fingerprints in connection with setting up the security feature of a device, um, and it, it, it goes on the example, I think Mr. McTaggart made reference to that example. In that example, to me, the consumer is the individual who's providing the fingerprint. But when I read, for example, um, the example in C3, and this would be the situation where the consumer is uploading all of his or her pictures to the cloud for a, to a provider for storage, it reads to me as we mean by consumer, not the person, the people who are in the pictures, but the person who's uploading the pictures to the cloud. And then there's this idea of the reasonable consumer as possibly what we're referring to, but I think that was in the prior draft and it is not in the newer draft. Um, and I, I might be incorrect about that, but I think that was one of the changes. Um, and then there's another section that talks about, um, I think this is D2. Actually, the Ms. Delatory, thank you. I mean, thank you for being efficient, but that's two um, categories of comments. And I just wanted to, make sure we paused and um, caught those. 
Um, with regard to press freedom, um, uh, statistical use of scientific research, um, concepts that are similar um, as Ms. Kim suggested for the first one are in 1798.145. They are concepts that are similar. Um, of course, it's not exactly the same words that the GDPR uses. The concepts are, are similar there. Um, and so again, for me, this is a great candidate for staff to be able to analyze for a future potential tweak to the rules um, to try to help, you know, make it um, as, um, as, a, as strong and understandable and helpful as possible, but not something um, that is necessary um, to handle now. And with regards to the conversation that is happening now with regards to reasonable consumer, um, Again, I mean, this is the kind of thing that staff would need to, to do a careful interpretation, a legal analysis um, in order to get the baseline question answered um, uh, and then apply that back to the regulation. I am not seeing anything that should prevent us from moving forward with this, although I really encourage you to work with staff um, to sort that out, but it is, I don't think that that is um, a kind of a small item. In just in terms of the analysis. I don't mean in terms of the ultimate change, just in terms of the analysis. Is it appropriate for me to talk right now? Or do you have the third? We... Do you have, you said you had a, one more item? And well, in the, in the consumer, there's a, a section that talks about the possible negative impacts to consumers, which seems to me it might be all of California residents. So the, it's not a definition um, that that is without consequence. Because in this section, we say two things that the reasonable expectation of the consumer is what should be considered. So we should know who the consumer is. And second, that we have to go, businesses have to go back to the consumer to obtain consent. And the businesses definitely need to know who that consumer is. And maybe there is an answer for it. I just was confused by the examples. The law defines consumer to mean a California resident, but it is important to identify who that resident is to operationalize this provision. Thank you, Ms. De La Troy. Um, I, I think that was a very helpful encapsulation of the question. Um, at this point, I am um, inclined to, again, um, have Ms. Kim have collected um, uh, um, the very good thoughts and feedback and potential um, potential things to consider um, and to respect the um, opinion of other board members that we go ahead and move on to the next thing. Um, we uh, can consider um, circling back in the future, um, but I think that we should um, spend time on the um, the next item on the list, which is the um, which is the sort of bucket um, of of things um, and with any that staff have identified um, to bring forward, I also have um, Mr. Lay's um, request from earlier, Ms. De La Torre's request from earlier, and there may be additional requests. Um, so thank you very much, Ms. De La Torre. I really appreciate um, the detailed sort of analysis uh, and questions and conversation. Um, and um, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next thing um, and then consider circling back to this, um, as you alluded to earlier, with regards to sort of bucket um, of a process bucket with which to treat um, some of this information. Um, so, Ms. Kim, am I correct with where we are I, in the... Yes, but I believe Mr. Thompson mentioned that he had a comment, a small comment with regard to... Oh, that's right, he did. Thank you. Thank you for um, saving me from accidentally skipping over that. Um, Mr. Thompson? Thank you, uh, Chairperson Urban. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Um, the, uh, the question I had was about um, B24. Sorry. Yeah, B24. B4. Ooh. It's been a long day already. B4. Um, the, that factor, um, the, the specificity, explicitness, prominence of the disclosure is one of the um, things to be considered in whether or not uh, the, the purpose was reasonable. I may be misstating that slightly. 
And my question was, should that also, should another factor in that be the um, straightforwardness and ease of understanding the disclosure, which is, is laid out in 7003, um, if, if the, the disclosure is a factor in establishing the reasonableness of the, of the consumer's expectation, should the disclosure also be plain language and, and easy to understand? Should, and a way to achieve that might be just a tie back to um, section 7003, uh, subsection A. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, sorry, uh, Ms. Kim, uh, go ahead if you'd like. I was going to um, put to Mr. Thompson the same question I put to Mr. McTaggart earlier, um, which is that this seems a helpful mechanistic suggestion. And are you comfortable with staff um, looking at them together um, and analyzing whether it would be the best choice to tie back directly in the text? Um, or um, to continue with what we have now, which of course 7003 applies um, to notices generally. Are you, is that acceptable to have staff sort of use that discretion or would you like to um, uh, propose a, a specific change? Uh, I'm comfortable with that approach. Uh, I mean, one, if, if the, analysis is that the the requirements in 7 7003 would apply to that specific notice um, in my mind i was thinking that if you're going to assess the notice as a factor in if one is going to assess the notice as a factor in the reasonableness of a consumer's expectation that it it needed to be clear so i liked the tieback but um, i think you you started with um, would it, would I be comfortable with staff taking a look at that and, and determining and using their discretion on whether or not further clarification there or a tie to 7,003 or no change? Uh, I'm comfortable with that approach. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. Um, Ms. Kim, um, I just wanted to, again, because I'm trying to keep track um, of where we are with the different items um, in the conversation, um, I, I, I talked over you just a little bit and I apologize for that. So I will turn it back to you um, if there was something that you were have, planning to say. Um, no, I, I, I think, uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson for that notation. I, I did want to just point out that, um, you know, we specifically, uh, you know, one of the examples of the disclosure was the notice at collection and the notice at collection must comply with 7003 and generally speaking, 7003 applies to all notices and disclosures to consumers. But um, it's certainly something that we'll take under consideration and analyze as to um, you know, whether it's necessary to include that tie back here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. OK, um, Ms. Kim, and again, and part of the reason I had to um, interject is because we are now at the part of the day where if there are too many intervening um, comments or conversation, um, I am wary of my ability um, to remember what it was that I was going to ask. Um, and so that ties to the next thing, which is, am I correct that our next topic is um, the, 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 the batch topic? along with um, items that have been identified earlier in the conversation, am I correct? Or um, is there another quote unquote um, gray item to cover? And, and whichever it is, um, please let us know where we go next. Yes, um, I believe with that, uh, the ending of that conversation, we are past all the gray highlighted items. Um, next on the agenda was just to bring attention to the board with regard to new modifications that staff has um, suggested with regard to the you know, proposed regulations. Um, some of those were already covered in the gray areas, so uh, be mindful of that. But because you know, um, you know, we wanted to make sure some of these are ticky tacky, but at the same time, since uh, they're not in front of the board previously, I really wanted to make a point to ensure that the board members were aware of this. So this is gonna be kind of a line item by line item thing. Um, if you could just please bear with me because it may be a bit tedious because 
um, I, I, I will be highlighting some typos and things of that sort to draw, you know, just to ensure that um, because they, some of it is, um, could be considered substantive, though I would deem them to be consent items. If I had originally included them in the package to begin with, they would have been highlighted in white. Um, but I, I do think that it's something that I need to um, highlight or bring to the board's attention. So um, I'll just go ahead and uh, note each of these um, to the extent I'm not making myself clear or you have any confusion as that as to what I what I'm saying, please do let me know. Um, I have to say I have it written on a list on my computer and so I may not be able to direct you to the page number as quickly because I'll be going back and forth between different pages, but I'll try I'll do my best to be able to do that for you. Um, uh, so the, before you start, oh, sorry, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thompson, did Thompson. you need a clarification? I, a process check. Um, this is all under one agenda item, correct? Yes. And so if this agenda item carries over to till tomorrow, is does the public comment occur tomorrow? Yes. Or do we have any requirement to do public comment at each meeting? No, and no, okay. and indeed, I would like the public to have the benefit of the entire conversation um, so that they can respond to that. But yes, yes. Um, Thank you. Public comment will come after we finish discussing the, the whole agenda item. Thank you. Thanks for the question. All right. Ms. Kim, All right. take it away, so, the ticky tacky. The ticky tacky. <laughs> um, so the first ticky tacky or the first uh, section is 7001B. Um, this is the definition of alternative opt out link, and this is page two. Um, it's just a quick, we, we had said do not sell for share, and it should be changed to or share. So um, that's a typo that we made a change to. Uh, the next item is 7001G, and that is on page five. GG, I'm sorry, double G. So 7001 double G, right to limit. Um, this is the definition of right to limit. We made a small change that states um, that the right to limit means the consumer's right to request that a business limit the use of sensitive personal, uh, uh, you limit the use and disclosure of a consumer sensitive personal information. It, it previously had said the, and it's inconsistent with the other ways that we described the rights. And so that is why we made that change there. With regard to 7002A, 7002A1, um, oh, 7002A, um, we made a slight modification. We all, whenever the regulations reference the civil code section, we use the term subdivision. Um, but whenever we reference the regulations, we use subsection. So we just caught an inconsistency there. Um, so we changed subsection to subdivision. Um, 7002A1 and A2. Um, this is just an ordering change that seemed to be a bit more precise. Um, we had changed um, shall comply with subsection B's requirements, and instead we're reforming it to say shall comply with the requirements set forth in subsection B. Um, this is just uh, something that we thought just conforms it to other sections and makes a little bit more sense there. Um, same with uh, 7002A2, and, and again, this is um, on page six. Uh, uh, as we discussed previously, oh, okay, I'm sorry. 7004A2, that is on page uh, 10, I believe. 7004A2, um, we changed uh, it to that. So with regard to A2, symmetry and choice, um, within the right in the line that says right before an illustrated example, um, the path for a consumer exercise a more privacy protective option shall no, not be longer or more difficult or time consuming than the path to exercise a less privacy protective option because that would impair or um, interfere with the consumer's ability to make a choice instead of it would impair or interfere. 7,000, oh, we also you know changed the verb tense so that instead of saying impairs to basically align with the subject. So that would impair it impair or interfere with the consumer's ability to make a choice. 7004C is on page 13. 
uh, I have to just say a shout out to my staff or to the uh, the attorneys because since I, I I noted that I don't know the page numbers, they're they're slowly sending me the um, page numbers to help with this process. So I just want to give a special thanks to uh, the attorneys for the uh, that work on our staff. They're pretty amazing. Um, so seven thousand four C. 7004C, again, that is in, uh, I believe it is page 13. Um, oh, I believe we already discussed this point. Um, we already discussed this point about deleting the, the sentence that says, for example. Okay. Sorry, yes, that one, yes. We, that one we covered. We did already that. discuss that one. Um, 7011D is on page 14. And on that note, um, we just added the word and accessible. So the very first line of 7011D says the privacy policy shall be posted online and accessible through a conspicuous link. I think it just made some clarification there um, about accessibility. And then also with regard to the last sentence, we noted a mobile application may include a link to the privacy policy in the application setting menu. That, that's to conform to consistency because we had changed that in 7003D. So it's a conforming to a different section. Um, the next uh, thank section. You. Thank you. I'm, if it's all right, um, I will also um, raise my hand with a, a just a process clarification. Um, please do you know keep marching through, but I will be keeping my eye out for board members if there's anything that they would like you to pause on. Um, uh, and otherwise, I will check in with them at the end. But um, but just to let board members know, I'm I'm keeping an eye out just in case, um, in just in case you you need a clarification or something as as Ms. Kim goes through. All right, thank you, Ms. Kim. Um, thank you. I'll back over to you. Okay. So we are in 7012G3A, um, that is on page 22. Um, if uh, the very first um, illustrative example talks about a third party, uh, I'm sorry, it talks about an analytics business that has been struck out to say uh, ad network. And what we have recommended is to add the word third party ad network, just to be more clear that we're talking about ad network that we're, um, is acting as a third party. Um, the next reference is on page 31, and that is 7022B2. Um, 7022B2 on page 31. Um, we added language uh, to clarify that the business shall make the change itself where the service provider or contractor enables it to do so. So um, this is just, uh, this is a section that pertains to a request to delete. Um, what we had written there was that, you know, a, a, a business is to notify its service providers and contractors to delete um, from their records, consumers' personal information. And then we had included language or if able to do so, the personal, they, they should do it themselves. I think there was a, a slight, Confusion, like, is it themselves? Um, so we just included that language to say, if enabled to do so by the service provider or contractor, the business shall delete the personal information that the service provider or contractor has collected um, to make that clear. The next point is 7023D1. And that is on page, I believe, 33, 34, um, or close to 34. Um, D1, uh, the line that we had added, consumers should make a good faith effort to provide businesses with all, and then we made the change to say all um, necessary information available at the time of the request as opposed to relevant. We tightened that language up a bit. With regard to 7025C1, this is on page 40. Um, Actually, this is what we had discussed previously about including the language about you know other consu any consumer profile that is associated with the browser or device. And so um, I have that on my list of things to change. Um, moving forward, 7026A1 is on page 45. And there 
we have included just some clarifying language in that first sentence. Um, we added, if the business processes an opt-out preference signal in a frictionless manner to clarify that the privacy policy option is only available to businesses that process the opt-out preference signals and in a frictionless manner. So that language just added at the end. So now it reads, reads you know, if, if we go through the whole thing, a business that collects, per, collects personal information from consumers online shall, at a minimum, allow consumers to submit requests to opt out of sale or sharing through an opt out preference signal and at least one of the following methods an interactive forum accessible via the do not sell or share my personal information link, the alternate opt out link or the business's privacy policy if the business processes an opt-out preference signal in a frictionless manner. Next is 7027B1. This is a similar change. Um, however, it's slightly different in that we deleted the last option or the business's privacy policy because that's not an option here because the opt-out preference signal is not, uh, the frictionless manner does not apply to the opt-out preference signal yet. Um, and I, I believe that Mr. McTaggart might've raised his hand, but. I, I... Oh, my apologies, Mr. McTaggart. So I, there, that's the other thing is to please be oh. patient and leave your hand up because I'm looking at the language and the Zoom and the language and the Zoom. And, um, and so I apologize if no, I missed it. It was actually my fault. It was a very half-hearted, <laughs> hand wave which which miss kim caught so thank you so much um and i just uh was interested in miss kim's uh, i apologize I, I thought i would come back to it but the seven seventy uh 26 a1 you were just talking about so so that if you read it again so it said uh alternative opt-out link comma or if the business processes an opt-out um, privacy policy it says Sorry, it says, or the business's privacy policy if the business processes an opt-out preference signal in a frictionless manner. Okay, so in your in your in your uh, expertise, that that's very clear that it's only for the people who process in the in the frictionless manner. Yes, I mean that is my understanding. If there's a better, if you suggest a different well, I, way, or to... I would just put the frankly that if the fr frictionless manner in the front, or if the business processes it than the business privacy policy. It's a small thing. I just, I'm, this one freaks me out a little bit just because I want to make sure it's not buried on page like 475 of the privacy policy. And so, but, the, the, but I think that's a great change, by the way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Okay. Um, okay, moving forward. <laughs> uh, 7027B1, we've already discussed. 7027M, I believe that we have all also discussed that previously. Um, 7028A, and this is on page 52. This is again, a small typo change. Uh, uh, I, I believe in this instance where we use request to opt in to sale um, and we had the high, uh, is that the, uh, the backslash, <laughs> backslash uh, sale or backslash sharing? You I, think it's, I think it's a forward slash, but forward slash. My, my British partner calls it a stroke. Okay, that's true. Anyway, <laughs> my, it was like that. my apologies. Um, so basically, we took out the symbol and added or because uh, we generally do not use the 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 forward slash um, when referring to request to opt in, and so we just made that consistency change. So it says now sale or sharing. Yes, Instead request to sale. opt in to yes request okay. to opt in to sale or sharing your personal information. Thank you. Um. Next, we are looking at 7050A, and I believe this is a section that I had already kind of alluded to. We just changed the word from and through, and I'm sorry, 7050A is on page 53. Um, I believe I already mentioned this to the board that we changed from and through and added that uh, standard language of collected pursuant to its written contract with the business. Um, I believe we already spoke about the next item. So 7050E is on page 55. And this is uh, just a reference. We, we noted, we changed the reference to these regulations, which is on the fourth line and instead inputted section 7051 subsection A to be more precise uh, that we are speaking specifically or referring specifically to that regulation. 
Thank you, Ms. Kim. Um, I just want to be sure I'm in the right place and that um, e, is it complies with these requirements that's being changed? Yes. Okay. Yes. So that, that sentence, the second sentence that starts with, for example, a business's disclosure of personal information to a person who doesn't have a contract that complies with, and then we wrote section uh, 7051 subsection A to be explicit of speaking regarding our section about contractual provisions. Okay, thank you. Just so um, it's easy for you later on the transcript, initially you replaced the word requirements with regulations when you were going through it. Um, and I want to just establish so that it's very easy for you later that on page 55, subsection E, that is where the change will go in. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for noting that. Um, our next change is, and we're getting close to the end, so please, I believe this is the last one, is 7051A3. Um, this is on page 56. Um, again, we've already, actually, we've already covered this one. This is the um, example of where we struck out the very last sentence. This section shall list the specific business purposes and service identified in section A2 because it was duplicative of 7051A2. I believe that is all of my you know, specific references. All right, thank you very much. Um, so these were the changes to batched items that the um, staff are suggesting. Um, I will now, what I'm, I think that um, we can happily take um, potential batched items that board members would like to discuss, but I would, uh, because I have two already um, on my list, I do wanna be sure that we get to those um, uh, early in this conversation. Um, so Mr. McTaggart, um, do you have something to, um, to suggest that we talk about a request that we talk about or do uh, and also did you want to comment on like the batch because that's also yeah, i just had one question for yeah. Ms. kim on her i missed the change you made sorry on 7 70 27 b1 which is page 48 i'm sorry i was writing 70 sure. 26 a1 sure 70s 27 b1 we deleted the uh the words or the business's yeah. privacy policy yeah, Thank yeah. You. Okay. great Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. All right. I think the most efficient thing to do would be now to return to the additional items that board members identified as we were um, talking through um, some of the, the items identified for individual um, discussion uh, earlier in the day. And the first of those I have on my list is from Mr. Lay, and I believe it's from section um, 7012. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I just had some guidance, you know, um, particularly or just concerns around the notice, maybe around notice fatigue, essentially, um, particularly around the offline data collection. And I, I, I perhaps I thought it would be good if <clears throat> staff put in more examples on how businesses that are, you know, covered by the C CPPA, um, can kind of minimize their notice requirements in, you know, whether it's QR code or what's like the best way to display those codes if they're only using the data in ways that it's reasonably expected. And, you know, in the head, my head is like a large chain that uses surveillance cameras, perhaps uh, only, you know, only for the purpose that people would expect. What could they put up? You know, what level of notice is required? Um, I, I thought maybe businesses would would appreciate some more examples of what needs to be on there um because i imagine there's a lot of requirements of all the things that you have to put on these notices uh is there a shorter way to do it for offline businesses if not then you know that's that's something to think about but um i i believe there is ways to get around that if they're only using data where they don't have to get more explicit consent and um yeah just get your thoughts on you know whether or not it's possible to add another example around that Thank you, Mr. Lay. May I put to you the same, I think I might get to every board member, undoubtedly including myself today, 
Um, if I could put to you the same question I put to Mr. McTaggart and Mr. Thompson um, as to whether you are comfortable with staff taking that observation and feedback um, and making a decision as to whether um, it would make sense to add an example um, now. That... Yeah, that was my request, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Thank <laughs> you, thank you very much. Whether it's possible, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get around to myself here in a minute, I'm pretty sure. Um, all right, Mr. Um, Lay, was that the comment on 7012, or did you have more that you would like to share? Uh, yeah, and I guess the other one is, is 7012F. You know, I think there were some comments around, like, uh, you know, the idea that, you know, you have to direct a consumer directly to the section that has E1 through E6. Um, you know, we got some comments saying, like, that's hard to comply with because of other jurisdictional requirements, perhaps. You know, there's ways around that. You know, you could put, you can link to, you know, a table of contents that has those six things. But uh, perhaps some guidance for businesses that have to deal with that could be helpful um, for staff to look at for for the next batch. Thank you very much, Mr. Lay. I I think those are both really helpful um, observations and suggestions for the next batch. Um, and also, I would observe that also they're very amenable or they could very much be informed by observing again, how things are happening in the, in the marketplace. Um, I also um, attended to the comments uh, about the, the deep linking, for example, and I think it would be really helpful to know um, how that is experienced in the marketplace. Um, thank you, Mr. Lay. All right. Um, Next on my list um, is um, section 7050 from Ms. De La Torre. Um, thank you. Um, I have um, another final item, but that uh, 705250 uh, and, and the next sections are the sections that talk about service providers, contra contractors, third parties, and their, and their um, contractual provisions that they have to have in place. And my comment is not for um, this set of rules. I, I support the rules as they are. But I think that one thing that we could do with a relatively um, small investment that will be really beneficial is to create a template of what is a contract for a service provider? How do they look like um, for a contractor and a third party? and publish them and then allow businesses to incorporate them by reference. This is so much easier than creating your own template and negotiating it. It takes you from two pages to one line that you can add and effectively uh, standardizes the contractual uh, requirements. Um, so I know that it's not something that we can do now, but I think it's an investment that we could um, think about uh, making in the near future um, so that we can facilitate compliance, especially for small um, and medium-sized businesses that may not have their own attorney. They might find paying for an attorney really expensive. If they just know that here's your paragraph, you include it in your, in your service provider contract, and maybe there is an exhibit where they have to provide some high-level description of what the contract is about, um, that will make compliance more accessible and much uh, cheaper, quite honestly. Thank you, Ms. Elizabeth. All right, those were the items on my list um, pulled out from the discussion earlier. Um, are there additional items from, oh, and Ms. Ms. Kim, were you raising your hand or? Yes, I, okay. I was just um, reminded of additional item. Um, that may be uh, useful. And this is going back to 7027M um, with relation to all of the um, exceptions, you know, for the right to limit. Um, we just to, in the preamble to 7027M, we had included the term collect in addition to use or disclose sensitive personal information. We had done that initially because we had included the new subdivision eight that talks about for purposes that do not infer characteristics about the consumer. Um, that, that, that language, which is taken from the statute, per, uh, refers to collection of that information for purposes that do not infer characteristics about the consumer. 
But upon further reflection, we think it's more appropriate to put the word collects back into um, M8 instead of including it in the preamble. Um, I, I believe it's more precise and aligns more closely with the statute. And so that is another recommendation that the staff makes. Thank you very much, Ms. Kim. Can I just say, so what, what Ms. Kim just outlined um, is in part why I put my hand down because okay. uh, that, that I was going to flag that item that there was, uh, I believe, a resolution to the concern that I raised earlier. Um, and as usual, uh, the staff is all over it and, and was ahead of me. So thank you for, I, I appreciate Ms. Kim, you and others working this offline and, and I was given a, a, a resolution that addressed that concern. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Um, Mr. McTaggart? Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, is, is now when I should, I have a couple of sort of random uh, going through the, 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 the study. Way to sell it, Mr. McTaggart. <laughs> uh, but I, I, well, I don't, they're randomly ordered, but they're, okay. I, they are nevertheless, I think, important. Uh, are there ones, uh, is now a time you'd like me to go through those? Uh, certainly. Okay. Um, all right. So my first one is uh, 7013 on page 25. It's E for Edward three. And I just was sad to see this one go. Uh, so page 25, this is about the collecting stuff from your TV. And I would just like, and by the way, none of my comments are, are asking to be changed this time around, but they're all being asked to put in the bucket of with the staff, please consider these going forward. I personally, you know, when, when the TV is looking at you and you don't know, it's, you have to go through six steps to figure out if it's actually your privacy settings are enabled and then you get out of your movie, your kids yell at you. I'd love it to be uh, easy. So I'd love what was um, removed to go back in. Uh, then uh, 74 or some kind of concept dealing with the with the device and, and cars as well. It's a big one for cars as well, those, those devices. So I think it's really important. I think people really care about it. So I think we should not uh, let that one go, but I understand for now. Sorry, Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, you're tw at, on page twenty-five at the top. Yeah, that, I just want to follow along. Yeah, yeah, that was the the stricken part, and I just whether it's that language or something else, just even your car. Sometimes you have to go through sixty-five screens to figure out if it's every time you hook your phone up, it says, "Can we download all your data?" Um, then seventy. Uh, the next one is seventy fourteen on page twenty-six, and this is seventy fourteen. The stricken again language E3. Um, and I think Mr. Lay was talking about this a little bit, but just uh, I do think it's appropriate to, for us to give guidance on the brick and mortar, mortar world. Like, what are we going to see at a point of sale eventually? Like, if the people just bring your credit card to the, uh, to the uh, table, as you sometimes happens, or if you're checking out at Walgreens or whatever, you know, what's the, what's, and I know that's a long, complicated conversation. I just don't want to make sure we don't let, 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 let that one go. I think the brick and mortar. Um, Disclosures are, are important. May I verbalize my nod, please? Yeah. And then ask you to continue, Mr. McTaggart. Great. Thank you. On page 38, um, I, I know this is, I, I may not get a unanimous support here, but um, this is around, this is 7024D. Um, so there's a concept that you don't want to disclose, and this is not this set of regs. This is from before, so I just want to be clear. This is not. This is totally off. I mean, it's not need to be de determined right now. But eventually, the concept here is that they you shouldn't be disclosing really sensitive personal financial information uh, in response to a question because of risk or fraud. And yet, up above in 7023i, there is when you want to correct. There's a way. But you have language saying that a business shall not disclose the information, but may provide a way to confirm that the personal information maintains is the same as what the consumer has provided. So in the right to correct, there's a notion of like, well, do you have my correct social security number? And, and the business figures out a way to tell you whether or not you're correct or not. And there's a notion of them not sending in the information necessarily, but being able to confirm that they have it right, because otherwise, how can you correct? But then down here, they say, no, we're just never going to tell you. And I think there should be this, an analogous uh, uh, process because otherwise you have this odd 
thing of how do you know that half is correct? You have to write, you have to request a correction before you can find out if what they have is actually correct, because you have no right way to find out what they actually have, whether it's correct or not under this right to know. And I, I, I just think that there should be some way of the same concept that I think was a good concept that you developed for right to correct should also be in right to know because you know uh, somehow you have to figure out if what they have about you is correct or not in order to decide whether you want to make the right to a, a right to correct so so that's 7024d uh, otherwise it's, you're sort of in a kafka s kind of world where you know you can correct information but you don't know if it's correct or not <laughs> um then 7026f this is on page 46. So again, this is not a uh, this round. This is not something that uh, this is something that, that, that was developed prior. Um, this is around the right to opt out, um, and then the business having to cease selling and share the information within a certain time frame. And this says, you know, okay, consumer says, please don't sell my information, and then the business says, okay, uh, in this in this in the, in the regulations say they have to do stop selling as soon as feasibly possible, but no later than 15 business days from the date the business received the request. And this is one, I actually think that our director, uh, one of his pieces of research that was really interesting was back in the day when he was uh, figuring out that uh, you'd go to a car uh, dealer and they were all selling information about how many times you'd been at the car dealer. So they knew uh, they had ultimate negotiating power over you because they knew that you'd been to six car dealerships looking at this particular car, or looked at it online. and if you ask a business to stop selling your information and they can continue to sell it. That, that, that first 15 days is super important. And I understand that the, you know, one interpretation, staff's interpretation as soon as feasibly possible kind of covers that off. I, I would like staff to investigate whether or not it's possible to tie the time, especially for just for online sales, tie the ceasing to sell to the same rapidity with which they sell your information. I.e., if you show up on a site and five microseconds later, they're selling your information in a real-time bidding process, and you tell them don't sell my information, they should also be able to stop selling your information in that same time frame. Um, because otherwise they might say, well, it's a day before it's feasibly possible for us to go through all those things. And that one day is you know super valuable. It's like the it's most valuable the first hour and it kind of declines from there. And so I just want to make sure there's not a loophole there. Uh, so I'd like to tighten up that language the as soon as feasibly possible and tie it to the rapidity with which they're uh, selling your information. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. I just want to check if Ms. Delatore's hand is responsive to Mr. McTaggart's recent um, suggestion or if you have a new item for me to come back to when he's done with his list. No, I was wondering, uh, as he, as uh, Mr. Mattagar is going through his sections, if there's an opportunity for the other board members to interact, because if we wait until the end, it seems like there's multiple sections. I mean, we could have that conversation whichever way the chair thinks is best, but I did have a comment to the um, page 38 or, or more than a comment and a question, and now we're going, you know, moving forward. So I don't know if it's more efficient to stop after every section. Okay. And yes, let's let's go through the list. Um, I have no insight into how many items are on each list, although a, um, a board member could tell me. So I think it's going to be most efficient um, if you jot them down, Ms. Delatory, and then we'll come back when Mr. McTaggart um, has finished his list. Thank you. I think I'm on my last one, uh, second last one. Um, the, uh, I, I, and I do think that given that they, um, we should think about this is a much longer discussion. The um, the you know 145 M and N expired, and the legislature did not um, uh, deem it appropriate to act to extend them. I'm not very concerned about 145 M, which is the employee employer exemption in the statute, because there's tons of employee law in California where businesses have to keep your file. They have to keep them for three years after your you know leave. There's a whole, you can you can access your file. So all that stuff is is I think separate, but the, but the B2B exemption in 145N, I do think it would be behoove us to uh, have some guidelines about, you know, what, um, 
is important with respect to promoting privacy. Uh, this gets all into the intent and purpose of it, but, but allowing it, and, and Ms. Delatory, this kind of gets to some of your earlier comments, but you know what, what promotes privacy, but also promotes workability. Um, so I think that that's something that I would urge the staff to, uh, to, to, to address the 145 and exemption. Um, oh, and sorry, my very, very last I promise point here is, um, I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. I'm sorry, seven, I just jotted this down out of order. I apologize, 7003B, which is on page um, 10 of 72. This is for the mobile applications. Um, uh, the link to opt out, the statute says prior to downloading, uh, it should be available to a consumer prior to downloading. And this regulation 7003 says, which must be accessible through the platform page or download page. And the only thing I'd like to suggest to the staff is I actually would like, would welcome the screen before I download the app saying, do you want to opt out? Because if it's on the download page, who knows where it's going to be on the download page or how it is. And your kid's sitting there saying, you know, I want the app right now. And I'd love to be able to have it, you know, what the statute says is prior to downloading. So that's my final point on the 7003D. Thank you very much, Mr. McTaggart. I'm pausing to decide whether I would like to recommend that we now have um, any comment on Mr. McTaggart's list or we get, if, is there, if there are any other items board members wanna bring up and then come back to the very top. I think there's a balance um, between um, um, efficiency uh, on in terms of um, letting people get their thoughts on the table and efficiency and helping people um, key into the discussion that we're having at the moment. Um, so my initial thinking is that um, we can respond to Mr. McTaggart's um, comments, but I am open to either. Mr. Thompson? Um, my question slash comment was not specific to Mr. McTaggart's list and, and when we respond to it, it was more um, kind of how we're proceeding for the rest of today and, and tomorrow. Um, only because I'm sensitive to time. I've got yeah. some, I have other obligations that I need to, to attend to at some point. Um, and I didn't know if it's, it, it seems clear we will be meeting again tomorrow. Um, I'm not sure that it is clear. Oh, okay. And I, so that so, um, and I was hoping that every, I didn't, again, I didn't, I don't know how long the list is, but I was hoping that, that um, everyone's potential um, additional items would be on the table. And then I was going to do a time check with staff um, in terms of what we have left to consider um, and, um, and public um, comment. Um, so both of those components um, do need to happen today. Uh, and uh, I think we have found ourselves perhaps inevitably um, in the odd gray, like in a slightly gray area um, where uh, depending on how long the board talks and depending on um, how much public comment the public would like to engage in, um, it is potentially possible that we could finish today if we um, stayed uh, somewhat longer than five, as I suggested earlier in the morning. It's also possible um, that it would simply um, be more realistic to um, go until tomorrow. Um, and uh, I was hoping for it to be much clearer, um, but I think that um, you know we could we could we could we could move forward a little bit longer um, and see um, if we are close to the end of our conversation at least. Um, mm -hmm. or not. And I think I would ask you, Mr. Thompson, um, uh, if you have a, if you have, a, you know, a hard constraint, um, at, at a particular time, because of course that's also important information for us to consider. Um, I mean, define hard constraint. My <laughs> son has a game that I'd really like to get to. <laughs> um, that's a constraint and you can, you can characterize it as, as hard or, or medium, or I mean, I, that it's uh, yes, it's your constraint. I um, um, my preference also would be to stick to what was announced or make it shorter, not to end up in a situation where we stay beyond that. Um, I just I don't know if other 
members are welcome to share their thoughts here at this point, but I, um, my heart is with Mr. Reconsum. I would yeah. prefer to restart tomorrow and in a that reasonable time today. My preference would be not to go past 530 if we, if we can. Thank you. Okay, that's very helpful, Mr. Thompson. Um, uh, do others um, have a similar preference or um, are um, supportive of Mr. Thompson's preference with regards to ending at 530? Because I do think that helps us um, know. Okay, all right. Meaning that we will um, need to come back tomorrow, I think almost certainly. All right, okay. Um, then that is what we will do. Um, and uh, I think and I hope that um, we should be able to get any remaining items that haven't yet been discussed, at least on the table. Um, and that will allow everybody to have all of that information um, uh, as we, um, after we recess um, uh, during, during the evening. Okay. Um, Ms. De La Troy, I believe that you had, um, we're, we're hoping to make comments or ask questions about Mr. McTaggart's, some of Mr. McTaggart's items. Um, would you like to go ahead, please? I had a question that came to mind and then I have one final item on my end that I haven't mentioned that it will be also for future rulemaking. But the question is, um, we're on page 38 and I think this is uh, like Mr. McTaggart mentioned a section that has not been modified that is really from the prior rulemaking, but now it has to be interpreted in the context of we have a right to correct. Um, I was just not clear as to what was the modification that Mr. McTaggart envisions. The section currently says a business shall not disclose in response to a request to know a number of items that, um, you know, in a way I can, I. I understand the restriction in that those are items that are um, usually very uh, relevant in terms of uh, the potential for um, identity theft and, and maybe protecting those uh, from disclosure can prevent um, the misuse of the regs to obtain information that can be used for identity theft. But um, I didn't completely understand what he was suggesting that the business should provide the information or should be allowed to provide the information or uh, we could go back to that. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, Mr. McTaggart, uh, I understood you to be pointing out um, something that you saw as a potential, um, not inconsistency exactly, but a way that the connection between those two rights um, and how they're implemented could be improved. Um, and that you were asking staff to look into that. Um, but if you have a specific, if do, you, do you have a specific answer to Ms. De La Torre's question? Um, because um, if so, then um, please go ahead and say it. And if not, then I think it's completely fair to ask, as well to ask staff to, to work on that, what you identified, like the, the, the potential issue you identified. Um, uh, in the in 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 the proposed regulation. Sure. So the issue here is simply that in the new right to correct in 7023J, which is on pages 36 and 37, what the what the right to correct says to consumers in in the regulations is that with respect to this category of super sensitive information. The business doesn't disclose to you when you're correcting it, but it provides a way to confirm that the personal information it maintains is the same as what the consumer provided. So you say, here's my social security number. And they say, great, yep, that's correct. That's what we have for you. And if it's wrong, then they're like, okay, we're gonna correct it, right? And that's obviously you kind of need to do that to correct. So my point is then overlay that concept where I can actually go somewhere and I can say, do you have my correct information? They correct it. Now overlay that concept when I go to the business just to say, hey, what do you have about me? They don't tell me any of my information. And, I, and I, I, that's a weird thing because you, you have to go correct your information, not knowing whether that information is correct in order to find out if it is correct around this, 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 this information. So, I mean, maybe there's uh, uh, sort of then a chicken and egg thing. I'm just trying to think it would be nice to figure out uh, I've always thought that 
even if they make me go show up with a notarized, you know, uh, a driver's license and an attorney, you know, and a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, I can buy a house with my driver's license, but under our regulations, I can't show up with my driver's license and I'm notary and get my financial information. That the, that, and it's weird. It's, I have always thought that's a little strange. I don't care if they make it super, super strict, but it is strange to me. Uh, and then you have this concept now that they do tell you if you're if the information you have is correct. So that's that was that was my my point about page thirty eight. It is not burning. It does not need to be addressed in, to, uh, now. And I don't really need to take up everybody's time at, at five o'clock on a Friday night about this. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, Ms. De La Torre, do you understand the um, conceptual yeah, uh, yes. question, Mr. McTaggart? Right, right. Okay, thank you. Right, right. Do you have right, other right. questions for him? Um, I think I just wanted to express support for the other comments that he had and the um, specifically the comment on employee data mm -hmm. and consumer to consumer data. Um, we should be thoughtful about the fact that this is absolutely new that will start um, next year and um, organizations that intend to be compliant might not completely understand how to get there. Um, so I support his comment on, on being thoughtful about that. Thank you very much, Ms. Delatore. All right, let me pause to provide an opening and opportunity for any other board reactions um, or questions to items that um, Mr. Lay, Ms. Delatore, and Mr. McTaggart suggested, and Mr. Thompson. Uh, I have one more item. Okay, you it's have a, 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 a new, sorry, a new <laughs> for the list. <laughs> and this is very simple. And I, okay, I think it, please go ahead. It, it will be unanimous. Um, okay, so I do not understand why, but our notices and the individual responses do not include a requirement to um, highlight that consumers have a right to complain to the AG and the CPPA. And that's a small thing to ask um, businesses to add. And it's very, very helpful to consumers because consumers sometimes they might get a response that they disagree with, but they don't have a clear idea as to who to bring that to. So to require that that response include a reference to either the AG or the agency, and if possible, a link to a, a easy form that they could use to raise their concern, uh, I think will be very valuable, both in privacy notices and in responses to requests. Thank you very much, Ms. De La Torre. Are there additional items? I, I, let me just back up and say, Ms. De La Torre, um, you would like to put this on um, the list of things for staff um, to consider working into a future. Uh, um, Absolutely. Amendments to the regulations. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Well, I find myself with none, so um, I had a I, I had I had a very edifying time um, listening to um, to the list um, in the last hour or so, and really appreciate everyone's uh, thoughtful attention to the proposed rules and the modifications, uh, and going through the um, going through all of the items we didn't. Um, uh, speak uh, speak about individually um, at the top of the meeting, um, and I um, find everything to be helpful um, interventions, and I'm, I'm glad that staff will be looking at those things. Um, Ms. Kim, did you have anything else that you wanted to bring up before I move to the question of categorization um, uh, for um, Ms. De La Torre's um, uh, question the comments about 702 that we discussed returning to um, at this point in the conversation? I don't have anything else to add. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Kim. Um, in that case, um, Ms. De La Torre, um, shall we circle back? Um, uh, and um, uh, I just wanna check my, my notes, give me one second so that I can introduce this properly.
Okay. Um, so um, in the discussion of 7002, proposed regulation 7002, and the modifications to proposed regulation 7002, the board has had um, a, a fairly extensive conversation um, with observations and background and um, helpful analysis by Ms. De La Torre and others. Um, Mr. McTaggart suggested uh, two um, more minor um, potential modifications to the rule. Um, and Ms. De La Torre um, suggested um, considering um, uh, also some kind of broader, um, broader um, review uh, and looking at, um, for example, the different factors and how 702 might apply um, to the employee data that Mr. McTaggart mentioned a few minutes ago, um, along with other things. I won't try to summarize the whole conversation um, because I think it's most helpful um, to speak of it in those sort of three categories. There is the um, proposed modification um, from staff on the page um, of the document that we have for the meeting. We have Mr. McTaggart's um, uh, two um, potential suggested changes, and we have um, Ms. Um, De La Torre's um, uh, sort of background, and um, uh, there were several um, uh, specific examples, but I think um, if it's fair to say, Ms. De La Torre, um, a, a kind of a conceptual um, framework um, that you were offering. Um, so what we discussed was circling back around with regards to um, the, we call, I said buckets, but I, I, I apologize for that because I think we have more than one kind of bucket. So I'm going to call it process path um, that the, the sets of the, those sets of items um, should go into. Um, obviously we have the modifications from staff um, before us already today. There's Mr. McTaggart's um, suggestions. Um, and so one thing we might consider is again, whether that is something that Mr. McTaggart is comfortable with staff looking at and considering where, whether to add them or if he wants the board to um, consider those specific um, changes um, now. Um, and then there's the question of the broader um, uh, conceptual um, observations and potential changes that Ms. De La Torre suggested. Um, and for those, um, I think that um, uh, the path of, of having uh, staff having time and the benefit of um, analysis and speaking with Ms. De La Torre, Ms. De La Torre about it more um, uh, to consider for a future rulemaking package makes the most sense to me. So that's the path that I, um, I would suggest putting it on. Um, but I wanted to circle back um, uh, on that because we didn't make um, a final, um, we didn't come to a sort of final place um, on those items. So I'd first like to ask, start with Mr. McTaggart. Um, and actually I'll start with Ms. Kim. I'll start with Mr. McTaggart and ask um, if you had, um, if you had a, um, a goal of, of, of again, asking staff to consider and to use the staff's discretion um, and expertise to decide whether to make any language changes um, for uh, this package, for these modifications, or, um, or whether um, you wanted to us uh, to talk about the, the language changes you suggested specifically now. I am fine with uh, having staff use their discretion. Okay, all right. Um, thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Um, and then um, Ms. De La Torre, um, um, are you comfortable with um, having staff um, work with you, work with others, you know, analyzing, um, analyzing um, the proposed um, regulations and modifications uh, in line with all the good observations that you brought up um, uh, for, uh, for future potential revision um, to the, um, to 702? So I'm not I'm not sure because one of the things that I, I don't okay let me backtrack I'm I'm um, absolutely support relying on the staff but I don't know that the staff can make the changes that I'm suggesting fast enough for the uh, rules to move forward 
expeditionally. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm doubting whether, you know, what will be um, the best. Um, Let me, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. De La Torre. I think I might have been unclear um, uh, about that. Um, I agree with you um, with what you just said. And so that's why I was, Maybe I should go back to buckets. Um, I was, I, I'm now changing, let's add another analogy. I'm changing horses in midstream at 505, maybe not a good idea, um, but that um, the per correct bucket or process path would be um, for um, your, um, your observations and background and some specific proposals and some conceptual ideas not to be dealt with with the language we have on the page now and these proposed modifications, but worked on um, as part of um, any additional um, amendments we might make to the regulations in a future package. Okay, so let me repeat back to make sure I'm understanding. What you're saying is whether the um, modifications are considered drafted before we put the rules forward for comment or after, meaning 7002 will be enacted in one form and potentially modified eight months later? Is that what we're talking about? Potentially modified, I don't know about eight months, but potentially modified in the next so, package, yes. So the reason it's difficult for me to answer that question is because I don't know what that means in terms of is it retroactive. So if we enact 7002 now, for example, without that factor that I was talking about sensitive information, does it mean that for one year, that's not a factor that is relevant to that determination? Because, or, I mean, what happens when it changes, right? Is it retroactive? I don't think it can be retroactive. So we will be enacting it knowing that, um, so it's a difficult question for me to answer really. I, I would love to take some time and quite honestly, hear the comments of the commenters um, to kind of see you know, what is the reaction of the public? Because I see benefits and, 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 and disadvantages. To me, if a rule is mandatory, if it's something that we have to enact before the deadline, then I'm very inclined to say, even if it's imperfect, we should move it forward. But my understanding is that 7002 is not mandatory. It was never assigned because it was not mandatory. So we do have the luxury of deciding maybe to not enact it as is, rely on the statute and enact it in a more perfected form. Um, and I think that's something that's worth consideration. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, I, I can, I, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that approach. At the same time, I feel like everybody's trying to figure out where where things are going and to the extent that we have at least this codified and certain uh there is the question of will the sensitive personal information aspect that you're talking about uh Mr. Latore, be added and how what that's going to look like but I, I would again just urge us to move forward with what's here and I don't think it's I don't think it's um problematic, I guess, Ms. Dilatory, to add things, because I think we're going to be adding things for the foreseeable future, almost every board meeting. There's going to be something that was noticed. And I just think I was talking to Mr. Laird about previous committees he staffed, and he said it's just very uh, uh, traditional in many of these state committees to, to, to do rulemaking, uh, many rulemaking uh, sessions a year. So I, I, I would urge us to go forward with this and to take your a point of view into account with with, with staff and, and and not delay this passage for for that. Thank you, um, Mr. McTaggart. I agree. I, did, I agree I strongly with Mr. McTaggart on this. Um, the the question for me is whether the proposed regulation is valuable and adds value and implementation. Uh, helps with implementation of the statute. Um, it is not a question of um, whether or not it was on the initial list. It is clear to me that, the, in my view, this adds value. It is helpful. There is no preclusion for us amending it later, and indeed there shouldn't be, because we will be responding to circumstances 
that is the role of a regulatory body with administrative authority to do rules um, is to respond to circumstances. Um, so for me, the question is the value and whether it helps um, and, and um, uh, uh, helps guide um, those who are relying on the statute. I think the statute um, has very strong fundamental protections and 7002 um, with the modifications staff have proposed um, are, are valuable and helpful. And I see no reason not to move forward. And indeed, um, I think that that would take us backwards in terms of the service that we're providing for the public. Um, that is not to say um, that we couldn't improve it um, in the future, that we couldn't take into account some of the larger questions that you raised, Ms. De La Torre, and I don't think that those things are incompatible at all. Um, so I agree with Mr. McTaggart. Mr. Lay? Yeah, no, no disagreement there. I, I, I also think many of these questions or issues of interpretation um, may already be addressed in the statute. It's just not appropriate to kind of get into those legal questions, interpretations right now. So, um, you know, to the extent possible, if staff is available to kind of talk about those questions one on one, um, maybe that could avoid some of the could could allay some of the concerns while avoiding delaying. Um, you know what we I think is already pretty pretty solid um, set of regulations for for Californians. Thank you very much, Mr. Lay. All right. Um, I'm I'm I um I'm not going to leave this item completely yet, but I think that we are at the end of the list. Have I missed anything? Okay. Um, then um, I'm happy to um, ask Ms. De La Torre um, if she is comfortable um, with the board's consensus here. Or what? Sorry. I mean, in terms. Go ahead. Yeah. In in terms of my position, I would like to listen to the commenters. Um, oh, I see. That yes. I think will happen tomorrow. Um, I think that we should all listen to them before we make a final determination. I'm assuming the vote doesn't happen until after that anyway, right? That's correct. Okay. So Thank then you. that's I, what I, I, preference I apologize. Would be. You said that earlier and I um, I made a note and then I forgot. Um, all right. Um, in that case, um, Ms. Kim, um, how would you like to proceed with um, summer? Let me just back up and say, so a plan is to summarize um, where we are in terms of what are the components um, uh, of the modifications that we um, are going to consider formally with a motion. Um, and obviously um, the modifications proposed by staff uh, within the uh, documents uh, provided for agenda three today are some of those components, um, modifications proposed by staff in this meeting um, and modifications proposed by board members to the extent they are changes to the language um, right now. Um, and I think Ms. Kim is planning to give us a little bit more description of those so that we have it all um, before us as we are thinking about it. And so the public has it all before them uh, when they are commenting. And so my question, um, sort of as a matter of process and timing, Ms. Kim, is if you would like to do that um, before we end today, or you would like to do it at the beginning of tomorrow? Um. I, I could probably do it today, but I also think that it might be um, wise to do it tomorrow once I've gotten a chance to review all of my notes and make sure I didn't miss anything and consult also with our staff to see if they caught something that maybe I, I had it in, in my note taking. Um, so my recommendation is that tomorrow when we start off, I can go ahead and list out um, all of the um, you know, modifications that I, I believe um, have been discussed by the board and the direction that the board has given to us with regard to moving forward for the 15 day notice um, and summarize them tomorrow morning and then allow for that to, you know, uh, just sometimes I think clearer after a few hours, but I'm certainly happy to do it now um, if you would bear with me as well. Uh, say no more, Ms. Kim, that's why I asked. Uh, so that makes perfect sense to me. Um, and with a last call for emergency things that popped up while we were talking that we need to put on the list, and I'm going to pause right here. Okay, I'm hearing none. Um, we will now recess the meeting.
Um, we are considering currently agenda item number three um, uh, in our notice meeting for October 28th and 29th, uh, 2022 um, of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board. We will recess our discussion of agenda item three now, and we will return um, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. to continue our discussion of this agenda item. Before people start to leave, I just want to double check with Mr. Laird um, whether that is appropriate process and I've said the right words because we don't, we, you know, we mostly have one day meetings and I want to be sure that I've recessed us appropriately. Yeah, absolutely. Everything you said is correct. Okay. In that case, um, I declare this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board in recess until tomorrow morning, uh, October 29th, 2022 at 9 a.m. Thank you very much for a robust, careful decision um, and for your careful attention to the materials that we are considering today. And I look forward to seeing you all in the morning. Thank you.